Hey there, audiobook enthusiasts. Welcome to the audiobook collection. Today's upcoming audiobook is a special shout out to one of our amazing Patreon backers. If you're keen on personalized requests, consider becoming a part of our Patreon community. The link is in the video description below. Your support is truly appreciated, and I'm grateful to have you with me on this exciting audiobook adventure. And hey, if you're looking for a bundle of 300 plus novels, swing by my Kofi shop. For just $35, you can snag a Google Drive link to an audiobook treasure trove. Additionally, if you want to show some love to the original author of this novel, check out the author's credits discreetly provided in the description. Your support makes a difference. Thanks for being part of this literary journey with me. Chapter 76 New Possibilities Due to Personal Issues I have decided that I'm unfit to work in a league capacity as expected from my colleagues and hence, after careful deliberation, have resigned from the Justice League effective as of yesterday at 2100 hours. Batman announced. He paused to let that information sink in. And sink in it did. Shock, surprise and in the case of one green, red and yellow themed superhero, anger populated the sidekick's faces. You're joking. Wally spoke up first his words mirroring the disbelief in everyone's mind. It was a hard concept to wrap their minds around. Batman was after all, one of the big three. Superman, Wonder Woman and he were quite literally, the face of the Justice League and now he was resigning. This feels all too fast. Ngan said while rubbing her hand in sadness. None of it was going to plan. She had thought that after finally joining a team, a family here on Earth, things would go well for her that they would face all obstacles and come out on the other side stronger to show for it. Just like how Megan seemed to solve all her problems in just under 30 minutes of episodic run, why dot why couldn't it go like that? Wonder Woman who was behind Batman glanced at her and gave Ngan a comforting nod. She understood her inner turmoil. At least someone did. Miss Martian nodded back, telling the older woman she would be alright even without using words. Is this about the Aiden issue? Are you getting heat because of how the mission and subsequent actions led to his departure from the team? If so he's our responsibility Batman. Not yours. Aqualad stepped forward and addressed the Dark Knight. His words made the other leaguers behind Batman share looks with each other. No it's not. My desire to leave the Justice League is not because of the events from the past few days. Maelstrom is also a Justice League issue, not the teams. You have done all you can in the standing orders not to engage him still apply. Batman's commanding tone left no room for discussion. Aqualad looked at the rest and saw the looks of stubbornness mirrored on their faces just like his. I'm sorry but you are wrong. We've thought about it and come to a unanimous decision. Maelstrom was never a leaguer. We have fought with him, bled with him, laughed with him. He is ours to bring in. And we will do it with or without the Justice League's help. His response was firm. His words, hard and obstinate. Despite the circumstances, Aquaman felt proud of the man his protege was becoming. Batman and Aqualad locked gazes for a few uncomfortable seconds before the Dark Knight slightly smiled. They were taking charge, standing up to them. Batman was glad and heartened that the team was in good hands. Very well. I will leave the finer details for you and the new overseer to discuss Aqualad. At that juncture, Wonder Woman stepped forward. Following Batman's resignation, we have decided that the team needs a new overseer, someone who will take over Batman's responsibilities. And after a lengthy discussion, Captain Atom was chosen to replace him. He will be assigning you missions after the League has carefully vetted them to avoid as many dot mishaps as we can. Wonder Woman raised her hand to silence the uproar that she knew was coming from Kid Flash and Superboy. That is not to call your skills and abilities to question. We all feel like dot it's been an eventful month. A few relatively harmless missions to ease you into the new state of things is dot not that bad. She finished gently. They're coddling us. Treating us like kids. Connor grumbled quietly. And Artemis had to agree. But dot she didn't feel like that was a bad thing. They were kids after all and taken everything that had recently happened. A few missions where things didn't get derailed to the point where the ramifications would lead to a team member leaving as well as a leaguer resigning from the Justice League was welcome to her. Captain Atom will be over later to discuss the details of your new base of operations as well as. Robin couldn't listen anymore. He got up abruptly and left. Wonder Woman trailed off, staring at the boy Wonder. Batman placed a hand on her shoulder and shook his head. He was going to talk to boy Wonder himself. Later that same night Wayne Mansion. Bruce whirled the Ezra sticks in his hands smoothly. The door to the training room opened and Dick, 
out of his Robin costume walked in. He made contact with Bruce's A's and wordlessly walked to the practice weapon rack, getting his own as sticks. Dick stepped forward onto the sparring mat and stretched his body, taking great care to keep his attention on his mentor, lest an attack came in while he was preoccupied, he'd learned that the hard way. After completing the action, both mentor and protege bowed to each other in a show of respect. Then, they straightened up and the bout unofficially begun. From sparring with Bruce all these years, Dick knew he was always at a disadvantage. Bruce was just stronger in every conceivable way. The only thing Dick had working for him was his small size, agility and skills, but to actively use them to his advantage, he was usually the one instigating the first move. To keep Bruce inside his rhythm instead of the other way around. Before we start, let's make a deal. If you win, I'll tell you everything about what you've been searching the bat computer's files for. Bruce stopped him before he could lunge forward. That was dot a good deal. Dick wasn't immediately happy though, there was always a catch. And if you win? He asked his adopted father. Bruce looked at him with a hard gaze on his face. You'll tell me why you felt the need to not only disrespect your teammates but the league and I for walking out during the briefing. Oh, so this was what it was all about. Despite the seriousness, Dick decided his teenage rebel phase had arrived. He aimed an escrima stick at Bruce and smiled like a little shit. Bring it on, old man. Aiden's POV. After a good long shower under the waterfall, grangos and roasted boar meat along with a nap on a DIY hammock, I was ready to face the music. I hadn't left the elemental dimension even once. It was dot peaceful here. Down on earth everything was just too much. Too convoluted and complicated. In comparison, the grind was simple and therapeutic. I knew that soon I wouldn't keep off from interacting with Lucifer and planning out my next move but first, I wanted to get my fire bending to a good enough level that I could protect myself in case things went to shit without overly relying on air bending. I finished the last of my grangos and teleported back to the fire plane. Instantly, the temperature changed from the cool breeze of the beach on Sanctuary to a blistering heat and heavy smoke-filled atmosphere of the Flame Land. Ah, that's actually not a bad name. Flame Land, I liked it. I shook my head to get rid of the distracting thoughts and brought out the display screen. I clicked on the training points which still read 55 and was taken to a database with four sections, two of which were greyed out. The ones that weren't were the bendings I had access to. One was of airbending and contained anyone from Ang's kid, Bumi who became an airbender at his old age to Zahir. The second section was of firebending and contained only expert ranked firebenders and masters. Wait. My eyes widened. The list was not as sparse as before. I quickly dismissed that window and pulled up my main menu. Right there on the tab depicting my fire bending, something had changed. The rankings were beginner or practitioner, whichever you want to call it expert, master, and grandmaster. My ranking had changed from practitioner to expert all in the course of one week. It was dot crazy. Unexpected and totally made sense. For starters, fire was my favorite bending because of just how cool it was L, so I was super into it and secondly, I had advantages while learning it that I didn't when I was learning air bending. Fire bending, expert. Locked. Locked. So I now only had to unlock a sub-skill to get my proficiency level to the next stage which is master. After mastering both the sub-skills, I would similarly go through an advancement trial for fire to get my bending to grand master level. It was a bit confusing because the ranking didn't change for master level. Unlocking and mastering one subskill would elevate me to master level immediately but even mastering two, I would still be stuck at master level without the advancement trial. Which brought up another question, what if I tried to master another subskill before the advancement trial? I mean, thinking about it, the avatar system had only placed the bare minimum requirements for me to go through the advancement trial but it is not said anywhere that I was restricted to only two subskills. It would of course be a waste of time to be honest. I couldn't think of any other subskill of fire that stood out to me for the time being. Maybe Phoenix Regeneration? But that was too out of left field. Or was it? I looked around the dimension I was in. There were dragons in it. Dragons had showed the capability of controlling different colored flames in canon. Maybe I was looking at this from a very shallow perspective. The bare bones of an idea were building inside my mind. The path to power is never easy but what I had working for me was creativity. I couldn't lose that. I couldn't allow it to be washed away by discounting things as impossible without trying them. I scrolled down the database of opponents. I now had more variety to pick from. There was General Zhao and a plethora of more firebending masters like Zuko. I would have loved to pick one of them but ultimately my points decided it for me. 
I needed to see how good I actually was. I clicked on a firebender soldier and got ready. Chapter 77. Let's negotiate part 1. Here goes nothing. I clicked on the tab depicting the firebender soldier. Feels like shopping. I'm used, seeing the sudden drop of my training points from 55 to a measly 5. I endured the heartache. Just barely. The display screen disappeared from my vision and a few meters away from me, a white light appeared. I took a step back and settled into a ready stance as the ball of white light coalesced into a humanoid figure. The light disappeared and on its previous position, a man was revealed. I ran my eyes over his body. Top to bottom. He was dressed in a standard Fire Nation Army uniform with a helmet covering most of his head, although the faceplate with huge eyes was missing. The uniform seemed to be a mix of different eras of the Fire Nation Army. The man was of average height, with an average face and a slightly intimidating aura around him. Comes with being a soldier, I guess. This guy was a veteran. The fight was not going to be easy. He fell into a standard firebending pose. The same one I knew from the basic firebending forms I got as a knowledge pack but this emphasized brutal efficiency. I had had to change it a little to fit my body and fighting style better. I mirrored his footing and established eye contact with the blank-faced man. A copy of the real one most probably. The air between us got supercharged and on some undetectable signal, we both moved. I stepped aside and allowed the fireball to pass harmlessly by my left. My opponent shuffled to the right with his hands on his hips and threw another fist forward, followed by a second one from his other hand. The two fireballs were aimed to box me in. I calmly stepped forward and pulled on my own energy. I felt a thin covering of thermal energy spread along my hands. The first fireball was now bearing down upon me. I slapped it out of the way sending it to blast the ground on my left and just wash away upon contact with the unyielding rocky terrain. The eye stabbed both of my hands out at the one behind it, spreading them in a circular motion and unraveling it. The flames licked my sides and I barely felt the heat as they disappeared into the air. My opponent on the other hand took the opportunity of me being occupied to pull in closer to my body. His fist was inches away from landing onto my face, when I dodged it and jumped away, assisted by the fire rocketing out of my soles. The firebender soldier spinned in place, stepped forward and pushed his hands out towards my body suspended in midair. A torrential wave of flame, glowing yellow rose up to meet me. In response, I raised a hand up to the sky and swiftly brought it down like an axe. The wave of ocean parted upon contact with me and with that I had learned how he fought. Now it was time to go on the offensive. I leaned forward and pushed off the air with a flame burst. My trajectory brought me towards the firebender soldier. The man was conscious enough of the battlefield that he jumped away before I could land on his body. It didn't save him though. I slammed onto the ground and a wave of flames rose up from my contact with it. The fire was easily six feet long and the eruption bared down on the opponent mercilessly. With a barely audible scream, the firebender soldier disappeared into white light. Cracks spread out under my my legs along the blackened ground. I smiled, getting up and bowing towards the firebender soldier. Well, that fight had shown me how a veteran firebender fought. The soldier's movements had been stiff and stubborn, something I would expect from an earthbender. I sighed looking around, the Fire Nation had really forgotten the essence of firebending. The fight had been unexpectedly too easy. I don't think I was going to spar with this type of opponent again. If I must, I should go for the truly skilled firebenders. The ones who understood the essence of the flame. I brought up my minimized screen and looked at the training points. Still stuck at five. I'm so poor. Welp. It seems like I now needed Lucifer even more. To ensure I didn't slow down my practice, a few combat missions to earn more points were paramount. I looked towards a few huge boulders and smiled. My little friend was back. I wanted to approach the little dragon but somehow it didn't feel like the right time. I had a feeling that it would come to me when it was ready. So I just waved at its direction and disappeared out of the flame land. A few grangos to ease my hunger later, bending was kinder energy intensive, I decided to go back to earth. I had been putting off talking to Lucy but it couldn't wait any longer. Time was moving and the Young Justice timeline was still mostly an enigma to me, past the Red Volcano mission. I knew a few things in passing but nothing concrete. For starters, I knew that Wally would die in season 2 but not because of what? I also knew that Speedy would become a Justice League member but that something would happen? It was confusing. Just half-clicked Reddit threads that I had dismissed entirely upon seeing the number of speculations and trolling going on. Ask me about Marvel and I assure you I'll know shit that isn't even mainstream. Ask me about DC and outside Batman Beyond, I was a complete novice. 
It was times like this that I regretted not paying more attention to the DC world. To be fair though, who would have thunk I would be transmigrated here? Me, the guy who's always too lost in his own world. The guy who finds it hard to make friends. The guy who has never had a meaningful relationship. The reason I broke up with my girlfriend was as she aptly put a sucked at communication. Whose sick joke was it that they thought I would be appropriate as an ambassador? My personality was a complete opposite to that. Anyway, nothing to do about it now. I left Sanctuary through a portal and stepped out into Lucifer's living room. I looked around strangely as the portal disappeared. I was aiming for my room. I told him. Lucifer chuckled mysteriously, while also managing to look apologetic. Sorry, I hijacked your landing. Why don't you take a seat Aiden? We haven't seen much of each other and I wanted us to have a little chat. He was dressed in a dark silky kimono that covered him to just below his calves. His words made me raise an eyebrow. You hijacked a dimensional warp gate and redirected it from where it was going to bring me to you? And that maddening smile is back. I sighed and sank my body on the couch across from him. I groaned a little at the comfortable sensation. Although the grind was sacred, sleeping on a hammock or the ground is really not good for my back. I almost fell asleep just from leaning on the couch. You sound surprised. My devilish host commented taking a sip of tea. He saw my eyes land on the cup and snapped a finger. A cup of steaming hot chocolate appeared on the table before me. How did you, you know what? Never mind. I keep on forgetting who I'm dealing with. I shook my head and took a sip of the hot chocolate, shuddering in appreciation. Thick and smooth just like my mum makes. Oh boy, now I miss her even more. Okay I'm sorry but I actually got to ask, how did you make it exactly the way I like it? Might be magic. He smirked with a small upturn of his lips. In other words, you read my mind and found out what I like. I dead pained. Lucifer chuckled. I don't need to read your mind for something as trivial as this. He leaned forward, to tell you the truth, I can see what you desire when you desire it and how you desire it, comes with being the all-powerful scary devil. Desire came from me after all. Was he talking about those powerful cosmic entities that presented an aspect of reality? The Endless, I think they were called, still not a big DC fan guys, that hasn't changed. Lucifer cocked his head to the side while leaning back. He studied me with something akin to curiosity. You even know about them? Intriguing. And the answer is no. None of the Endless came from me. That's preposterous. He waved a hand in dismissal of the notion. Then his serious gaze locked onto me. That said, I would ask you to explain to me exactly where you come from or how you possess knowledge that should not be known to a mortal. Especially how you seem to know Maze and I during our first meeting. My breath hitched. Fuck, what was I expecting? Of course he would know about that. But it's been forever since I didn't know something. Forever since I have been so. Interested. Count yourself lucky, you get to keep your secrets. I gulped and nodded in appreciation. Um, thanks. He could have simply taken it all if he wanted to, without asking. It was only much much later that I found out had he attempted to do so, my brain would have become a fighting ground as the avatar state fended off any attempts to do a deep dive inside my mind. My surface thoughts were laid bare for a skilled enough telepath like Martian Manhunter to read but not without sufficient effort. However, no matter how strong they were, no one could read my actual memories. No one. The avatar system was fucking scary. Chapter 78 Let's negotiate I think that's enough of the idle chit chat. Let's get down to business. Upon the devil's words, the atmosphere in the room suddenly changed. I sat up straighter on the couch readying myself. It was a talk but it sure felt like a fight. I had to be careful not to let my guard down and get fucked over my whatever agreement we came to. So, I have something or should I say a few things you need. He started off, I kept my face blank of all emotion and started singing Wellerman in my head to keep him from reading my surface thoughts. It was easier these days as my mind was much more flexible due to the mental lessons I'd been going through with both Martian superheroes. I didn't want Lucifer to know just how desperate I actually was for any information Galil had left behind. That would shift the odds in his favor and leave me at his mercy. He could ask me to do something incredibly dangerous and I would be inclined to. Lucifer stared at me in amusement. Of course he knew what I was up to but still, any shred of control I had over the situation, however illusionary made me feel at ease. Yes, you're right. I confirmed, taking a slow sip of my cup of hot chocolate and savoring it along with my little power play. The devil patiently waited, staring at me in growing amusement. Now I felt like an idiot, 
I cleared my throat and moved to elaborate further. I need any information Galil left behind, specifically, his contacts. I believe that he might have stored a digital copy of the files I had somewhere. Lucifer nodded and waved his hand for me to continue. What else? He questioned. This next part was what I was most nervous about. To tell you the truth, it was probably dumb, idiotic and ill-advised. I also need the method he used to create the meta-trigger essence. Lucifer's gaze turned sharp at that. I hurried to explain before I set off the bloody devil. Just for reference, I know that the methods he used were cruel and inhumane and I'm not looking to follow in his footsteps, okay? I took a huge gulp of the chocolate to calm my nerves and gather my thoughts. That guy sickened me. I hate people who hurt others for their own amusement and the vibe rolling off him told me, he was exactly the kind of person who likes doing that. I explained, somewhat calmer now. Lucifer's eyes never left my own, probably searching for deceit or trickery. Not that I could even try to cheat or trick the devil. The guy was known as the ultimate deceiver and although that title was ironic seeing as he never lied, it didn't change the fact that I was dealing with a being that was over a billion years old. The shit he's seen? The lies he's encountered? Nothing could get past him, so the truth was the way to go. Despite all that however, it doesn't change the fact that what he did was borderline impossible for anyone else. I leaned forward. That bastard was able to not only detect the metagene inside people but also awaken it and turn them into metahumans. I don't know anyone else who can do that. Not even the light with their almost endless resources. The best thing they can do is make flawed body enhancement serums. I had thought it through some more after my encounter with the League of Assassins trio. The fact that Cheshire and her two partners were observing Galil's previous base, meant that there was something valuable he had that the light wanted. Too bad, Lucifer had taken over. Anyway, I could be wrong but something told me that the deceased demon had been in a sort of partnership with the light. What the partnership entailed, I had no idea. But my suspicions leaned on it having to do something with the meta-trigger essence. Maybe a fusion of both it and Cobra Venom to see what the resulting serum would be. Then the devil ruined everything. Poetic justice at its finest. Why? Lucifer finally asked. His voice was soft with undertones of curiosity. I find myself quite interested in your motives behind it. You are already so powerful and your potential is up there with the best. So why do you search for power with such fervor? He wasn't wrong. The abilities I had, had proved to me time and time again that I could be powerful. Was powerful. Within a few months of my arrival here, I was already strong enough to take on a few of the few Justice League members who had superpowers. If that growth isn't phenomenal, then what is? And it wouldn't stop. The grind was eternal. It was a grand da. I took my time to gather my thoughts before answering. At that point, I had already drained the hot chocolate in the cup I held in my hands. I set the cup down and started talking. I realized something, with all my power and strength, I still need someone to watch my back. I can't account for everything. That's just impossible. I stared at him to gauge his reaction. Although I'm loath to admit it, relying on others is a form of strength too. And if I am to achieve what I've set out to do, then I need a crew. A strong crew. A crew that won't hold me back but instead cover my weaknesses. That is what the meta-trigger essence is for. I need to study it and find a way I can replicate its effects without bringing harm or unwanted side effects to the subject. MMMMH. He hummed. That was honestly very convincing. A mature outlook. One that many before you would have benefited from. Alas, such is human folly. He smirked a little. To be incredibly short-sighted and arrogant of their own measly power. I commend you for realizing that early. The answer is still a resounding no, I'm afraid. Lucifer mercilessly shot me down. I closed my eyes and rubbed my temple. Okay. I was expecting that. His previous reaction to the thing had been borderline disgust. I almost thought he would have not only erased the meta trigger but also anything associated with it. The building, Galil's test subjects, even me just for touching it. I am disappointed. I must have given you too much credit Aiden. Ha. Huh. He called me by my name. That's a first. Lucifer rose up from his seat and walked towards the window, looking out at the gentle morning sun. The blinds had already been drawn out before I came in. And after sitting down on the couch, the sun rays had buffeted me gently, easing me into the relaxed state. My eyes followed his back as he stopped before the window, looking out into the city. There are many ways to get power. Some are not worth the price you pay to acquire them. 
Galil's method includes the use of refining life force from humans and then using that energy to induce an evolutionary process in a subject. However, the ratio is not one to one. How many of your own species do you think it takes to refine one vial of the disgusting thing? He spared me a look over the shoulder and asked. I didn't have an answer but I dreaded his. I will spare you the number. Saying that, he completely turned to face me. God, anyone else would have looked straight up can't be wearing that kimono but Lucy rocked it. So unfair. See I'm all for free will and following your ambitions. However, take it from someone who's seen it all. No dream is worth sacrificing hundreds of people for. No matter what it is. It's not worth it. That guilt and resentment is enough to break a man. Has broken countless men. Tainted souls and reduced them to ugly ugly things. All of whom are suffering down under still. He jokingly added, pointing to the ground. At least according to where the experts say hell is located. He was right. Losing the metatrigger essence was a huge setback because of the opportunity it presented but it wasn't the only way. In fact, reflecting upon Lucifer's words about life force, there was another way I could empower those I chose. If that failed, I could go the least intensive way of recruiting already powered individuals instead of creating them. That was the last choice. The downside is I wouldn't have their gratitude or loyalty from the start. All right. Aha. Uh -huh. I'll listen to you. The metatrigger essence is off the table. I finally spoke up, agreeing with his words and realizing just how short-sighted my desire had actually been. Besides, he'd already given me the method. I wouldn't sacrifice hundreds of people to do so but still, I bet I could trigger someone with a powerful enough source of energy, whether throughout magic or something I actually had an easy access to. Energy bending. More thoughts on that later. So, here's the deal. If you want the information you're looking for, you'll have to do something for me first. Equivalent exchange. The morning star declared, pulling me out of my thoughts. The door to the room opened and in walked Maze. She yawned and threw a few folders she had in her hands on the table between us. I raised an eyebrow at her, wondering what was going on. R. Mazikeen, right on time. Lucifer nodded. She waved her hand dismissively and walked to the bar, pouring herself a drink. There were many jokes I could make about it being too early for a drink but, devil in the vicinity, people, say what you will, but I don't think I'd ever get completely comfortable with Lucifer's presence. As I was saying, this is a trade. If you want the copy of all his information then you will have to run a few errands for me. The smile he had on his face sent warning bells ringing inside my head. I reached the hand out to the folder and took a peek. The title on the cover instantly gave me a headache and I groaned. Now I knew why he was so amused. The title read, Aiden Strong, Demon Hunter. You'll have to hunt down a few of Galil's associates and boot them back to where they belong. That folder contains all the information you need, courtesy of Maze. I was ready to refuse. Then and there, dealing with Hell's denizens was something that was not on my to-do list. That was John Constantine's shtick not mine. But true to his moniker of being a tempter. Lucifer added something I could not say no to. If you manage to do this successfully, you'll not only get what you want but I'll also give you a personal gift. A gift from the second strongest being of the DC verse. Where do I sign up? Chapter 79 Unexpected Surprise What kind of gift? My curiosity got the better of me and I immediately asked. Nah ha, and ruin the surprise? Not on your life. He readily shot back. Not sure that's how the expression works Lucifer. Maze shouted from the bar. I was a little disappointed but figured I would eventually find out when I completed the tasks he had for me. Speaking of which dot I started turning the pages and reading through the missions. Then something peculiar happened. Says the woman getting intoxicated at 8 in the morning. Not sure you're the voice of reason, love. Lucifer responded but I was too busy gaping st the text box that had appeared before me to pay attention to their little by play. Conditions have been met. Congratulations. Due to the actions of an above 12th level entity, a new system function has been unlocked. You now have access to the mission's functions. You get different rewards depending on the difficulty of the mission. For reference colon. Easy, 10 training points. Normal, 20 training points. Hard, 50 training points. Hell, 100 training points slash a new perk. Nightmare 200 training points slash 2 new perks slash 1 unique ability from the Avatar franchise. P.S. Missions can only be issued by others. P.P.S. Due to the Avatar system being predominantly combat oriented, only missions relating in one way or the other to battles can be issued. Rescue and support fall within this category. 
PPPS, only one mission can be active at once. The exception being chain quests, where a number of related objectives can be carried out in a progressive manner. P.P.P.P.S. Some missions might have a time limit. If they expire, you get no rewards. P.P.P.P.P.S. Once in a while, the system might issue its own missions to aid the ambassador in better establishing himself. Whoa. This. This was awesome. In a way, I think. There was the very apparent downside to hard capping my points to only five categories based on the effort required to complete a mission. It was efficient and laid out really well but that stole from any fight I found myself in if it wasn't a mission issued by the system. For instance, if I was in the middle of carrying out a mission and was suddenly attacked, I probably wouldn't get any rewards if I counterattacked and won. Suddenly, I noticed just how quiet the room had gotten. Looking away from the text box, my eyes found lucifers, which were shining red and boring into me with a burning curiosity and hunger. It was enough to creep me out. The room started feeling hot and suffocating. I tightened my hands into fists and forced myself to remain calm. Subtly, I dismissed the display to the corner of my vision. No one knew about the existence of the system. And if it was up to me, they never would. Fascinating. I detected a dot surge. Something hidden even from my own vision. You grow more and more interesting by the minute. I broke contact with his intimidating eyes and looked away. Maze wasn't any better. She was staring at me in this crazy intensity, as if she wanted to dissect me and find out how I worked. It was maddening and I quickly found myself wishing I was anywhere else but here. Fortunately, the claustrophobic vibe eased up somewhat and Lucifer rubbed his eyes and sighed. My apologies Aiden. I forgot myself and let a little aura leak out. He said, to which I nodded. Ha dot no problem. Say would you mind telling your scary sex on two legs of a friend to stop staring at me like a soccer mom looking into a store during Black Friday? And of course my coping mechanism when I'm close to panicking is making lame jokes. The devil chuckled briefly. Don't worry about her, she's just shocked that there's something that can hide from my gaze. I see everything after all. Perks of being dot how would you put it? His eyes briefly flashed red, fucking scary. I gulped and got up from the couch. Okay, this talk is fucking over. I don't feel comfortable to go through the folder with the Halle Berry looker like watching me like a piece of meat. The less said about his majesty, the bloody king of hell, the better. I'll go and read through the files to decide which task I should start with. I kept my tone calm and light to hide my nervousness and gathered the folder into my hands. Thank you for the hot chocolate. You gave me a piece of home, I so desperately needed. I sincerely told him. Don't mention it. Lucy replied, going back to sipping his own tea from the cup. I absentmindedly noted that the tea never seemed to end. Devil shenanigans. I'm out of here. I passed by Maze and smirked at the looks she was giving me. Like a cat chasing after a laser point. I am so messing with her. I thought you liked your men. Groan. I hurried out, leaving behind a growling Lilim and the devil reading a newspaper of all things. All in all just a normal day in my life. I passed through the hallway to my room, my heart pumping loudly in my ears. I could keenly remember where it was despite not staying there for more than one night. I opened the door and closed it behind me. Finally, a modicum of privacy. I could now panic about Lucifer coming close to discovering the system because of my stupidity. Fuck. I need to be more careful than that. The Avatar system was something from beyond the DC-verse, beyond the Source Wall, beyond Cosmic Superman, the entity that protects DC from well practically everything. I had no way of knowing how Lucy would react to finding out I had something that guaranteed limitless potential right here inside his father's pet project. That raised even more questions about me. Like, was I in the Book of Destiny? Was there a record of what I had done and would do just like every other being in existence in this cluster of the multiverse? Too many questions, not a lot of answers. All that showed me was that I couldn't stay here for too long. The more we interacted the more I felt like trusting both Maze and Lucifer and to be honest, I was starting to like them. Sooner or later however, I would let something slip that I shouldn't and I don't really know how they would take it. Not to mention, I wanted to be as far away from the angels and demons events about to happen soon. The timeline was following the Arrowverse show canon. Going by Lucifer's comic power level, the baddies he would soon face would be overpowered as well. I ran a palm through my face and sighed. The problem was that I was trying to control everything, and I couldn't. No one can accept maybe the devil next door and he was too much of a douche at your own way and I'm super chill kinda entity to try that. I was burning myself out by worrying about what ifs. 
The best thing I could do at that moment was deal with everything systematically, so I got up from my position and walked to the shower. Not that I was dirty or anything but the cold water helped me to cool my head and think things through. I came to a solution real quick. After a change of clothes, a portal to the elemental dimension opened inside my room and I stepped through. If I was worried about Maze or Lucifer finding out about the system then why not just do my thing somewhere that would drastically reduce the chances of that happening? I breathed in the fresh air of sanctuary and one word came to my thoughts, tranquil. Sooner or later, I was going to build a house here, it would be my vacation spot. The place I came to think when I got tired of the blue planet. Earth was too dot loud, I'm used to myself, walking and sitting inside a poorly constructed cabana. It was thatched from palm leaves, a sheared off wood platform that was my version of a table and the ground was covered with animal hide. It broke my heart to admit I was a poor at construction work. I propped my hands up on the table and read through the folder. Ten minutes later I was cursing Lucifer's name. This guy really wants me dead. A prompt from the system caught my eye. Chain quest initiated. Destroy Galil's known associates 05. First mission colon famine and drought. A trail of endless hunger. The demon Nimoth is causing destruction in Africa, a cute little country called Kenya which is roughly the size of Texas. The big bad devil doesn't like that a certain someone is disparaging his name and running his reputation even more to the ground than it already is. So he has dispatched you, Aiden Strong, demon hunter to send this foodie back to hell where he belongs. Objectives. 1. Kill Nemoth or exorcise him. 2. Do so before he calls for some hellish backup and devours the shit out of you. 3. Do so before he crosses the boundary into Sudan, successfully triggering canon events. Time limit, 24 hours. Mission difficulty, hard. First of all, why is the first mission's difficulty put on hard? Secondly how the fuck am I going to get to Africa within 24 hours and still get the time to locate Nimoth? My boom tube only works for places I've been or know pretty well. I sighed loudly and felt like kicking something upon a sudden realization. I'm going to have to ask Lucifer to teleport me there aren't I? The only other option I have is to ask the Justice League for passage through the Zeta tubes and that is never ever going to happen. I mean, they would probably allow it if I informed them it was a matter of life and death. But I didn't want to take that chance. So it was back to the devil again. Oh well, I could use the time left after killing Nimoth to actually to a place. I hear Kenya is a beautiful country. Time to carry out my first demon hunter mission and hope I survive enough to reach 18. My birthday is only a few weeks away after all. Chapter 80, Countermeasures Baby. This time, I pictured the living room of Lucifer's penthouse. I eyed the boom tube ominously and decided to take the plunge. I stepped through and came face to face with Lucy calmly watching me, hands clasped together and feet crossed. We had a bet going on how long it would take you to realize, you had no way of getting to Africa and come back to ask for help. He told me in that amused tone I was starting to hate. I turned my attention to Maze. My eyebrows rose up when the limb in question, brought the glass in her hands to her mouth and swallowed the contents in one move. She slammed the glass back on the table and winced. I lost. She informed me testily, glaring at me as if I was to blame. Explains why she's still drinking though. Not the best start if you want to make a good impression on your customers Aiden. Lucifer innocently said. I narrowed my eyes. This bastard. Then again. I'm the one who left before reading through the mission first. I actually thought you were already in Africa with that fancy portal ability, speaking of which. He continued. Don't ask me why I share that ability with Vandal Savage, please. I cut him off. I didn't feel ready to divulge the existence of the elemental dimension. If ever. Normally I would come up with an excuse or lie but that had zero chance of working on a deceiver. MMMH. More secrets. Fine I won't push you, just as long you keep your end of the bargain and provide me with some fun entity. He coughed lightly. I looked at him in disbelief. You were totally going to say entertainment, weren't you? Holy crap, is that why you don't want to get your ass up and deal with this demon problem by yourself? Because you're bored? I asked him, gaping in surprise. Maze started laughing at the situation. Lucifer opened his mouth to talk and closed it upon the look on my face. You can't lie remember? That's your whole deal. I reminded him while crossing my hands. I dot well, it wouldn't be a lie to say, I find a measure of enjoyment in the absurd circumstances you'll undoubtedly find yourself in, during your tenure as my dot underling. My head buzzed and I clutched the frame of the couch tightly. Maze's laughter increased. Underling? Under dotling. 
I muttered lifelessly. Ouch. You know what? I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. To me this is at the very least, a partnership. A partnership based on mutual benefits. I didn't know who I was trying to convince more. Me or them. Keep telling yourself that kid. Maze responded to my words from her seat. I breathed in and chose to let it go for more important things. The mission had a time limit and every minute I stood here trading bobs and joking with these two was precious time I could be using to track down Namoth, finish my mission and four more tasks later, be out of Lucifer's service. I just thank God, there were no binding contracts to sign or who knows if I'd be bound by a clause hidden in layers and layers of trickery. Lucifer doesn't lie yes but that just means he found better alternatives to get his way. Back to the mission. I'm going to need a few things. I told them seriously. The joking mood from before had abated somewhat. Lucy motioned for me to continue and I obliged. I sat down and leaned forward, the folder in my hand. Like you guessed, I need you to teleport me as close to Nimoth's last known location as possible. He thought about it for a few seconds before shrugging. Seeing as this is your first task, I'll allow it. However, moving forward, you're on your own. The aim was to make you work for me not the other way around. He responded and I nodded in gratitude. Thank you. I told him and turned to Maze. The second thing is dot I need a weapon, preferably a long knife or sword. It needs to be durable, really durable. Something tells me you're the person to talk to. A slow smile worked its way onto Maze's face. I change my mind good, you are fun. General POV. A nondescript conservation area, Kenya. Inside the cave covered with green glowing moss, a spectacle was about to unfold. An earthquake's big enough to register as dangerous in the richer scale shook the ground surrounding the cave. Some of the lichen covering the walls of the cave as well as pieces of rocks detached and broke off, falling to the ground and further illuminating the cave. On the farthest end, a section of the cave cracked apart, revealing a sealed-off tunnel. Inside the tunnel, a red light started pulsing. The watchtower, temporary base for the team. Aquilid was standing at the end of the Justice League table, while pointing to the holographic visual feed between them. Almost all League members were present barring the Green Lanterns who were off-world, Martian Manhunter who was. Nobody actually knew where he was. Just that he had something he needed to take care of and lastly, Superman who was dealing with the fallout of an earthquake in East Africa. Three missions this past week, all successfully completed with no unexpected developments. He said, carefully studying the faces of their new overseer and mentors. Commendable work, Aquilid. You and your team have been exceptional. Captain Atom praised. The Stoic Atlantean gave a sharp nod and replied. Thank you Captain and although your praise is appreciated and welcome. We're not without grievances. Aquaman sighed. He knew what was coming after hearing called Orr's words. To put it in simpler terms, you're limiting us, giving us the safe bet options, keeping us held up in the watchtower thinking that the marvel of the trust and consideration you have shown us, will make us more amenable to whatever you want. That's not going to cut it anymore. No one spoke up to interrupt him because they knew what he said was true. The Flash glanced at Captain Atom and wondered how he was going to handle this. Batman would usually narrow his eyes and tell them in a gruff voice, you are ready when I say you're ready. The speedster mused, finding himself missing the Dark Knight. MMMH. Captain Atom hummed in thought and then looked up. You're concerned that nothing substantial is being done to find your wayward teammate. He stated, cutting right into the heart of the matter. Aquilid looked a little unbalanced at that. The Flash swallowed a chuckle. Okay, the army dude is sneaky. Trust me when I say that the League's numerous resources are being directed to the directive. As soon as anything comes in, the League will keep you up to the team in the fold sun and then you can bring him in. Captain Atom concluded, stealing the wind from Aquilid's sails. It was a move that was so unlike Batman that it worked just as effectively as any of the Dark Knight's plans. It's not. Aquila tried to gather himself and failed. Any argument he tried to make would just be seen as a petulant and immature move, further harming his cause of trying to get more serious missions, something that the Flash didn't understand. Things were better when there were zero missions. That was the whole point of the Justice League. To keep the world safe, serious missions stood in direct opposition to that. Don't these kids get it? Aquila stepped back and gave the customary salute to his king and nodded to the rest of the League. Thank you for your time. I'll excuse myself. The Flash watched him leave and immediately turned to Captain Atom. You do know that excuse won't work next time right? The silver-colored face of his colleague showed confusion at Flash's words. 
Excuse, what do you mean? Captain Atom questioned. Barry and the others exchanged glances. Wait. You mean, you will actually allow them access to any intel we find on the whereabouts of Maelstrom knowing full well they will want to carry out that mission by themselves? Green Arrow wondered from his seat. Atom took a few seconds to answer but when he did, his voice was calm, firm and brokered no argument. Yes. Well good to see they share some character traits at least. The League just isn't the same without bats. The Flash thought. Let's get on with the meeting. Yesterday, a cache of alien technology was seized from Intergang during a face-off with Superman and Batman. Aiden's POV. Finding a Catholic church in the City of Angels actually proved to be a bit difficult, further adding to how different this L.A. was to my own. The vibe was the same but most buildings were constructed differently. This wasn't an alternate timeline to my universe but instead a whole different dimension in a far-off multivessel cluster from whichever mundane one my former planet was. After consulting Google Maps, I found one nearby, just nine blocks from Lux. The walk there was awkward, and after a while I chose to stick to the rooftops after too many people stared at me like a weirdo. One of them even muttered something about fucking campy cosplayers. I didn't blame them though. I had a new look after all. Not that new really. But the trench coat above my maelstrom costume and the half mask that covered my neck and lower section of my face, made me out to be a completely different person. The trench coat had a hood that covered my head and obscured a direct sight to my eyes. Why the trench coat? Two reasons. One, to obviously hide my identity. Being seen in my maelstrom costume would be like a beacon calling the team or even the Justice League down on my ass. Two, to hide the two long daggers I had strapped on my body. Why the long knives? And also why the church? Good question, you see while I was having that cold shower, I thought of something. Galil as a demon had gone down pretty easily due to me catching him off guard. I had no guarantee that Nimoth on the other hand would also fall just as easy, considering the fact that the mission itself had been rated as hard in the mission parameters text box, then things weren't so clear cut. I could very well be dealing with a demon who was impervious or could nullify my attacks. Before I left, Maze had one piece of advice to tell me, not all demons are the same. I took that advice very seriously and the reason I was here was to see if the priest would bless my daggers and if I could get some holy water. Countermeasures baby, anything to make sure I reached 18. Something told me the system had something great planned for my birthday surprise. Chapter 81, The Green Part 1. Guy Lisbon was an accomplished archaeologist. A 2007 archaeologist of a year winner. An expert on Sumerian and Egyptian prehistoric customs, artifacts and had overseen important dig sites that led to the discovery of some of the oldest and well-kept relics from when civilization was just a nascent young thing. That was the guy Lisbon the world knew. The guy Lisbon who was a renowned scientific genius due to improving the current dating methods through his unique thinking, and discovered enigma forgotten by time by his out-of-the-box approach. But just like any other human, Guy had layers. Guy had a sickness. A genetic curse persistent to the Lisbon family that he had spent his whole life trying to find a cure for and his time was running out. The sickness was a slow mutation that would cause, black scales to sprout and take over his body until in the end he was nothing but a raving creature with a taste for blood. He had seen his father get driven to the same fate and later committed suicide when he had hurt his wife, Guy's mum. Science couldn't help him, no matter how many best in the field doctors and specialists he consulted, but roughly a month ago, he had started getting visions. Dreams directing him to this relatively known country in Africa. A place with a magical cave in which inside was a pool that had healing properties. He had no idea where the visions were coming from. Emboldened and after extensive study into all he could get about this mysterious place, he had dedicated his remaining time to following this lead for a way to beat his unknown sickness. And his search had led him here, a nondescript village hidden between two valleys in the outskirts of the Hell's Gate National Park in Kenya. But that was when everything went wrong. They had trekked for ten miles across the rocky terrain of the northern part of the country. And when night had fallen, they had pitched tents in the woods, a fire burning bright between them. Guy had listened in skeptical interest as his guides, two locals spoke of the Magini, the close approximation being demons that made the forest their homes. The rest had not believed them, had even laughed at them. Guy wished they listened and hightailed the fuck out of there. However, during the night, they'd been attacked by something that defied all logic. A monster. His men dot all lay dead behind in the woods. Getting here had not been easy. Guy closed his eyes and winced while remembering the screams. The darkness encroaching closer and closer to him just like Freddy and Shannon, his friends and the mercenaries he had hired to accompany him in this expedition. 
he tightened his fists. If his saviors had only been a few seconds later dot he would have been devoured as well. But luckily, these people had arrived, chanting in an unrecognizable language, with green energy glowing from their eyes and tattoos. A green fire had sprouted between Guy and the creature, whatever it was. The villagers had saved him. The last thing Guy had seen was the village chief standing before him. Then he'd awoken in a hut, lying down on a mat with traditionally dressed people staring at him. Guy looked at his hand in panic, tightly garbed in a grey clothing that did nothing to hide the black disfigured skin. His sickness. And it had now spread to his elbow. Damn it. Then he remembered all that had happened and his mood plummeted further down. All this was his fault. It was all his fault. He had to make it right. Somehow. Speaking of which. He looked up at the faces of the village chieftain and elders. We are putting the lives of our people in danger by accepting this white man here. One of the elders said heatedly. Guy didn't need to understand what he was saying to know that he was not welcome here. Fortunately, he could understand Swahili. Angalium Kono wake. Atayakona Mashani, look at his hand, he carries demons with him. Another village elder, dressed in animal skin just like the rest of them spoke up while pointing a finger towards him. The middle-aged archaeologist sat up, propping his back on the walls of the hut. Normally, Guy would be perfect for this. His sweet words and great sense of the African culture would grant him a modicum of hospitality from his hosts. However, he didn't have time for that now. So he solidly looked at the chieftain the only one dressed in a ceremonial headdress designed from bones and animal feathers. What sort of animal was that? The village chief looked at him grimly. Aiden's POV. So the old priest had looked at me strangely when after I'd requested for holy water and gotten it, I'd shamelessly asked him to bless my daggers too. No amount of it's for a holy purpose, father had worked. So I cut my losses and left, mulling over the words he'd told me, go forth with the Lord, my son. Whatever is troubling you, I pray he delivers his divine wisdom to light your path. Oh and he'd also added, don't kill anyone. Like dot did I look that much like a serial killer? I was only dressed in a trench coat with two daggers trapped on my body for Christ said dot oh dot makes sense why he would say that. I made my way to an alley and after making sure that no one was around through my aerokinetic sense, I put a hand in my pocket and came out with a coin. A coin that had the number 666 imprinted on one side and the face of the devil with two horns on the other. Real original. This was a one-time used teleportation item, courtesy of the devil and his companion. I did as they had instructed me and held the coin tight in my hand, picturing where I wanted to go with closed eyes. A second later, I felt my body suddenly get tugged somewhere. Opening my eyes, I found myself at least 50 meters in midair falling down towards a settlement surrounded by a forest from all sides. The surprise was so real, I didn't have time to slow myself down and slammed onto the ground. I secretly cheered after sticking the superhero landing. Take that, Iron Man. A wave of my hand and the dust that had rose up due to my landing was swept away, revealing the faces of scared women and kids hiding behind or close to the huts, all warily watching me. I raised up my hands and some of them flinched, making me feel bad for spooking them in the first place. So sorry guys, I'm. A young guy came running from inside the huge hut in the middle of the village. One look at me and he snarled in hostility. He was dressed in a an animal skin skirt, with tattoos running up his arms, like Aqualid and built even more solidly than Superboy. Stranger. You are not welcome here. He told me while a dozen warriors and spears came from behind him. Leave or face the wrath of he who illuminates the garden. Okay, what? Well, really sorry. This is a misunderstanding. I come in peace. My words trailed off when he stepped forward and slammed his hands onto the ground. Instantly, my senses registered a unique energy that was teeming with life essence around his form. A huge vine broke through the ground next to me and slammed down onto my position. I jumped away and watched as it smashed the earth in with a loud sound and left cracks. Dust rose up and a rumble spread out through the whole area as more vines and tree roots broke through the soil. Okay. Dot, I wasn't expecting that. The daggers appeared in my hands. General POV. Mays poured Lucifer a drink as he stared off into space. She took the glass off the table and handed it to him. You didn't lie to him but you didn't tell him everything either. She told him. Lucifer waved a hand and the air before them shimmered before coalescing into a mirror, showing a clip of Aiden fighting against vines. Shaman's MMHM? Didn't think there were any more left on this earth. Maze hummed while taking a sip. In many Earths. 
Lucifer added. About the dot we could have literally gone to any other universe, Earth 666 was the initial plan in fact. You know, keeping up with the whole symbolism thing but no, last minute and you decide to bring us here, Earth 16. Maze told him with a smirk. I don't see you complaining, love. Admit it, you love it here. Lucifer shot back while enjoying his drink. Maze turned her eyes to the screen and smiled. The boy is interesting. Lucifer nodded. That he is. Maze frowned in thought. But he doesn't know what he's about to face. You kept it vague enough to. Lucifer finished off her sentence. Keep him interested while still sufficiently cautious. It will be a real challenge for him but no worries, he will come out on top Maze. He is dot special. Very special indeed. Maze brought a hand to her chest with a grimace. Her heart beat faster. Her emotions were all over the place. She was dot worried. She was worried for Aiden. The Lilum took a deep breath and resolved to wait. There wasn't a need to intervene. This was the boy's trial. Let's get this show on the road. Lucifer snapped a finger and a bowl of popcorn appeared on the table, replacing the vase of ambient roses she had gone to the trouble of ordering. Maze stared at her boss in intimidation and very slowly, she reached out a hand and grabbed a handful of popcorn. Lucifer tried to ignore the death stare bedside and snapped his fingers again. The books lying on the corner of the table burst into light and in their place, the same flower vase from before appeared. We good? He wondered out loud. We good. Maze nodded, happy the death stare worked just as usual. Chapter 82 The green part to a conversation was going on in the penthouse. Lucifer's to be exact. He's going to be much stronger. Maze commented. You do know that right? And this time's he's going to be prepared. Aiden might even lose. She further added. Lucifer rolled his eyes at the Lilim. Maze we've been over this already. The boy needs this. Your incessant words of concern are not going to change my mind. The devil told her firmly. A smile crossed his face. Besides, he needs his own dot what do the humans call it, rogues gallery. It's a custom in the gape business. Lucifer fully turned to stare at her incredulously. I don't think I've ever seen you worried about anyone else before, love. It apostrophe s dot he grimaced trying to come up with a word, disconcerting. Oddly endearing too but mostly disconcerting. Maze crossed her hands in annoyance. I'm merely worried about my daggers. They're precious after all. Not that you'd appreciate the workmanship done on them. She grumbled as Lucifer laughed. Meanwhile the subject of their talk was doing his best to avoid getting skewered by roots. Aiden's POV. Could you stop attacking me for one second? I'm not here dot for fuck's sake. My words were cut off when another vine swiped at me. I brandished my daggers while sidestepping the huge ass vine. The damn thing was easily one meter thick and long. And it wasn't the only one or even the largest. I blocked it with my palm, firmly grasped it and pulled. The ground below me trembled as the whole thing broke at the base before I could pull it out completely. Thorns grew out of its length and tried to pierce me only to fail. I threw the whole thing to the side with a sigh. This was dumb. The dude wasn't even letting me talk. I couldn't use any of my flame attacks because of the close proximity to the huts and the villagers who were watching the altercation instead of running far away from the fight. Guess dumb civilians with a death wish are a common staple everywhere. I had resolved not to use air bending, but it was fast becoming the only quick solution to this. I could blitz towards him at high speed, I doubt any of his attacks could actually hurt me, and before he knows it quickly send him to dreamland through a love tap to the head. But that carried the risk of hurting him badly. Black Canary had always warned us to avoid using those types of moves if there was an alternative. Damn it, guess that leaves air bending. Oh well, just this one time. One of the daggers whirled in my hands, a minute draft getting produced by the action, while another vine slammed down on me. I sliced it apart like a sushi chef, my hands dancing in the air with scary precision. Once airbending came into play, this shit became too easy, especially given that I could sense the vibrations in the air as the vines shot towards me. The guy swiped his hands out and the tattoos running up his arms glowed green even more. He stomped his left leg to the front and slammed his palms together, a grimace on his dark face. The energy I was feeling before, started pulsing in intensity, showing just how much power he was putting in this. The next attack was more exaggerated than effective. The ground started sprouting vines shaped like thorns. Sharp pointy thorns. I flew up and surveyed the scene. I was now close to the tree line. I shook my head at this guy's impulsiveness. His attack had even taken out some of the huts closest to me. Luckily no one was injured. 
The same bland attacks came at me. This time the vines rose up like a tidal wave from my front. Like a hundred anacondas rising up to meet me, the vines sought to not only smack me out to the sky but to pierce through me like a pincushion. I could fly even higher but the trees at my back extended their branches to box me in. Okay, gotta give some credit, that was a good strategy. The look on his face was smug satisfaction. That pissed me off. Oh oh, you have no idea who you're messing with man. I leaned forward, a sheath of wind springing up to cover the blade, enhancing its already fierce sharpness even further and then I slashed out. One of the reasons I was wary to use my aerokinetic abilities, was how the air itself seemed to get excited around me. That led to even my smallest of attacks getting blown out of proportion. A violent wind sprang up from my move, a keening sound wave following my intent, not only slicing the attack headed to me into little pieces but shredding and grinding those little pieces to dust. The vines disintegrated, the ground below was littered with cracks as the soil was unearthed. My eyes widened and I reined in the air before I could kill everyone in the vicinity. The massive winds of death were successfully contained. Luckily, the air was always ready to do my bidding. I released it into a gentle breeze that sent away all the dust hanging in the air and clouding the place. Three huts were down. The thatched roof and wooden walls were just debris scattered about the battlefield. I looked around at the devastation and sighed in helplessness. I love fighting just like any other power-obsessed maniac but destroying property has always left a bad taste inside my mouth. The occasional pyromaniac induced burn it all down aside, this was just wasteful. I heard coughing just as I stepped down onto the ground. The warriors from earlier who had been carrying spears and shields dragged themselves up from their strewn about positions warily. Looks of shock were apparent on their faces after my little show of power. They flinched when I raised my dagger, thinking I was about to attack. I made no sudden movements and slowly sheathed the blade inside my coat then raised my hands up to pacify them. Please. Can we just talk now? I have no ill intent towards you people. I am here to hunt a demon. For added measure, I removed the hood, covering most of my upper face and a collective gasp went through the warriors. Murmurs rose up and if anything the hostility gave way to confusion. One of the thatched roofs from the destroyed huts was violently hurled away, and the angry vine guy stood up, holding his hand close to his body. A trail of blood was running down from his bicep where a spike was stuck inside. Some of the warriors ran to his side but he shrugged them off, his eyesight never leaving mine. A hard look crossed my face as I prepared to suck the air out of him in case he attacked me again. Careful buddy, this time I'm not going to show you mercy. I warned him as he stepped closer, the grimace on his face showing both the pain he was under and the anger boiling underneath his face. What was this guy's problem? I mean, I understand asking somebody to leave but he almost seemed murderous. As if he was just using that excuse to take revenge for something. The familiar green glow that I was quickly starting to form a theory about, manifested in his skin. Look around you fool, this fight is hurting your people more than it is me. I implored. The warriors were now exchanging worried looks and some were talking to him, saying something along the lines of Wakana name Kyu Wang U. Please stop it my lord. Before he could attack me again, an angry voice sounded out in the same language. Anafania Ninai. Ninai in Andeli Hapa? Masli Wakahai Mambo. What are you doing? What is going on here? Masley stop this now. Upon the name drop, everyone turned as a collective to stare at an elder gentleman dressed in the same garb as the warriors. The only difference was how the same tattoos inscribed on the vine guy I was now sure was named Masley, seemed to cover his whole body. Masley looked back at the older gentleman and blinked in surprise and guilt. Mjomba. Uncle. I breathed out a sigh and relaxed a little. Looks like the fight was over. For now at least. Gosh, Lucifer is right. I suck at first impressions. The pair of Masley and the older gentleman got into a heated argument and the younger of the two seemed to deflate in himself as he lost. Masley threw me a disgusted look and stomped away. Most of the warriors followed him and it was then I noticed how almost all of them were around Masley's age if not younger, which meant around mine. That's unusual. I was pulled out of my musings by the older man who walked over to stand before me. He studied me for a few seconds which unnerved me more than I cared to admit. His eyes had a green glow that just seemed to see right through me. Stranger, I apologize for my nephew's brashness. These are troubling times you've found my village in. Who are you? I raised an eyebrow. The old man could speak English. It was heavily accented but still, a welcome surprise. My name is Maelstrom. I mean no harm to your village. And I apologize for all the destruction my fight with your nephew caused. I bowed my head a little, as a sign of respect. 
Are you the leader? The man hummed and closed his eyes a little. I'm not. The village chief is or rather was my brother, he has been missing along with most of our veteran warriors and a white man for a week now. He stopped to gauge my reaction. I don't know what he was expecting because although that particular news was interesting, I had no context to judge it from. I'm sorry for that, but I'm not sure I understand. I replied. So you were not together? MMH. Most curious, follow me. He told me and abruptly turned to leave. I stepped up to follow behind him closely. We passed by more huts and villages, all of whom looked at me warily. I am the high shaman of he who illuminates the garden. He explained. I'm sorry, what? I didn't really understand what he was talking about. The guy was suffering from the being cryptic disease. We diverged off the track towards a bigger hut set in the middle of the village and instead took one that went in between trees. A low-hanging mist covered that direction and looked. Ominous. Tell me champion of the white, what is it you seek? He inquired taking calm and measured steps towards the mist. The white? What is that? I know about the green but what is the white? He suddenly stopped and rounded up to stare at me. A look of surprise on his face. You are not aware of where you draw your strength from? Interesting. He brought a hand to his chin and caressed it. A smile showing a surprisingly white set of teeth appeared on his face. We have much to talk about. The look on his face told me I was about to get hit with some deep revelations. Damn it, this was supposed to be a fight with a demon. A simple affair. Chapter 83 The Green Final Part after the old shaman said that, he turned and continued walking forward. I paused a little in place while mulling over his yet again cryptic words. His form grew hazy as the mist obscured my sight. Despite possessing enhanced senses, my eyesight could only clearly see a few meters ahead of me. That fact was further compounded by the fading evening sunset as well. That said, this mist was anything but natural. It would have been a simple matter to get rid of it through aerokinesis but it almost felt dot wrong. This whole place gave me a sacred vibe. Let's not risk upsetting some gods. Are you coming? The shaman asked from my front, his voice colored by amusement. Seeing no other choice, I shrugged and followed. My steps were also soft and measured. I was careful, unsure of what to expect next but ready for anything. The previous incident had shown me that these people were powerful and I had no idea if the shaman was leading me to a trap or not. The mist started retracting slightly giving way to a green glow that lined up the path. The soil beneath me became even softer and wetter, showing me that a source of water was nearby. I kept my eyes trained on the back of the elder shaman and when he stopped, I quickly stepped forward to see what he was looking at. The mist suddenly pulled away from my vision and I gasped, coming to a stop right next to the aged shaman. The moonlight was gently sending rays of light down on a beautiful garden. There was a circular open space that extended 20 meters from a massive tree in the middle of the garden to the tree line. A pool of glowing water which looked serene was before the tree, a small wooden bridge, clearly man-made but very old seeing as vines had crept all along the structure, provided the way to cross over to the other side. Between the pool and the huge tree was a simple shrine with a statue of the same exact tree standing before an altar. What the actual dot fuck? I muttered in shock. The energy inside this space was tremendous. It buzzed across my skin like a current, leaving me with goosebumps. I threw a glance at my tour guide who merely smiled while swiping a hand out to the whole area. Welcome to the shrine of he who illuminates the garden. General POV. You're being irrational. Two men sat at a table in Metropolis, a fairly popular pie shop, located near the docks called, Freddy's Pie and Pizzeria Palace. A mouthful but damn if they didn't make the best damn pie in Metropolis, Bruce Wayne mused, stabbing into a piece of the pie with a fork. Are you even listening Bruce? Clark Kent asked the billionaire playboy philanthropist. The former removed his glasses, a rare action when he wasn't in his other persona and rubbed his eyes. The action got a raised eyebrow from the elite Gothamite. Clark sighed and wore his glasses once more. I'm worried about you. It's not the same anymore without your presence. And you've also been acting. I'm fine, Clark. There's no need to worry about me. Just tell me if you got what I asked. Bruce was quick to interject. Instead of answering, the veteran journalist looked around at the restaurant. I understand the need to meet here at Freddy's. The pie is to die for after all, but Bruce thought you do know that you're always welcome. If not up there, then Lois and I would be happy if you could come for dinner sometime. Bruce narrowed his eyes at Clark. You're stalling. He told him, making the other man smile wryly. Sorry, 
had to dry. Clark reached into his briefcase and came out with a flash drive along with a folder containing a few pictures and documents. All the images and information I took are in there. I was surprised when you called me during the rescue mission for a favor. So why the sudden interest Bruce? The location is near the border between Ethiopia and Kenya and while both countries have a peaceful relationship, they get anxious whenever a third party is spotted near the boundary. Especially considering the ongoing tensions between Kenya and Somalia. I flew above the location, trying to spot anything through a wide range of vision and came up with nothing. Clark's tone changed to a serious one. Bruce opened the folder and started going through the pictures. A look of concentration on his face. The images showed a perfect valley, free of any local settlements for miles. So how and where would they have disappeared to? Could magic be involved? That was one of the only ways someone could hide from Superman's vision. Bruce. Bruce. Clark added more forcefully, pulling the Wayne out of his thoughts. He looked up and saw Clark's look of concern increase. I didn't want to say this but the dark circles around your eyes. You haven't been getting enough sleep, have you? Clark questioned. I am fine. Bruce replied with a hard tone turning his attention back to the folder. Clark knew a lost cause when he saw one. He wasn't going to get through to him, so he decided to speak to Alfred later and get him to stop Bruce from pushing himself too much. But that didn't mean Clark was giving up. A huge hand belonging to the journalist was laid above the files, stopping Bruce from perusing through any further. Tell me what is going on. I have been more than patient with you Bruce. What are you looking for? He refused to budge. Bruce looked him in the eyes and saw the Kent family stubbornness reflected there. A small smile worked its way onto his face. Fine. In response Clark smiled and leaned back, crossing his hands and waiting for the billionaire to talk. Guy Lisbon, world-renowned archaeologist, a friend of mine. Aiden's POV. It was peaceful. I breathed in and out. My chest filling with clean air that was full of green life energy. We were seated, cross-legged before the altar of he who illuminates the garden which was the title of the tree standing tall, over us. The evening had given way to the darkness of the night. But even that, just added more beauty to the shrine and surrounding vegetation. The pool glowed and pinpricks of light shimmered on the tree above us, like miniature stars captured and stored in the leaves. Champion of the white, feel the deep calling of that which connects the whole planet. An interrelation that transcends all understanding. Feel it, feel it and maybe you'll understand your own link with the parliament that grants you strength. I did as he asked, using my unique energy sense to dive in. Exploring the bonds, the interconnections, the associations. The tree was alive, as was every plant. My energy sense spread across Africa, traveling through green circuit lines, through the roots, branches, vines and leaves. I felt a deep pulse of the same green energy, a beacon from Louisiana back in the US before even that was drowned out by the entirety of it all. And it was a thrilling revelation that left me gasping at the beauty of what I had seen, hidden from the common man's eyesight. Life comes in many forms, young elemental. I felt the words, undecipherable to my ears yet the impact they left inside my spirit was undeniable and understandable. I wasn't dealing with a mere god or entity. I was dealing with the spirit of all that the green was. It was overwhelming and I felt that if I was anyone else, my mind would have been reduced to nothing. When you're ready. My mind was catapulted back to the open space and I instantly felt blind. I grimaced and hugged myself, suddenly shivering. My emotions were all over the place. What, what was wrong with me? Ha ha ha. Don't worry about it. Some of the initiates even cry their first time upon connection with the hub. You get a simple glimpse and that glimpse stays with you for the rest of your life. Just take a few deep breaths and everything will be okay. I did as the shaman instructed and took a few minutes to calm myself, going over everything I had seen. It was clear to see that my powers had been influenced by certain DC elements. This white in particular, I had a theory on what it was but fortunately there wasn't a need to stress myself out when I had someone who could answer any questions I had. When I did relax, I figured it was time to start off with a question that had been bugging me. What is your name? I softly asked. MMMH he hummed, taking a drag from a pipe that he had lit up amid my trip he ride across the network of vegetation. I had a name once, I had a life outside this village. That is how I came to learn your language after all. But that was a long time ago. These days, I am called the High Shaman, and that is the name I'll take to the eventual communion. He explained in that cryptic way I was starting to associate with all old people. Communion? You mean death? I asked. In response the old man laughed. Death? 
We do not die, we simply live on as a part of the whole. A different form. Look up, he instructed, pointing towards the pinpricks of light shining above us in the leaves of the tree. My ancestors watch over me and this land. He who illuminates the garden is the collective consciousness of all of them. Chosen champions of the green tasked with protecting and safeguarding the garden, the earth and more. His words brought about even more questions, questions I traded for more relevant ones. What is the white? The shaman took a drag of his pipe and let out the smoke. It whirled in the air smoothly, floating up in a long winding line. He leaned forward and stared at me in deep concentration. That is not something I can tell you. You will have to find it out for yourself. Motherfuck. Chapter 84 Prelude to the Who the Old Man Was Stubborn. I'll give you that. All I needed was confirmation. Just that. Following fictional comic book world settings, it was obvious to anyone that the white was the elemental force governing air, and maybe other various gases and airborne agents, which meant for all my elements, there was a likely scenario that compatible parliaments existed. I could even see its influence in my air bending. As stated before, upon reaching Grand Mastery, everything had just become easier to control, aerokinetic wise. Maybe that was the influence of the white in part with my own understanding of airbending? Who knows? What I knew however was that, any theories I had would have to be tested further at a later time because dot I had a mission to complete. I looked at the countdown to the mission displayed on my upper vision. Five hours had already gone by and I had nineteen more left to kill the moth. I internally shook my head. Even without my former team, none of my missions ever seemed to go according to plan. No point in stressing about it though. There was nothing I could do to change things and the good thing about all that was that the harder shit got, the better, stronger and more experienced I would too. So I smiled and looked at the aged shaman. Fine. Keep your secrets. I like surprises anyway. He matched my smile and nodded. Good. It is wise to learn patience when you're young. A valuable lesson someone like you should take seriously. Especially since you have a very important role to play in all of this. I raised an eyebrow. More cryptic statements old man? Trying to see if I'll rise to the bait? I asked him, already seeing through his act. The shaman laughed. No, nothing like that, I'm being serious. He stopped and studied me in interest. I have never seen anyone blessed by the world like you. The power radiating off your body and spirit dot is awe-inspiring. I shook my head, feeling uncomfortable. What he was obviously perceiving was the elemental energy that the system processed for me to power my abilities. I wasn't a traditional avatar and sometimes while that had its own advantages, I had this dot worry that I was losing out on the true essence of what truly made the avatar, the avatar. It was a fear, I always carried. What if one day, I lost the system? What if it found me unworthy and chose another replacement? What if I lost all my abilities? It was why I had been so obsessed with becoming a meta-human before. A desire that had lessened over time but it was good to know I had options. You're weighed down by worries. The aged shaman took another drag of his pipe and commented. I stared at him in surprise. Was I that easy to read? Fear makes life worth living. It's the catalyst, a tempering platform to forge your spirit into something fierce, so use it as a tool just like any but don't let it overwhelm you. I was speechless for a few seconds. That dot those words had hit deep. It had been long since someone had been so understanding with me. Lucifer and Maze were a different story because like it or not, our relationship was backed by mutual benefits, plus this was a more tough love kind of thing. This guy didn't share the same connection with me yet he tried to leave me with a valuable life lesson. I inclined my head in a nod. Thank you, I won't forget that. He hummed. See that you don't, now tell me something, young man, what is it you seek? He questioned, changing the subject of the conversation. Finally, I am here on a hunt. A hunt for a demon called Nemoth. His eyes widened a little upon my statement. A strange look crossed his face. I, see. Everything makes a lot more sense now. Come, I have something I need to show you. He rose up, stretched his muscles and walked towards the bridge. I followed him. I looked over my shoulder at the huge tree we were leaving behind and once more marveled at the feeling it gave off. We crossed the bridge and I looked down at the glowing pond in curiosity. There's something different about this pool of water. What is it? The shaman was silent for a while before he finally answered. That pool of water is known as the waters of rebirth, Magia Uzima, in Swahili and, Rujiawa in our true native language. Okay. Now I'm interested. What does it do? I wondered out loud. Exactly what it says, just remember, nothing ever comes free. 
there is always a price. His words took on an ominous note. Normally he'd be right. However, my adaptable physique ensured that I remained the chocolate piece of hotness that I was, barring extreme conditions and stimuli, things that were only actively meant to truly hurt me. If I could get just a single droplet into my elemental dimension, replicating it would have been possible and I would have the equivalent of magic water that did. Something about rebirth? Maybe total healing no matter how hurt or injured someone was? Or true rebirth upon death? Like a maxed out Lazarus pit, oh shit what if this thing was just a Lazarus pit with makeup on? Even if it was, I wasn't going to pass up the opportunity to get a sample. The shaman and I managed to pass through the misty boulevard leading to the garden shrine and I hurried to keep up pace with him. We came upon the village and I saw a massive bonfire at the middle of the village, near the huge hut. A lot of the village women and children were seated there. They bowed in respect of the shaman as we passed and threw looks of hatred and a slew of more negative emotions my way. Something had happened here. It wasn't normal for everyone to hold such distaste for outsiders like this. Why do the villagers look two seconds away from grabbing pitchforks and torches to lynch me? I questioned my guide. I'll explain later. For now, keep quiet and follow me. He replied. Like that we left the village and came upon the boundaries of the settlement. There were four lookout towers, positioned in a box-like formation along the edges of the village, each looking at one cardinal direction. Two guards were on the one we passed by. They nodded at the shaman respectfully and paid no heed to me. Those towers had remained unused up until now. He said in a sad tone. I didn't comment, understanding that silence worked better in this situation. We stepped onto a path that wound, taking us away from the village. Although it was dark, a few flaming torches lined up the path we were walking through. The reason why the villagers abhor your presence is due to another outsider. Oh, I listened intently as he began to speak. A man by the name of Guy Lisbon. He claimed that he was a world-renowned archaeologist, looking for the fabled waters of rebirth to heal his sickness. The chief of course refused. It is against our customs after all. He noticed my confusion after looking at me over his shoulder. The ancestors inform us of the will of he who illuminates and as I was communing with them, they noticed the darkness hiding in the outsider's soul, an inky blackness that if allowed to persist would infect the garden. Alas, the man would convince the chief to take another alternative. A trade. The waters of rebirth for a chance to kill the demon that has been plaguing our lands the past month. Saying that, he motioned out to our front, the end of the path we had taken. Once my eyes adjusted, I balked at what I was seeing. A field, barren with black smudges and dirty stagnated pools of water, spread out over hundreds of meters. The trees at the edges looked sickly and everything smelled rotten. I almost felt like puking. Sulfur. I murmured, remembering the brief crash course maze had given me on demons. There was no denying it anymore. Nemoth was here, or had been at least. Our entire field of crops, decimated and the soil our ancestors toiled destroyed and made unfertile. I turned to the shaman. Why didn't you deal with this thing yourself? You possess a connection to the green, both you and your nephew. Had you worked together, killing it or at the very least driving it away would have been possible. He shook his head and sighed. It is not as simple as that. The creature hides itself in a cave, a kilometer away from the village and the further we are from the shrine of he who illuminates the garden, the more that connection is diluted. We are not true champions, just guardians tasked with safeguarding the shrine. Not to mention, there were only five of us, two after the chief decided to trust that man. I rubbed my forehead, getting a little more context of what was happening. Guy Lisbon, that name sounded familiar. One last question, how was he able to convince the chief? I inquired. Explosives that he and his team carried for dig sites excavation. The idea was to plant the explosions near the lair of the demon and then press on the trigger. So the chief, eager to end this threat once and for all, mobilized our warriors in one all-out attack. He trailed off. It didn't work. I finished his sentence. Now it suddenly made sense why everyone was so hostile. He gave a curt nod. None of them came back. Masley, was heartbroken and as the chief's son and a prodigy in his own right, he seeks revenge by all means. The only reasons he hasn't mobilized the younger warriors is because he is waiting on me to complete communing with the ancestors for a way forward. And that way, is you. My mouth opened in shock. Me? How? Mku. Mku. A voice interrupted us. We looked towards the source and saw an old man running as quick as he could towards us. He stumbled while near and I rushed to catch him before he could face plant on the ground. Swahili was exchanged between the shaman and the old man. 
the shaman cursed and spit to the ground in anger. Hey what happened, what's going on? I asked him in urgency. The shaman tightened his hands into fists and spat out in anger. Seems like my dear nephew's patience has ran out. Half an hour ago, he took the rest of the warriors to confront the demon on their own. I ran a hand through my hair. Oh fuck. They're gonna get slaughtered. My body rose up, a breeze ruffling through my coat. What's the general direction to the cave? The shaman looked at me in the eyes and for a second I thought he was going to stop me. Fortunately he only nodded and pointed due east. I'll bring them back, I promised. It's time to finish this. Chapter 85 The Hunt Pa The holographic projector came on with a hum of energy, displaying a map of the African continent that was magnified to focus on East Africa in particular. Captain Atom pointed to a red blinking icon near the border of Kenya and Ethiopia. This is known as the Valley of Ghosts. A 20 square mile stretch of jungle. The locals avoid it and any settlement near the valley is at least half a mile away from the edge of the forest. The team's overseer paused to see if they were listening and continued with a nod. A picture of an attractive blonde man with grey eyes and scruffy beard appeared beside the map. Hey, I know that guy. His book was on the recommendation list for a history project I had back in school. He's a world-renowned archaeologist. An expert on ancient Egyptian customs and relics. Artemis explained. He also helped Batman on a case involving Maxi's use, so we can add a deep understanding of the Greek mythology as well. Robin added. His eyes widened right after his statement and he leveled a questioning glance at Captain Atom. Which means this mission must have come straight from Batman. He connected the dots. This brought about surprise as the rest of the team looked confused. Everyone except Aquilad. Wait, I thought the Dark Knight resigned from the League? Miss Martian wondered out loud. I didn't buy it for a single second. Batman pretty much runs the whole thing. Connor commented while crossing his hands. It was to my understanding that although Batman resigned, the League decided to keep him on as a close associate. He's not involved with any of the decision-making or entitled to a seat at the table but has taken on a new role as a consultant. Aquilad explained to the rest. It wasn't surprising that he knew of this but some of the team members were slightly turned off that he kept the information to himself. Robin spared Aquilad a brief glare. Come on guys, Superboy is right. There is no way Batman would leave the Justice League. Kid Flash raised his voice. The Dark Knight is all about contingencies upon contingencies, safeguarding the Earth from any threat, external or dot internal. Captain Atom narrowed his eyes slightly at the speedster. The Justice League is made up of practically gods. There are only two leaguers without powers in the League. One now that Batman has left the League, he would never break ties with the League because someone needs to monitor them, to make sure that they use their powers for good. Batman was that check. Silence dominated the room. A thin trail of sweat fell down Robin's back as the implications hit him like a speeding truck. The rest were also all speechless, save for Kid Flash who had no idea the impact his words had. What dot why is everyone so quiet all of a sudden? Captain Atom cleared his throat and decided to prioritize the mission first. The insinuation of Batman having a countermeasure for each and every member of the League was a cause for concern but Atom could understand Batman's intentions. This would be addressed later. Moving on. Guy Lisbon is as some of you seem to know, a famous archaeologist and a league associate who was last spotted with his team right here. A little center called Njoya. Saying that, Captain Atom pointed to a small marketplace a few miles away from the Valley of Ghosts, and he was heading towards the valley on one of his expeditions when all contact was lost with him and his team. The mission is simple. Get in, do a search and rescue. Upon finding him and his team, extract them and make it back to the watchtower. Are we clear? Atom's words were clipped and firm with soldier-like efficiency. Yes, sir. Aquilid stepped forward and nodded. One more thing. I don't need to remind you to stay in stealth mode. The Kenyan government or even Ethiopia cannot know of your presence there. Atom gave another order and Aquilid nodded. Okay team. Let's move out. Aiden's POV. I frowned as my body shot through the sky. I knew the general direction to take but even after flying for a few seconds I couldn't spot anything that stood out. The layout of the valley was strangely similar in all directions, two hills that were concealed by the mist and the darkness, providing no discernible features I could reference and the jungle itself was thick. I couldn't see the floor of the forest. I stopped in midair. This wasn't going to work. Looking back, my frown gave way to confusion. I couldn't even spot the village back the way I came. Okay, something is definitely up. I closed my eyes and spread out my senses. 
There was a slight hum in the air. A hum that was meant to confuse someone's senses. Perhaps a security measure by the tree that was in the shrine of he who illuminates the garden? Makes sense I suppose. This meant I couldn't trust my usual senses. Ah, jokes on you. Security mechanism thingy. Telepathy for the win. I had used my budding telepathic sense to find Miss Martian's hiding place during the absolutely cakewalk of a fight that was me versus them. I didn't see why I couldn't use it now to find Masley and the others. I doubt whatever was actively messing with my senses could account for mind power. I cleared my throat and locked my inner weeb back in his cage. To concentrate better, I sat cross-legged in mid-air. The position was one I was most familiar with and made me relax, without wasting more time. I flicked my switch on my mental awareness radar and tried to stretch it out as far as I could. Sweat started falling down my forehead after a minute, as I strained this power more than I ever had before. Unfortunately, nothing registered in my telepathy. The range was too small. About 70 meters or so. I massaged my forehead knowing that each time I spent trying to find their warriors was more time Masley's stupid impulsive actions got more of them killed. I had to change tactics. What if dot an idea came to me? I didn't know if it would work or not but here we go. Instead of stretching my range out, I sent a pulse out. A sperm whale can locate prey up to 500 meters away. I used that same principle but applied it to my telepathy. A wave of shnick energy escaped my mind, spreading out across the whole space. Through this, my range was expanded exponentially because I wasn't struggling to maintain the pulse, just to read whatever it bounced off of. I grinned. Gotcha. A little over 300 meters away to my right, over 20 mines registered in my telepathy. I changed course and shot off like a rocket. My brows scrunched up a little because before I had completely cut off my telepathic pulse sense, I caught the flavor of a few familiar mines. It was probably nothing. Maybe my inexperience with the skill. Just to be sure though, I sent another pulse out. Nothing unusual registered in my senses so I increased my speed towards Masley. General POV. Guys. Aiden's here. Miss Martian informed the others. The atmosphere in the ship suddenly changed. A sharp intake of breath from Artemis, Kid Flash narrowing his eyes and Superboy tightening his fingers into fists. Should we call it in? Artemis asked already knowing what the answer would be. Everybody looked towards Aquilid. There was a brief silence from the team leader. Aquilid closed his eyes and thought it through. Aiden's presence here showed that this mission had changed from a simple search to something else. Who could he be working for? Time and time again, Aquilid saw what being a leader actually was. While it was a noble position to have the team's trust placed on him, he couldn't help but see it as a burden. Protocol dictates they were supposed to report it but dot this is what they had been waiting for. A chance to bring him back. In cuffs or not didn't matter. No. We continue the mission. A few adjustments are to be made however. Miss Martian and Artemis, you are to stay in the bio ship. Do a scan of the whole valley and see if you can spot our target or any of his people. You will also be our eyes in the sky. The rest, we will be confronting our wayward teammate. There's a high chance that Lisbon might be who Aiden's after, or at the very least have information on his disappearance. Artemis looked ready to argue but instead settled for a curt nod. She would only be a liability. Superboy on the other hand was feeling the opposite. He was ready to prove once and for all that he wasn't weak. He patted the noticeable bulge in his pants pocket, a gift from his dot other father. He had wanted to report it to Superman, to take the patches that suppressed his human DNA to grant him his full Kryptonian abilities to him and confess. What stopped him was the humiliation from before. He could remember getting swatted off the sky like an insignificant fly by Aiden. His super strength made useless upon clashing with the other boy and finding him more than a match for Connor's Kryptonian strength and durability. Aiden had been playing with him during their sparring matches. Superboy had even gone as far as to review some of their sparring matches footage and what he saw made him even more sure that Aiden had been hiding his true power. Maelstrom would barely be breathing hard while Connor would be on his last legs. The matches with Robin, Artemis and Black Canary revealed more of Aiden's hidden depths. He took to every match with a clinical and surgical approach. A glint on his eyes that shows you, even if you put him down now don't expect the same thing to work next time. So Connor had come to the conclusion that there was no way he could beat Aiden in pure skill. The guy was a monster in versatility. Instead, Connor decided to do so by overwhelming power. The DNA patches were staying with him. Just until they brought Aiden back, he promised himself. Chapter 86, The Hunt Part 2 I get it. People are dumb sometimes. People are more often than not impulsive when caught in a sticky situation. 
That all makes sense. What doesn't make sense is when you insist on being stubborn despite knowing you're in the wrong. I flew down and touched down on a tree branch, looking down at Masley and close to 30 teens, the exact number being 28. The group had arrived very close to the cave. They were hiding in a thicket while looking up at the rocky path leading up to the cave which was only a few hundred meters away. Not too close and not too far out of earshot. Despite it being at night time, bones belonging to animals and humans were scattered about, along with patches of dried blood going up the path. I closed my eyes and said a little prayer to the ones who had lost their lives here. Then I refocused on the stupid entitled fool about to risk the lives of his friends for petty revenge. Revenge is not dot bad but you only take vengeance when you know you have the power to see it through. Now back to my earlier point. Masley was staring down at one of the older teens, who seemed to be his second in command. I didn't understand what they were saying but from the older boy's body language and expressions, it was clear he was hesitant about confronting Nimoth in his lair. Smart. Unfortunately, Masley was too blinded by rage and revenge that he couldn't see how bad his idea was. For now, I decided to stay hidden while keeping a lookout on the cave. If Masley chose to listen to common sense and turn back, all the better. I could then go inside the cave, murder the shit out of Nimoth and then be out of here. General POV. They were elites, sons of the garden. In their veins flowed the blood of their brave ancestors who had never given up or failed in their sacred duty. It didn't matter that they were young. It didn't matter that they were inexperienced. All that mattered was survival and dot revenge. Most of them gathered had lost family to this demon. All the premier warriors. The strongest the village had to offer dot dead. They might have been lacking in strength but their hearts burned true. The flames of their spirits was inextinguishable. A raging inferno. At least that had been the case before they had arrived. The instant the group had made it within vicinity of the cave dot all their courage had disappeared. The bones littered around and splotches of blood were just the tip of the iceberg. Nothing to the feeling the ground gave off. An air of despair, pain and bloodthirst. Their eyes had widened and many had taken a step back, shivering in absolute terror. One of the warriors standing next to Masley, a tall stalwart young man tightened his hand on his weapon. He turned and addressed their leader. Tuna pass wak yuguka terudi, hayalikawa was ombaya, we should turn and go back, this was a bad idea. Masley turned and glared at the person who had made the suggestion. His second in command. He also looked behind him and noticed that almost everyone was of the same stance. Masley could feel it too. The knowledge that they were standing so close to death. Of course he knew the idea was bad. They should have waited for his uncle to finish communing with the ancestors before moving out. Yet something had forced him to throw caution to the wind. Something he couldn't explain. All he knew was that he couldn't turn back. Turning back meant giving up after everything. Giving up on his father. Shaming his memory by not avenging him. Ancestors be with me. Masley turned to the others with cold eyes. We are not retreating. That is an order. He informed them in their native language. The faces of some of the boys became ashen. I dot I dot don't want to die. One of the younger boys whimpered, letting his weapon fall down. He took a step back, fear coating his visage. Masley's face contorted in a rictus of anger. You coward. What do you think you're doing? You shame our forefathers by letting go of your weapon. He matched towards the kid and slapped him. The young boy fell down in a heap and curled on himself. Nton Guy, Masley's second in command became angry and pulled back their leader from further hurting the boy. The son of the chieftain rounded up on the second in command in disbelief. In subordination? You too. Ntongai heedless of Masli's anger came between him and the boy, the other warriors also walked behind him. Looking around, Masli was shocked to find himself all alone. With all due respect, that's not how you treat a comrade, Masli. We have always followed your lead, hunting, training and carrying our duties. And you have never been this cruel. All of us lost our loved ones, just like you. So why, instead of compassion and understanding you treat us as mere subordinates? Are you that eager to lead us to our deaths? With each word that fell, Masley felt as if explosions were going off inside his brain. All this time Dot they were right. Why was he doing this? He loved his further but that did not justify leading his compatriots to the battle with a half-baked plan. Doubts started appearing on his face. I, Don apostrophe T dot I. His voice seized up as a voice sounded in his brain. Now now, my young puppet. It's not time for you to start rebelling yet. I still need the distraction. Plus dot my pet needs a meal. Ha 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 ha. 
a dark and sinister voice told him telepathically, laughing in glee at what was about to happen. A haze appeared on Masley's face. He looked up and stared at the faces of his men impassively. He raised his hand slowly and pointed the palm towards them. Anton Guy, seeing the look on Masley's face had a bad feeling. Oh ancestors! Everybody get back! He shouted as the ground started rumbling. Traitors! Masley said and clenched a fist. Blackened vines exploded out of the ground, aimed to skewer everybody present. Ntongai couldn't believe it. His friend, brother, all but in blood. Masley. Was his last thought, knowing he couldn't hope to escape this. Slink. The sharp whistle of a blade cutting through the air was heard. A few seconds later, all the vines aimed to constrict or skewer through the others were promptly cut apart. A breeze blew out. A red and yellow blur moved through the ground, carrying away the warriors out of Masley's range. The son of the chieftain looked on in anger as someone interrupted him. Who dares? He shouted to the forest. A familiar figure stepped out from the edge of the forest and stood before him, tall and imposing. Masley's eyes widened and he stepped back. You? Yes, me. And if you know what's good for you, you will surrender or better yet don't. I have a lot of rage piling up and I need a way to unleash it. The figure said. Aiden's POV. My mind was buzzing with anger. That red and yellow blur dot kid flash. The teen team were here. I felt it out with my air sense and located them hiding in the jungle, waiting and watching as I approached Masley. Some of them shivering in nervous energy, only one of them a true threat. Connor was registering as strong in my nascent energy sense. Strange. I could feel the fluctuations of telepathic communications going on among the three of them. Going by what I knew of Aqualad's strategy, the three were probably him. Superboy and Kid Flash. Robin was inching towards the cave on my left side, trying to move while undetected. Miss Martian and Artemis were most likely on the bio ship, providing air support. Par the course with Aquilid's uninspired and cliche tactics. Well, if it ain't broken. Superboy, wait. I heard the order through the vibrations in the air. Of course, Connor wanted to jump in, like he always does. Did they follow me here? The nerve, and not to mention the stupidity. I inhaled a shuddering breath calming myself down. I had a mission I needed to carry out first. Once I was down beating the stupidity out of Masley, I would confront them. And this time. They better hope to God they don't attack me first. I am out of mercies to give. I spread out my telepathic awareness, making myself a beacon of shinic energy in a way that any two-bit telepath like me or a prodigy like Miss Martian could locate the transmission. After a few seconds, I felt a link established between us. No one said anything for a few seconds then. Stay the fuck out of my way Aquilid. This time I'll make sure the least injury you and your team gets will land you in the infirmary for a month. After giving the warning, I cut off the transmission and turned my attention back to the chief's son. Masley looked angry at my words. I narrowed my eyes when he started huffing. Sweat dripped down his forehead and his eyes looked unfocused. His hands shook as well. I spared a look at the blackened vines I had cut through with my long knives and air bending. The vines were seeping with corruption and taint. Something was up. You foreigners bring nothing but trouble. My father couldn't see you outsiders for what you actually are. A threat that needs to be dealt with with extreme prejudice. I raised my eyebrow. He could now talk in English. Communicating with him earlier had been a problem. That's unexpected. Then again, he could have learnt it from his uncle. Yet, all these inconsistencies added up to paint a worrisome picture. Nemoth was a demon, and demons possess people. Could that be the case? I needed to get up close to find out. I hid the hand holding the long knife behind my back and sighed. I get it. You're angry, frustrated and you want to revenge on whatever killed your father. But this is not the way to go. I stalled, walking closer. I could have easily used a number of techniques to take him down but I wanted to know if my suspicions were correct. Getting close to him, an overpowering stench of sulfur pervaded the air. I scrunched up my nose. Dark colored veins covered his hands and a glowing yellow light flashed in his eyes. Fuck. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Masley shouted. I have heard enough. From you. From my uncle. From everybody. No one tells me what to do. And with that final shout dot the ground started trembling. I looked at the mouth of the cave. Stones started falling apart and rolling down the hill. Something was coming. My attention was briefly removed from the self-entitled arrogant young master before me, to see what this new threat was. My eyes widened. Whoa dot this just went from comic book world to full on white walker and wits bullshit, I call foul. My blades ignited with fire, 
from the mouth of the cave, dead animals and dot humans dressed the same as Masli and his warrior group came out dot and trust me, they were very much dead. Their eyes were unfocused and even from there the smell of rot was overpowering. The misshapen forms of zombies stumbled aimlessly around. An animalistic roar sounded from behind them. The zombies instantly went on focus. Their heads turned towards us. Then with a rush, stampede that reminded me of World War Z they ran down the hill en masse. Holy shit. Kid Flash commented. Him, Aquilid and Superboy had come out of hiding. They kept a respectable distance between us. Smart. Despite the circumstances I didn't know if I could keep myself from punching Kid Flash's lights out. Well, now I understand why the mission was rated as hard. Chapter 87 The Hunt Final Part Zombies a staple in most fantasy fiction worlds. A reality in this very real and tangible world I was standing on. 300 meters was nothing to these creatures that were bearing down on us with the speed of Usain Bolt and the force of a bulldozer. I gave us 10 seconds at the most. Masley snarled and jumped at me in an animalistic rage. Blackened vines rose up from the ground to spit through me. I pulled on the heat inside me and exuded the flames from my skin, taking great care not to burn my clothes. The air near me started burning a pale blue. The black vines were reduced to ash a meter away from my body, leaving behind a nauseating stench. Masley or whatever the thing inside him was, s. Growled in rage and fear. My hand stretched out to grab him by the neck, then I slammed him onto the ground with considerable strength. He instantly lost consciousness. I could feel the judgmental eyes of my former team, glaring at me. When I reached into my trench coat pocket, I felt Aquilid hold back Kid Flash through my essence. I snorted, withdrawing a bottle with holy water. Blessed by the priest back in LA it seems like Kid forgot about his beating, I mused. Should I remind him? Yeah. I think I should. Soon. I opened the bottle of holy water and sprinkled some on Masley's face. His body started thrashing about. His mouth opened and flying beetles escaped it, trying to fly to the mouth of the cave. A flame appeared in my palm. I swiped my hand towards the sky with a grunt. The bugs were fried by the fire and fell to the ground, smoking. The loud roar of anger and pain following the action made the zombies running towards us stop momentarily. Good to see my flames can hurt it. What the fuck was that? Kid Flash wondered loudly. I found it super easy, barely an inconvenience to ignore him. On the other hand, the zombies slash ghouls renewed their mad rush towards us. This time in an even bigger frenzy, pulling closer and closer to my position. The only thing that slowed them down, being the boulders and the rocky terrain of the hillside. Already, many of the creatures had fallen and gotten taken out of the fight by the violent stampede. Leaving us with dot 200 or so? Damn. That is still a freakishly huge number. Aiden. We need to work together. Aquilid shouted at me. They had backed away slowly towards the edge of the trees. What? Aquilid you can't be serious. This is the same guy. Shut up kid. Now's not the time. Superboy growled out. He then turned towards me. You can't take all of them on by yourself and you know it. He told me. I spared a look at the Kryptonian clone and snorted. Watch me. Saying that, I stepped over Masley's unconscious body and walked out of the thicket, closer to the edge of the foot of the hill. I settled into a firebending stance fluidly. Firebending is about breath control, I reminded myself. Aiden, fall back, you'll die. Aquilid's words made me want to vomit. Where was this concern when they were calling me out back at the cave? I ignored them, using the anger to stoke the flame resting above my groin. He has a death wish. Kid Flash said while running back. My eyes hardened. Maybe I do. But what I do know is that a firebender never gives in. My fire would keep burning so long as my spirit did and spirit was something I had a lot of. I breathed in and felt the way the air filled my lungs and then imagined it interacting with the hot flames in my navel. Felt the way the air coaxed the flames out. My own body movements, helping to plot a course for the fire to dance, to move according to what I needed. I stepped forward, leaning my upper body slightly to the front. My hands suddenly spread out to the sides. I bent my legs, bringing the arms to my hips. I felt the fire get compressed inside my chest. A ferocious mass of swirling energy ready to destroy. Fire was life but there cannot be life without death. Therefore fire could be used to deathify anything as well. Ah deathify. Cool word. I might keep on using it. Maybe. I kept a tight hold on the fire and then spun. My hands both shot off from my hips in a quick motion. Large voluminous flames shot out of my fists. Unyielding and roaring like a tiger. 
boom. I timed the explosive beam like destruction wave of super hot flames with my exhalation. The first wave of monsters, the middle portion up until near the back, were fried by the massive yellow funnel of fire. Easily 100 feet long and covering a large surface area. The heat was oppressive. The light coming off of the attack lit up the night sky. I kept it up for one more split second, before my hands seized up in a burning sensation. Smoke covered the surroundings for a few more minutes, obscuring the view. That attack had been no joke. I winced while lowering my hands. My face made a frown at the red cracks covering my knuckles. I was actually dot injured. Not debilitating or anything like that but damn. I thought firebenders couldn't be hurt by their own fire? Then again, I wasn't a regular firebender. My elemental energy reserves were basically bottomless. The problem as I had seen, was my own body. There was a certain limit as to how much I could actually channel. He's grown stronger. Much stronger. I heard Aqualid comment and rose up from my position. The wind obeyed my command and banished all the smoke and dust away from the surroundings. The scene that met us, made me widen my eyes too. A huge groove fanning out from the foot of the hill to the cave at the top had appeared. Red magma from the melted rock had pooled inside the groove and was rapidly cooling. Of the 200 zombies dot only stragglers remained. Probably 30 or 40 zombies. My attack alone had taken out over 150 of them. Hell yeah. I muttered while smiling. A loud roar rang out at that particular time. Leaving my ears ringing and my heart pumping. The fight was far from over. Looks like the boss is ready to reveal himself. The zombies on the outskirts of my attack stopped shambling about. A silence dominated the battlefield, only broken by the silent steps coming out of the cave. I looked on in anticipation. This is where my mission ends. At 17 hours. Not bad. Finally the big bad revealed himself or rather itself. A huge lion, easily the size of an African elephant appeared out of the mouth of the cave. That's one huge ass cat. I call bullshit. I've seen lions on Nat Geo and they don't get as big as that. I didn't even pay Kid Flash any attention. I just dealt with zombies of all things, a huge lion is where he draws the line? Fucking stupid. The lion was glorious and intimidating. We made eye contact through all that distance and I saw the derision in its eyes. This lion was an apex predator and knew it. That means, it wasn't afraid of my fire. Then again, demons come from hell. Hell is, hot obviously. To them it might feel like a cool shower. But my fire still afforded me an advantage over them in comparison to regular fire. For instance, I could burn their true essence. Their true forms when exposed to my flames along with them being on earth would leave the demons turned to crisp. Case in point, the flying beetles that had been possessing Masley. This brought about many questions. How was Nemoth doing this? He was a gluttonous demon. His whole shtick was eat, eat and eat. Yet from what we'd seen he was apparently playing necromancer and beast tamer. Something was up. I tells ya, something stank and it wasn't the sulfur. I bent down and removed my blades from my inner pocket, placing them on a rock. My hand reached inside again and this time, I came out with a bottle of holy water. Firebending would probably do little to that lion's shiny coat. But holy water? I whistled. This thing was gripped tonight to them. I sprinkled the water on the blades and wiped them down, hoping the effect I was trying to apply was a success and that I had two holy daggers in my possession. I twirled them in the air and pointed one towards the lion. I'm coming for you. The lion held my gaze and I got the impression that the fucker saw me more of a hindrance than a threat. It roared again and the zombies sprang up, running towards us once more. The lion turned imperiously and moved back into the cave, its tail swishing in the air. I looked at Aqualid and his team. I'll take on the big bad himself, the lion controlling the rest of the walking dead. You handle the stragglers and make sure you get those boys back to the village. And Aqualid? You better hope we don't meet again. I coldly explained, I saw well hidden fear in Wally's eyes and smirked inwards. That just made my day. This is far from over Aiden. I will beat you. Superboy informed me before I could leave. And just to prove a point, the fucker floated up with red flashing in his eyes. I widened my eyes a little. That explained why he was registering as strong in my senses. He now had access to the rest of Superman's powers. I turned away. Show off and he couldn't even get rid of the horde of zombies that were coming at us earlier. Chapter 88 The Mastermind Part Wait Aqualid was a little too late and before any of them could say anything, Aiden blasted off, two twin flames pushing him to the mouth of the cave at high speed. Neptune's Beard Aqualid cursed, something he never did. Superboy and Kid Flash shared a look but wisely kept silent. 
for all of two seconds before Kid Flash reminded them of the zombies coming at them. So dot any exorcists around? Either that or someone get us Rick Grimes. The speedster said. Aqualid sucked in a deep breath and refocused on the mission. They would deal with Aiden later. First, they had lives to save. He reached out into their shared telepathic link. Miss Martian, I need you to land the bio ship. We need to evacuate these people. You can then use the directions they give you to find a safe place for them. Meanwhile, Kid Flash, Superboy and I will take down as many of these creatures as we can. Lastly Robin, your job is to go after Aiden and the big scary cat that would not look out of place in a Narnia setting, observe while hidden and if possible take them both down, effectively rendering the rest of the zombies useless as they seem to be controlled by the aforementioned Narnia big scary cat. Boy Wonder said all of that in one breath. Good thing, telepathic communication was much more flexible. Aqualid sighed. I was thinking. Observe and provide tactical support to Aiden where you can. We might not like it, but working together is the smart move. Superboy narrowed his eyes from his levitating position. For now. He added quietly, only audible to himself. We will try to finish up quickly and come to your aid. The objective is to not allow any of these creatures to breach the edge of the jungle. Less chance of us missing one. Aqualid finished relaying his orders. Not a problem fearless leader, since they seem to be pretty focused on us. Kid Flash stated while lowering the goggles strapped to his forehead to cover his eyes. A click on the side of the optic device, switched it to night vision. I'll give them something to focus on alright. Ugh. Superboy shouted in anger and shot at an elephant that was stomping its way towards them. Aqualid looked on in suspicion. Yeah Aqualid. I wanted to ask, Kid Flash called out to him in an unusually serious tone. Since when can Superboy fly? Aqualid shook his head. He has not exhibited these abilities before. Perhaps they finally kicked in. He's a Kryptonian after all. They get more powerful the longer they are exposed to the sun. He responded, his water bearers coming out of their holsters behind his back. A pair of hyenas were rushing towards him. Perhaps dot or maybe dot more secrets. Kid Flash responded grimly and sped off. General POV, elsewhere. It's starting. Lucifer said in childish excitement. May spared him a look and rolled her eyes. This is either going to turn out really well or really bad for Aiden. My bet is on the latter. I don't think he's ready. She complained. Oh come on now, love. Have some faith in the boy. I do have faith. But going up against a lord of hell is no joke. You should have sent me to deal with him instead. She responded. And where would the fun in that be? This way we get to see an evolution. The beauty of humanity Mazkeen, lies in that stupid spark of courage that spurs their actions. He told her with an upturn of the corner of his lips. The Lilim shook her head. That's not outstanding or unique at all. Most aliens have that as well. Humanity is simply favored more by him. She disagreed. Lucifer nodded, seeing her point but also slightly disappointed that she was entirely missing the bigger picture. Maze dear, I've always taught you to see past the obvious. Ask yourself, why he favors them. When you have the answer, you'll understand how it's possible for individuals like John Constantine to exist. Lucifer admonished her. Fuck that asshole. May stated upon hearing Constantine's name. The devil chuckled at the hatred she possessed for Hell's vacuum cleaner. He's in another universe entirely Maze. I see your dislike for him is still at an all-time high. He commented. In response the beautiful demoness, simply poured herself a drink and downed it. Well, he's the reason I'm glad humans are not immortal or possess long lifespans. I have a grudge with that bastard. She went silent before placing down the glass in her hand on the table. Wait. Maze addressed Lucifer, as realization dawned on her face. That's why you're doing this. Why you want the boy to get involved in the supernatural. This world lacks the experts. Well... Apart from the Lord of Order and the stage magician, Zatara but he is not a true demonologist or a hunter. In a way you're shaping him up to take on that role. She paused in surprise and confusion. For the first time in a while, Maze couldn't get a read on what Lucifer was planning. The proud smile on his face told her that he was happy she'd finally connected the dots. But if anything, Maze felt even more lost. One question remained. Let's cut the crap. Why? It's not like you to be so interested in one human. You said you wanted to take a vacation but everything you've done so far has been contrary to that. She didn't flinch from his gaze. Lucifer hummed and ran a finger along the length of the mouth of the glass he was holding. That spark, I want to see it again. 
that which I desired but was denied, I want to see it bloom to its full potential, I asked you a question earlier, why he favors them, he looked at Maze seriously, you'll have your answer soon, love, this will be a true test of metal for Aiden, we will see his real self in the adversity that follows, especially considering the fact that he won't be able to rely on his other half, Lucifer said while grinning sinisterly, Maze narrowed her eyes, what did you do, she asked him, the devil simply shrugged with an innocent look on his face. Me? I have no hand in that, love. The innocent look was replaced with a manic smile that stretched out on his handsome face. It wasn't a lie, but more like withholding information. The only thing I can say is dot strap in, this is going to be one heck of a ride. The clip displaying what was happening on the battlefield, showed the teen team fighting to take down the zombies, then the feed changed to show a man dressed in an adventurer's attire, walk up towards the village guarding a hub of the green. A shield of vines and green energy appeared between them. With a swipe of his hand, the vines were destroyed by blackened flames. Aiden's POV. I shot off straight towards the mouth of the cave, heedless of the creatures on the sides of my self-made cavern. The rocks were cooling down more and more, leaving behind blackened soil. I spared a look at the zombies and ignored them. Those were cannon fodder that Aqualid and the rest could handle. I was going after the final boss, within seconds, I arrived at the entrance and spread out my air sense. It wouldn't do to be ambushed by a five-ton lion because I was too careless. I twirled the daggers in my hands and lit them up. Flames appeared along the edges of both weapons, lighting up my surroundings. I didn't need the light to see because my vision was strong enough, so this was more to draw out the huge creature. I would sense it before it could attack and then retaliate when Nemoth least expected it. My feet crunched on bones, like dried twigs. My nose scrunched up in disgust at the rotten stench present in the cave. It was to the point where I started cursing my enhanced sense of smell. There was nothing I could do other than quickly killing Nimoth and leaving this place. I walked in while taking great measures to read anything registering in my senses. Twenty meters in, I felt a movement come from my back. A miniature figure that shot a zip line to the ceiling of the cave and stuck to the sides of the walls. Robin. Typical. A few more seconds of carefully traversing the smelly and dark cave, I started hearing the drip of water. Looking at the walls of the cave, I could tell they were also starting to get slightly wet. The tunnel then enlarged the deeper I walked in until, I finally found myself staring at an open space inside the cave structure, the size of a soccer stadium. In the far back was an underground river, the water looked murky and disgusting even from the huge distance away. And lastly laying down on the barren and rocky ground was my target the final boss himself. The big cat looked at home. It lazily observed me. A menacing look on its face. A mark showing a pentagram was branded into its forehead, sharp claws gleamed from its paws and a low growl informed me of what it thought of me. An annoying pest. Let's change that shall we? I jumped off the cave opening and landed before Namoth. The instance I did, an overbearing might shook my bones and I took a knee from the aura it was exuding. The lion rose up and started walking towards me. Its steps were heavy and frightening. I struggled to move, aware of the death sentence walking towards me. Each second was agonizing. I looked up at it with a scared look on my face and the glee in its own eyes was magnified. It loved this, this feeling of domination and oppression. Drool escaped its mouth and the smell of sulfur made me feel as if I was going to pass out. A meter away from the huge behemoth, I felt the whistling sound of bird orangs and watched as the lion jumped back in a swift move despite its huge size. The bird orangs it had dodged dug themselves on the floor of the cave and exploded, showering me with pieces of stones that bounced off my air shield. I sighed and got up without a problem, shrugging off the intimidating aura of the lion with ease. I looked over my shoulder in anger. Why did you interfere Robin? Boy Wonder landed behind me and looked smug. I think you meant thanks. I chuckled without humor. Thanks? Thanks for what? For ruining my plan? I was pretending to be weak so that I wouldn't have to waste any more time dispatching this thing. I have a feeling that someone else is behind this whole scheme but now because of you, I'll have to fight the damn lion, giving the mastermind more time to do carry out what he's planning. Robin gave me an impassive look. A stubborn glare worthy of his mentor. Deep in his eyes however, I could tell he was embarrassed. A loud roar brought my attention back to my opponent. I sighed, brandishing my flaming weapons. Okay now that the easy way is out, let's do this the fun way. I smiled a bloodthirsty smirk. Chapter 89, The Mastermind Final Part The lion roared once more, this time in rage. 
I spared a look at Boy Wonder. Get to cover and don't intervene. Surprisingly, he didn't try to argue back and not unlike Batman he disappeared into the shadows of the cave. I heard his signature laugh echo through the cavern and rolled my eyes. Well, it's just you and me, kitty cat. I promise you, I'll try to make this quick. The taunt worked and the lion jumped at me, claws and teeth aimed to eviscerate me into meat ribbons. That was if its weight didn't crush me instead. I rolled under it and sprung up to a handstand. I spun my legs around, creating a scythe of flames that arched towards the lion. The beast in that same astonishing agility it had previously displayed, turned around and roared. The huge blast of sound sent an airwave that put out my flames. I brought the winds to my control and created two massive tornadoes that almost reached the ceiling of the cave. The whirlwinds boxed in the lion, briefly hiding me from its sight. I jumped up to the sky, falling towards it, both daggers held above my head. The lion roared pushing away my tornadoes through sheer sound shockwaves but not unraveling them. It looked up too late just as I was bearing down upon it. Flames sprang up along the knives, leaving behind a flash as I brought them swinging down. I smiled when I felt them connect with the lion's forehead. Then they cut through the creature's skull like a hot knife through butter. That was too easy, I frowned. My feet landed on the ground, cracking the cave's floor with a dull thud. At the same time, the lion dissolved into thousands of beetles made of shadows and pulled away to condense into its former body. The lion shook its head. Two twin scars ran down from its eyes to the mouth. Black blood dripped down the injuries caused by my knives. The look in its eyes was disbelief warring with animalistic rage. Human. A deep voice rumbled from the lion's mouth. The voice shook the cave due to how deep and menacing it was. I stayed cautious. This could be a ploy to attack me by making me lose focus and awareness of my surroundings. You are dot not like the rest. Not like the other meat bags. Saying that, it started walking around me slowly. And those knives dot they are special. They hurt me. Nothing can hurt me except dot holy power. Interesting. I promised myself to get the priest something once I was done with the mission. I propose we come to an dot agreement, turn around and leave and in return, I'll give you endless power and riches beyond your wildest dreams. It said, I listened intently while nodding along. A few seconds passed after its statement and I looked at the creature in disappointment. That's it? That's all you got? Unlimited power and wealth? I scratched my head feeling a bit weirded out by the whole situation. Dude. You can't give me something you don't have. It growled menacingly. Heedless to its mounting anger I pushed on. I mean, you live in a dark cave in the middle of nowhere. That doesn't exactly scream riches beyond my wildest dreams. Man dot I expected more from you. Aren't demons supposed to be masters at temptation? Nemoth couldn't handle it anymore and roared. I fell into a stance, ready for his next attack. This time something was different. The feeling it gave off was menacing. The demon was going all out. You will suffer for that insult, lowly human. A surge of shadows ran along the length of the whole cave covering everything and plunging us into darkness. I used my air sense to locate Boy Wonder and pushed him out into the open mouth of the cave, away from the darkness encroaching closer. The last thing I saw dimly was Robin's iconic rainbow costume before the world grew dark. I heard skittering from all around me. The whole space was a mass of beetles and bugs heading towards me from all directions. Feast your eyes upon my true demonic form and feel despair. You will die human. Eat until nothing of your existence remains on this plane. And then I will harvest your soul and torture it for eternity. Nemoth's voice rang out from everywhere. It was distorted and would have made anyone else shit their pants. Unfortunately for him, I have stood in the presence of Lucifer himself, someone who could unravel all that I was. In comparison, Nemoth's aura was. Me at best. I reached into my trench coat and brought out the bottle of holy water from the inner pocket. I held it up and flicked a light on top of my index finger. A quarter of it remained on the small bottle. I mentally sighed. Should have gotten a bigger container but oh well, hindsight is twenty twenty. Give up boy. You have no hope of getting out of this alive. I, Nemoth a demon lord of hell will devour you completely. My opponent said. I snorted. Demon lord? Oh please, spare me the bullshit. Let's see just how deserving you are of that title. I poured the holy water onto the palm of my hand, careful not to let any of it drip down. Now, the reason the holy water had such an adverse effect on demons was because of the touch of divine holy power contained in it, the essence of purity that dealt corrosion on the demons. My idea was to either burn away the water completely, 
separating it from the essence of holiness and then supercharge that energy with my own fire, which was aligned with the attribute of order. Or simply mix them and hope the divine essence was potent enough to not get too diluted when spread out across the massive attack I was planning. It was an idea that had no science backing it. But if it worked, I would take down Nemoth once and for all by targeting his full mass, without sparing anything. I didn't have any other way and I couldn't keep on slashing him apart with the daggers because he would simply dissolve into his true form and slip away. Damn, I wanted the cool dagger fight scene. A blaze appeared in my hands. As if sensing the danger about to befall him, the whole mass of bags slammed onto me, only to bounce back upon colliding with an air force shield that I kept around my body. Sparks of blue electric energy appeared on my palm as I burned away the water. It tried to recombine itself from the fusion of hydrogen and oxygen but my flames burned hot enough to halt that process. I was careful. Trying to get a feel for the holy essence in the water with my nascent energy sense. And fortunately I could feel something. Something just out of reach. Stop. You have no idea what you're doing. You'll call down his wrath. You fool. Nemoth's voice changed to a terrified squeak and tried to get away from me. I absent-mindedly constructed another barrier inside the cave that covered any spots the demon could escape through and then compressed it. The demon's full mass was now tightly held together in a massive ball of air and I was in the middle of it. The core. He started pleading but I was too entranced by something. My eyes glowed as I looked at the pinprick of light floating on my palm. It was the size of a grain of rice and was shining the purest golden light I had ever seen. This dot this was more than I bargained for dot it would be wrong to use as a simple attack. But I don't have a choice, I wished I had another choice. As it was, my flames alone could not hope to defeat Nimoth at his full power. Maybe if it was sections or pieces of him like when I burned the beetles that were controlling Masley, but in his full form dot he was used to fire from hell. Fuck it. I crossed my palm on the small light and then breathed in. My fire poured into my palm and coaxed the light to grow, to combine with my flame and bring divine retribution against this creature of darkness. I tried to mentally keep up with that line of thinking, and crazily enough it worked. I opened my palm and a white, beautiful and lazily burning flame appeared. Despite being so diluted, Nemoth's screech of pain reached me as the nearest beetles were burned to nothing just from exposure to the white flame's light. I raised up a hand to the sky. The flame started rotating into the form of a ball of energy before exploding out into a voluminous tornado that covered my form. I brought my hands together. My right palm meeting my left fist and the flame grew larger. The air bubble on the outside pressed Nemoth's full mass into the flames and the demon's cries of mercies were drowned out. Having been completely destroyed by my attack in one simple move. Holy cow. When the flames ended partly because it was getting too much for me too despite the fact that I had covered myself in the strongest layers of protection I could, I was surprised at what met me, most of the cave had melted into lava. Steam and ash covered the whole place. The steam of course, from the water that had evaporated. I looked around in shock, damn, those holy flames had not been a joke, hotter than anything I had ever felt before. My trench coat was also smoking slightly. A prompt appeared at the top of my vision but I waved it away with a curious glint in my eyes. Due to the cave half melting down, it had revealed something. A red blinking light deeper inside it, near the mouth of the underground river. I waved the ash and steam away, flying over to inspect what this new thing was. Getting over there, I was surprised to find a dot pod of some sort. A machine built similar to a beetle. Was it a coincidence? Maybe. I touched the metal expecting it to be hot to the touch but was surprised when it felt cool instead. My touch elicited a response from the clearly alien technology before him. A blue scanning light ran over me from head to toe and synthetic voice said. Carbon-based life form detected. Hello? The red light from before changed to a light green one. It could talk, meaning I was not dealing with bar simple machine at all. I looked around, carefully. No trace of Nimoth or any other demon remained. Maybe this thing was unrelated to my mission. Hi. Welcome to Dot Earth I guess. My name is Aiden. What should I call you? The answer came in quickly. I am designated as minor number row 234. Pleasure to meet you, Aiden. The prompts at the edge of my vision were getting more urgent. That and I could feel the team making its way towards me. We will have to cut this meeting short minor. How about I lead you to somewhere else you can safely run diagnostic tests and recuperate. As you can see, this place is a battlefield. I offered, hoping it wouldn't say no. Very well. The miner said and rose up, levitating in the air. A boom tube appeared and it flew through. 
the boom tube had led it to an island far away from sanctuary in the elemental dimension. I breathed out a sigh of relief at how smoothly that had gone. Minor was an unexpected find and I had a feeling, a very significant one. Back to more important matters, I enlarged the display box and was immediately hit by an urgent notification. I swept the rest of the notifications away and was left with a blinking text. Oh crap. This shit just went from a generous 30 to a 100 real quick. I commented, hurrying out of the cave. Why? I had less than 5 minutes to stop the end of the world. Urgent mission. The demon mammon wants to use the access node of the green and the souls of over a hundred humans to infect the world with a virus designed to turn the world into a hellish wasteland and the humans and creatures into demons subservient to him and him alone. Mission objectives. Stop him at all costs. Save Swamp Thing, Becca Dollar Colon Semicolon and TH underscore hash NFJ HDD Chat Olafo and underscore hash the green. Mission time limit, 5 minutes. Mission difficulty, hellish. Chapter 90, Saving the World Ain't Easy Part 1. The bio ship rose up under Miss Martian's control. Some flying birds, chief among them being huge white-backed vultures tried to harass the Martian aircraft only for two twin beams of red heat to spit through the flocks, making short work of the birds, courtesy of the Superboy. Miss Martian was confused for a second at how Connor seemed capable of heat vision. She shared a look with Artemis who shrugged. The Martian superhero decided to focus on her task and instead sent happy feelings of gratitude down the link at Superboy. She controlled the bio ship to move towards the village. The directions were conveyed to her by Anton Guy, the second in command of the warriors who was busy watching over the still passed out Masley. Parts of the grotesque creatures rained down from the air. A splatter of blood fell on Kid Flash's face obscuring his vision and making him come to an abrupt stop. Oh come on man, do you really have to go all slasher on them? The blood smelled rotten and a sickly undercooked stench. It made the speedster almost hurl right where he stood. He shook his head and shot off in anger, going through a group of warriors holding broken spears aimed to stab him. Kid Flash left a trail of broken bones. Luckily, Miss Martian had assured them that nothing of their minds remained. The bodies were just meat puppets that were not alive. They weren't possessed either, not like Masley had been. So for Kid Flash it had turned into a zombie hunting season. Fortunately, all of them were respectful enough to leave the bodies intact for a proper funeral. Almost all of them considering Superboy was reenacting an Omni-Man scene from Invincible. Kid Flash looked behind him at the tangled bodies and smiled. There were broken limbs but only to impede their movements. And that's how you do it. Aquila jumped over Kid Flash and kicked a baboon that had taken a leap at Kid Flash from a tree, before it could attack the speedster. He landed with the creature under his feet, destroying its head with his full Atlantean might. Aquilid looked at the blackened sludge of brain matter and blood and felt like vomiting both because of how disgusting it was and his actions. They were heroes, killing was not something they did. However, the circumstances were a bit different so. It's understandable. As long as we don't completely destroy them, we can find out what really caused this, he told himself before turning to Kid Flash. KF, keep your head in the game. We don't know if these things can infect others and I don't want to find out. Aquila told him sternly. Chill out Aquilid, we're winning. In fact, Superman over there is basically dominating the battlefield. The speedster pointed at Superboy who was carving a line among the creatures. He was unstoppable. His flight left shockwaves in the air as he accelerated, raining heat beams and ice breath down. The ground was destroyed, with craters and grooves. Aquilid felt his heart skip a beat at the viciousness with which Superboy was taking out the zombies. A fire sprouted out in the forest due to a stray shot from the Kryptonian and Aquila decided to caution Superboy to be careful right after directing Kid Flash to put it out. They couldn't deal with a forest fire on top of what they had. He reached through the telepathic link. Superboy you're losing control. Be careful of your surroundings. You almost caused a forest fire. The clone didn't respond. Superboy was having the best time of his life. He felt dot he felt powerful. For the first time in ever. He finally felt strong. It came as a surprise for all of them when he cut off the telepathic link, to focus on going all out for the first time. Damn. Did Superboy just hang up on all of us? Kid Flash asked telepathically. Before, Aqualad could give Miss Martian the order to bring the clone back to the link, the ground started rumbling. The noise reached a crescendo just as a figure leapt out of the mouth of the cave. Robin. Aquilid's concerns over the Kryptonian clone were momentarily forgotten as all the creatures in the field froze in place. 
then in unison, a loud screech escaped their mouths and they turned to run towards the cave en masse. Robin would be cornered from all sides. Let's go. Aqualad shouted at Kid Flash who blitzed at his fastest speed towards the mouth of the cave. Bird orangs appeared in Robin's hands as he watched the creatures ran towards the entrance of the cave. After being saved by Eden, he decided to not let any of these things enter and intervene in the other boys' fight. He was the only chance they had at defeating these things. Boy Wonder might have disliked him but he never once doubted his strength. Not to mention dot things had changed. Robin now knew some of the truth concerning their former teammate. It put a lot of things in perspective. I am so not concerted, right now. He commented to himself, looking at the dozens of creatures advancing towards the entrance. Twenty meters away and Robin was about to show them just how much of a badass he was. His hand reached into the utility belt for his special explosive bird orangs. They carried a bigger yield than his normal ones and ironically Robin had had them commissioned to deal with a certain former teammate. Now the team and that person were working together to face a new threat. Just like old times, Boy Wonder thought. Then Superboy swooped in and grabbed him. Robin was speechless for a second. Superboy was flying. That shouldn't be possible. Boy Wonder hadn't been paying that much attention to the link and although he'd heard Wally Wonder the same thing, seeing it for himself was different. Either way, Robin was angry. Why did you do that? He hissed. We need to keep them from breaching the cave. Aiden is fighting that big scary lion. Superboy looked at the teen in his hands and snorted. You're welcome. And don't worry about them. I'll handle these things myself. He responded with a confident smirk. He was now getting used to his additional powers. The heat vision had been particularly interesting for the clone to play around with. But his favorite thing was flying. He could finally fly. He placed Robin near the peak of the hill which evened out into a plateau and flew back to stop the creatures from entering the cave. All this was done in seconds. That's how fast he was in the air. His eyes turned red and heat beams exploded out of his ocular organs. Superboy created a groove in front of the cave. A sort of line that had superheated lava from the melted stones. The zombies fell in and had their bodies destroyed. The temporarily full Kryptonian touched down with pride coloring his eyes. He had done it. None of these creatures could now hope to enter the cave. He looked back at the aforementioned cave and briefly wondered if he should have gone inside to help Hayden fight the lion. Superboy's hands tightened. That thing had looked downright menacing, and powerful. Before he could though, two things happened almost simultaneously. For starters, Aqualad, Kid Flash, and Robin clutched their heads in pain and screamed. A telepathic attack. Someone had bested Miss Martian at her own specialty and as a result of being in the mine link with her. The rest of the team barring Superboy who had cut off the link and Aiden who was not invited to the cool kids club felt as if a spike was being driven through their skulls. Superboy quickly flew towards Aqualad and Wally. Aqualad. Kid Flash. Can you guys hear me? Take a deep breath. Heedless to the clones worried questions, the three of them passed out. Then as if that wasn't enough. All the remaining zombies dropped down onto the ground as if their strings had been cut. Superboy didn't know what was going on, and calling out to Miss Martian or Artemis through the mind link didn't seem to work. He looked at the cave. The only one who could possibly have an answer as to what was going on. was Aiden. But first, Superboy grabbed the speedster along with the Atlantean and flew them towards the hill where he had earlier deposited Robin. At least there they would be safe for the time being. Another rumble this time bigger and with a shock wave of energy that felt dot pure, the cave started spewing out ash and smoke, Superboy narrowed his eyes and activated his x-ray vision, inspecting what was happening inside the cave, his eyes widened a little when he saw a craft of some kind fly through a portal, that was all he saw, a feeling of that familiar weakness that was his reality hit him and he winced, losing attitude and the x-ray vision, the DNA suppressor that looked like shield patches had run out of juice, he landed on the ground just as Aiden speared through the mouth of the cave, urgently flying towards the direction the bioship had taken. Just like that, Superboy knew something was up. The fight was not over. And from the looks of it, something big was going down. His hand went to his side pockets and out with it came the compartment holding the shield patches. He slapped one on his upper arm and the rush of power was almost orgasmic. Superboy glanced at his teammates and wondered if he should bring them with him. No, they might slow me down. Not to mention they're safer here anyway. His body shot off towards Aiden. Chapter 91 Saving the world ain't easy part the steps were light. Not at all hurried or heavy. A blonde man dressed in a green shirt, jeans and boots stopped in front of a shield of green energy, pulsing with power. 
His smile stretched out into an arrogant smirk as his eyes speared through the last-ditch effort at protection the shaman had employed. The elderly shaman was holding his cane tightly as he made eye contact with the stranger. No, not a stranger. The man was none other than the outsider that had arrived in the village a week before. The shaman's eyes widened in unmitigated surprise. You? He asked the man. Guy Lisbon's smile widened some more. Me. He stated, running his eyes along the bubble shield that extended to cover the whole village. Vines crept up along its surface, strengthening it even further. Lisbon sighed. Is this how you treat your guests? To be honest, I am feeling very unwelcomed. The archaeologist said, slowly walking around. The older shaman swallowed his fear and stepped up. I know what you are, a demon from the lowest pits of hell. The shaman spit to the ground in disgust. Touch the shield and you will feel the full wrath of nature strike back. No one dot not even you can survive that. Lisbon raised his hands, pulling back. He laughed uneasily. Trust me old chap, I am not that stupid to not heed your warnings. He sincerely said. His voice took on a sudden change. So why not cut this game of cat and mouse and just pull down the shield? I promise you no harm will come to you and your people. I just need to access the hub real quick and then I'll be out of your hair. MMMH? What do you say? Lisbon offered. The shaman looked behind him. He could see the faces of the gathered villagers staring at him in hope. He was their only source of strength right now. Something he couldn't be. The shaman felt his heart break as he chose duty above family, above clan, above his own blood. Some of the older villagers understood his dilemma and offered him looks of determination. It was a silent confirmation, one that he needed more than they knew. It was then decided. They weren't backing down even if it meant forfeiting their lives. Bite me, the old shaman said testily. Lisbon's eyes widened at being caught off guard by the answer. A laugh escaped his mouth. The archaeologist laughed for a few more seconds before rising up while wiping away tears from the corner of his eyes. Bloody hell, that was very funny, that dot that was something old chap. He straightened up, clearing his throat. Tell me something, you're the anchor holding this shield together, right? The shaman refused to reply. He could only hope that the young warrior would be back to save them all before the demon breached the protective dome. Your silence is answer enough, Lisbon smirked. A bad feeling started blooming inside the shaman's heart. Where are you? He wondered in his head. And so I'm thinking that if I take you down dot then the shield will naturally come down. There are no other guardians of the green among you, Lisbon stated before adding, I made sure of that. The shaman felt his heart break again as the hope he harbored that maybe his brother and nephew were alive got shattered. He forced himself to put on a strong front. You'll pay for that demon. That much I assure you. The shaman bit out in gritted teeth. The demon rolled his eyes. Oh please how many threats do you think I've heard over the millennia? Now where was I? Oh yes. If I were to. Lisbon flicked a hand. The shaman felt a sudden sensation of heat followed by mind-numbing pain assault his chest. He looked down and saw a spearhead sticking out of his chest. He couldn't believe it. What dot what had just happened? He craned his neck behind him and saw the spear that had dealt him a mortal wound, held by one of the villagers, an old friend of his. His eyes dot in fact all of their eyes were unfocused. The green shield shimmered before breaking apart into green motes of light. The shaman couldn't maintain the energy. Without an anchor all the energy fell apart. The shaman lost control of his motor functions and fell to his knees, his hands grasped the spear. Blood escaped his mouth. If he could only remove the weapon dot he could use the green to try and heal himself. There was a chance that it would turn him into something other than human but. Nah. -uh. None of that, now dot just close your eyes and fucking die okay? The soft but sinister voice of the demon sounded, stepping closer to him. You. The shaman wheezed out, giving the demon the most hateful glare he could muster. The demon rolled his eyes. Yes, me. I took control of the minds of your people. None of them are naturally protected from telepathic intrusion by the green like you after all. The demon crouched before him and sighed. I warned you, this was how it would turn out. He patted the injured man on his shoulders, further causing more pain. It was a proof of the old man's resilient life force that he hadn't died yet. Blood was pouring out of his wound like a broken faucet. I feel like giving you something before you die though. Lisbon clapped his hands and jumped to his feet in a dramatic fashion. I know, I'll tell you how I accomplished all of this. He said in excitement before turning back to address the slowly dying man. The shaman knew he had to do something and luckily it looked like the demon was preoccupied. The aged shaman reached into the earth, 
touching the ground with a bloodied hand. He was sending a desperate plea. A plea to the real champion of the green. Please. You see, demons come in many variations. You humans don't really know the difference. Can't blame you, he shrugged, though I'm very insulted that you confused a demon lord of my standing with your run-of-the-mill lilims. His black eyes turned more menacing as a cruel glint appeared on them. The shaman felt a palm land on his shoulder and squeeze. His clavicle cracked and the pain he felt was hellish, though it was nothing compared to the spit through his chest. He groaned and tried to look up, establishing eye contact with his torturer. That's for your earlier disrespect and in case you haven't figured it out. I'm the one keeping you alive. I like keeping things simple. So although you're in my presence, none of that bowing crap. Call me Mammon. A cold shiver run down the aged man's spine. That name. About keeping you alive, I can't have you dying on me before I tell you how I carried out my plans now can I? You see, I need an unbiased opinion. He chuckled waving his hand at the other villagers. And there's a short of it currently. And I know, I know. Monologuing is bad taste. I'm wasting precious time when I could be getting this over with. But this is needed. The shaman could feel himself slipping away only to be jerked back to reality every once in a while by Mammon. He never stopped calling for help. And in one instance, he felt something answer him. Something that felt massive. Something that had the same energy signature as the power running through generations of shamans. Land, strength. A slap pulled him out of his thoughts. Hey, old chap. I can't keep on doing this. Asking you to pay attention. If you drift off again into that little noggin if yours, I'll start killing people. The statement was said in a way that showed he wasn't lying. Mammon straightened up, clearing his throat in the process. So there I was, chilling in my palace down under. Some bloke comes in and says, Lucy's gone. The big bad himself, mate. So everybody's like, time to take over the kingdom now that the king has abandoned his castle. I laughed at their stupidity. The throne of hell has a huge spotlight being shown over it. Everybody's clamoring to have a piece of it but they don't realize just how high profile and dangerous to their health it is. Mammon suddenly went silent while looking off into one direction. Had Aiden been there, he would have felt the telepathic fluctuations coming off the demon in waves. He was an even much stronger telepath than Miss Martian well hello, there. I can't have you interfering so of to dreamland with you bunch. A shockwave blasted out through the mental realm and Miss Martian quickly marshaled all her skills and power to keep her teammates and her from being turned into vegetables. The most she could do was block the worst of it, which still led to everybody in the link being rendered unconscious. A second later, a light appeared in the sky, roiling uncontrollably in the air before it slammed into the ground, creating a groove under it. The bio ship had not been spared either. MMMH, interesting. Mammon, said passing through the memories of the junior squad, casually. The mental walls put up by Miss Martian were nothing in front of his millennia of skill. He turned his attention to the shaman. A large pool of blood was already under him and the old man felt cold. Darkness was creeping on the edge of his vision. He felt something pull him back from death. Anyway, with no supervision, I went off on a completely different direction. Why contest for a realm with so many greedy bastards? when I could take the opportunity and create my very own kingdom. Luckily, I had foreseen this and ensured a countermeasure for when I got the chance to escape. You see, this body comes from a long line of half-breeds, suitable for possession with no chances of rejection. It truly feels like home. You can thank Solomon for that by the way, bastard thought he could shackle me like he did the others forever but, millennia ago, I hatched this plan. And now the world is going to be mine. Mammon laughed cheerfully before continuing with his explanation. I whispered words of hope to Lisbon on how to get his malady treated. He couldn't understand that the changes his body was showing, was just his blood reacting to his hidden heritage. So he came here at my behest, seizing control of a second-rate demon like Nimoth was child's play. I simply pointed him to your village, promising an all-you-could-eat buffet. Lisbon under my guidance led your village warriors and shamans to me, where I had set a trap. Fast forward to me taking their souls and turning them into undead that follow my every command, I knew I had to thin out the herd some more, so I reached out to your nephew, stoking his ego, hate and impatience, both to deliver a fresh meal to my underling for all the work he'd put in and to subtly steal another shaman from you, you might not be powerful individually but having nature act as your battery is bloody annoying, I've fought bastards like you before, the rest is history. A brief silence dominated the area. Now what? The old man wondered. Take rest. Suddenly he felt the ground rumble. A surge of vines, stronger than any he could create, broke through the earth, 
forming into the shape of a huge hulking humanoid figure. The champion, the shaman realized, hope blooming inside him. Mammon cocked his head to the side with an easy smile on his face. Well well well. I was thinking you wouldn't show up, champion of the green. That's when the shaman realized, it had all been a plan to stall until Swamp Thing arrived. Chapter 92 Saving the world ain't easy final part a mad cackling rang out through the already strange scene of over a hundred people standing expressionless, one bleeding man, a green monster made up of vines and a man with all black eyes. The green behemoth with red eyes surveyed the scene, taking note of the bleeding shaman who had been responsible for calling him, the villagers and the demon in front of him. After forming his own conclusions, Swamp Thing didn't waste any time. His upper body grew taller, looming threateningly over the only white guy in the vicinity. He pulled his green hands back and shot them towards Mammon. The latter simply smiled, looking unworried at the attack bearing down on him. The vines snapped taut over his body, constricting him like dozens of pythons. Bones broke and flesh was mashed into a red paste. Blood sprayed out of his mouth but the smile never disappeared. If anything dot he started laughing. You are a vile creature. Your energy corrupts and nature abhors you. I shall enact my punishment. A rumbling voice sounded out of the swamp thing, filling the area with the aura of power. With a bloody smile, Mammon's eyes turned vicious. So nice of you to join the party. I was wondering how long I would have to keep the old fellow from hitting the bucket. Now that you're here we can, finally start. With a flex of power, black flame sprang out of his broken form, burning all the vines apart in one move. A shockwave exploded out of him, blasting away the other vines about to come into contact with his body. The villagers were also blown away, falling on top of each other like tumbling weeds. Vines formed into a cocoon around the aged shaman who for some reason was yet to die. In response to Mammon's attack, Swamp Thing anchored himself onto the ground. Mammon softly landed and raised a hand. Silence dominated the whole village, disturbed only by the shaman's wheezing. Swamp Thing tried to move and found himself immobilized. What dot what sort of power? The champion of the green gasped in shock. He couldn't feel dot he couldn't feel the connection he had with the green. A red light started shining on the ground, forming an intricate pentagram below Swamp Thing. Mammon smiled. As if time was rewinding, loud cracking noises sounded out of his body. The broken leg with a bone showing was fixed, along with every injury he had sustained from Swamp Thing's attack. The blood disappeared and the clothes were fixed. Following the action, over a dozen villagers fell down with a gasp. Their bodies turned grey and aged in front of the shaman and Swamp Thing's eyes turned to shrunken corpses in a macabre fashion. Ah he moaned. That feels good. He said, referring to the stolen life force he had used to heal himself. Although the man known as Alec Holland was no more dot Swamp Thing still remembered his life as a human. So to see, the casual murdering of men, women and kids filled him with anger. He tried to access the green only to bounce off the wall. The pentagram circle below him pulsed with light in response to his actions. Trust me, that won't work. What you're looking at is a mystical locking field inspired by one of your greatest wizards, Solomon himself. You have no hope of breaking through it. Now, I suppose I have stalled long enough. Here's the deal old pal, I need something you have. He stopped, closing his palm, upon opening it, a dark red colored ball of energy was floating above it. This is a little experiment of mine. In simple times it's like dot the flag I need to plant to claim possession of this world. I thought I only needed the hub of green located here but then found out dot it's just one room. You could sense my virus trying to take control and simply cut it off from the rest of the house, which in this case is the planet but dot I thought to myself, if I had the key, it would be much easier. Your connection to the green is ever present, usually, and all encompassing, meaning I can use you to infect the whole planet, remaking it in my own image. That's some biblical stuff right there, mate. Now hold still. Mammon reached out a hand towards Swamp Thing's huge green chest. The vine started unraveling, revealing a pale body inside the champion of the green. Swamp Thing's mouth opened in a wordless scream. He was being unmade. A whistling sound rang out suddenly. Mammon leaned his head backwards, his eyes wide in shock and heart hammering by how fast he had come close to losing his head. A thin trail of blood ran down his scruffy beard. The ground broke apart to his right, under the figure that had appeared suddenly. TCH, I was aiming for your neck. The figure rose up to his full height, twirling the blade in his hands with an uncanny skill. The shaman on the ground struggled to open his eyes when he heard the voice. He was here. He had finally arrived. Now the old man could die happy. 
A smile appeared on his face and he let go. Aiden looked at the fallen shaman and sighed. Old man, I'm sorry I was too late, but... He turned his gaze towards the demon. A serious and determined look on his face. I promise you, I'll make him pay. He said, while thinking of a strategy. He couldn't hold back any of his abilities right now. That meant he was using everything. His full power. Mammon was powerful. He would rate him Superman level. On his way here, he had felt the aura being wantonly released by the demon and it was dot scary. Despite all his powers, Aiden wasn't sure he could take him down. But he knew he had no choice. It was either win this mismatched fight or the world would draw the short end of the stick. Mammon's eyes narrowed at the daggers in Aiden's hands. They looked familiar, on top of being very threatening. Where did you get those weapons, boy? Tell me and I assure you a quick and painful death. The demon offered. I'm on a time limit. Plus, you'll be dead long before I finish explaining that. Saying that, Aiden pointed one of the weapons at Mammon. A red shield appeared before the demon, blocking the hundreds of air construct weapons shot at him. The wind whistled as it buffeted the surroundings around the experienced demon. Aiden could see the constructs had no effect on Mammon, fortunately, he had anticipated this and the move had only been meant to serve as a distraction. He sneakily took advantage of the opportunity to use air construct ropes and carry the villagers away from the battlefield. Before they could get fifty meters between them and Mammon, Aiden felt his whole body shiver in fear. A torrential wave of black fire emerged from Mammon's body, a fire that sent the avatar of the elements on edge. Hellfire. Aiden swung his hands to the side, his own flames, almost as big as Mammon's responded to his call and slammed into the black wave, aiming to part the hellfire in the middle. Aiden felt himself get pushed back. The hellfire devoured even his own flames. Changing tactics, Aiden fell back on his strongest element, a wave of his hand and a tornado of violently rotating air was created, pulling Mammon's flame into itself and redirecting it around his body then back to the black flame's owner. Mammon looked on in contempt as the flame reached within vicinity. Pitiful. Following the comment, the hellfire exploded out of the tornado causing the immediate surroundings to turn into an ash and smoke filled crater. Luckily, Aiden had managed to pull all the villagers away through a remote boom tube while the demon had been preoccupied. But Aiden hadn't come out of it unscathed, he felt his body get thrown back, the heat from the black flames briefly coming into contact with his body before he could put up a shield and burning his trench coat to cinders. He coughed as he got up. The shockwave had packed quite a punch too but Aiden wasn't done. Silent steps rang out, slowly coming towards him. A figure could be seen walking out of the crater with an immobilized swamp thing floating beside him in the air. You survived that? And also managed to save my puppets? Okay, I have officially promoted you from an ant to a slightly bigger ant. Mammon insulted. Aiden made no comment. He stood up and studied the demon looking for a weakness. He had none. Well, except for his arrogance but that was par the course so, nothing new there. In that instant, the Grand Master Rare Bender felt something cut through the air towards Mammon from the back. Aiden made no indication of what was about to happen. The only thing he did was hold the daggers tighter, ready to attack. A massive blast of air shook the whole village as Superboy's fist was intercepted by a red shield, two inches away from Mammon's head. The Kryptonian slammed both hands on the shield, hoping to break through it and kick the ass of the man responsible for hurting Mgan, to no avail. Mammon backhanded the clone only for Superboy to lean back at the last minute, flying away. Mammon tightened his fingers and telekinetically pulled Connor back. Now, Aiden thought, a blast of flames appeared behind his shoulders and feet, pushing him faster than he had ever gone before with the combination of air bending and fire bending. He wasn't going to miss this time. He blitzed in between Superboy and Mammon, one of his daggers slicing through the air with a sharp sound and a brief flash of light. Then Aiden came to an abrupt stop, creating a groove under his feet before spinning in place, in an almost exact move from before when he took out almost 80% of the zombies. He felt his body warm up to a level it never had before. The energy in his belly was compressed to a degree he had never tried and then, he released it in one burst, aimed at the demon's head, plus ultra. The knight gained another sun, Aiden's maelstrom costume, turned to ash at the sleeves as the stream of red super hot flames never ceased burning out of his palms, his face was dripping with sweat, the light from the flames showing it set into an animalistic snarl. Red heat beams also joined the contest, Superboy tapping into the solar energy inside him to blast the demon while roaring. Mammon started getting pushed back, the huts and nearest trees were destroyed by the stray attacks as the two boys put in all they had to fight back. Then suddenly, Aiden cut off the stream, breathing heavily. 
Superboy flew down too, feeling as if he'd bench pressed a million tons. Did we get him? He asked Aiden. Instead of answering, the elemental attuned Dean stretched out his hand and grabbed a dagger dripping with blood from the air. Us? No, but the dagger I controlled using my air bending to slice through his neck, successfully beheading him and then turning his head into ash? Yeah. Yeah, I think we did. Aiden waved a hand, sweeping all the smoke and dust away. The soil was blackened at the point of contact where a burned corpse lay on the ground, headless. The teen narrowed his eyes, it might have looked like Mammon was dead but the lack of a text box from the system told him otherwise. A strange look appeared on Aiden's face. There were only three of them left alive. Him, Swamp Thing, and Superboy. We have to be careful, Mammon still isn't dead. We should search the surroundings and see if we can find any traces of him. Aiden suggested, rising up from his position. Copy that. Superboy replied while also looking around warily. He started walking away to start the search, when a boom tube suddenly and with no warning, appeared under his next step. To push him inside, Aiden waved both his hands to the ground, sending a massive platform of air bearing down on the Kryptonian. Then the boom tube disappeared. He sighed, removing the mask covering his lower face. Fuck. Swamp Thing floated down to the ground, now that Mammon was out of range. You betrayed your own? Humans never cease to disappoint. Aiden rolled his eyes. Mammon had possessed him and my chances of going up against a demon using a Kryptonian body are practically nil. Ask a certain new god, how that worked out for him. Look, when the team arrives, tell them I'll bring back Superboy, unharmed. A boom tube appeared before him and Aiden jumped in. He had an exorcism to perform. Chapter 93, Justice League Interlude Part 1 Green Arrow was on console duty. This part of the job was something that the billionaire both hated and loved with equal measure. Whenever Dinah decided to stick around, his shift seemed to go very fast but whenever he was alone or god forbid stuck with the more antisocial members of the League. Dot, the whole thing seemed to drag. The veteran archer swept a gaze on the satellite feeds, along with the surveillance footage installed in the Hall of Justice. The whole watchtower was monitored by an A.I but having unseen members to make sure the whole thing ran smoothly and to act as a first responder to unforeseen situations was mandatory. If any of their enemies accessed the watchtower, with the sort of technology installed in the base. The League and the world would be in big trouble. Green Arrow sighed and leaned back on his chair, contemplating calling Black Canary. He was so bored he could even welcome a distraction from Barry. Green Arrow chuckled, especially Barry. They just understood each other better than most of the other leaguers. A beeping sound pulled Green Arrow from his thoughts. He sat up straighter, seeing it was a reminder, to expect a call up from the junior team. A new measure that had been implemented by Captain Atom, with the purpose of giving the League an update on how every mission went, in case of a situation requiring radio silence, for example during contact with the enemy, Aqualad and his team knew what guidelines to follow. Two successive beeps to show they were preoccupied with an enemy, followed by two more to show they were done or one to show it was an enemy they couldn't handle and were entertaining a withdrawal to come up with different strategies. Lastly was the less likely, press and hold to request for league backup. None of that happened. The designated time to make the call up passed and Green Arrow frowned. They could have forgotten about it but something told the Star City resident, things were not that simple. Watchtower, pull up the current location of the bio ship. Green Arrow got up, while ordering the AI. A map of Africa appeared on the projected screen, the image was magnified to show a section in East Africa. A green blinking light appeared on a nondescript valley located in the northern part of Kenya. Green Arrow narrowed his eyes. How long has it been there? Thirty minutes. Came the answer from the computer. Green Arrow hummed. Something was up. His hand went for the comms. Watchtower to Aquilid. He waited for a response but got silence instead. Watchtower to bio ship. Can anyone hear me? Arrow tried some of the other members and after receiving no response, he changed the call. Watchtower to Captain Atom. We have a problem. The Bat Cave. Before you say anything, Alfred invited me to stay over for dinner. Superman announced, taking the stairs leading from the elevator down towards Batman. He glanced at the relics, memorabilia and souvenirs lining up the wall of the cave. Trophies from Batman's numerous exploits. Batman hummed in annoyance. The Kryptonian's unwelcome surprise, was well, unwelcome but necessary. Batman had a lot of things to do but there was something he'd been putting off that needed to be addressed. What do you want, Clark? The Dark Knight grumbled. In response, Superman tilted his head curiously. 
Alfred's wondering if he should bring down some refreshments for us before dinner. The red and blue clad hero stated. Batman looked up from the files he was reading through and narrowed his eyes at Superman, through the reflection of the bat computer's screen. The alien scratched the back of his head sheepishly. Superhearing. He explained. I know, Clark. And you're stalling. What do you and John want? The Gothamite replied testily. A figure shimmered into being through the walls of the bat cave. Manhunter spared a look at Superman with something akin to satisfaction. I told you he wouldn't fall for it. The Martian pointed out to Superman who sighed and took a seat. Yes. You're right Bruce. I am stalling. But that's only because I don't know how to approach this issue with you. Soup submitted, making the billionaire playboy philanthropist hum. Speak your mind. Nothing has ever stopped you before. He responded seemingly going back to studying the files on his table. Superman and Martian Manhunter shared a look. You're creating your own superhero team. The comment came from Manhunter. Batman paused midway to flipping over the next page of the folder on the table. He turned his chair fully to face the two, a hard look on his face. Seeing as I am not part of the Justice League anymore, none of my actions are answerable to you. He told them in that same hard tone that made him a delight to hang out with. But, I understand your concerns. In a rare moment of empathy, Batman decided to be dot cordial. To answer your question John, no, I am not putting together a team, at least officially. He smiled. Off the records, however, we need a way to move unhindered. A way we can take down the light without our every move being tracked by the mole on the team. Manhunter nodded at Batman's words. Indeed. Leaving the League offers you a certain level of autonomy and freedom the rest of us don't have access to. It will even be more believable after the press conference. Superman narrowed his eyes. Wait, back up a little. Amo, I thought we had resolved that as an open and shut case. Did you not provide evidence on Aiden being the spy? Having access to the money, files, cobra venom and whatever that other bottle contained was in your own words, irrefutable evidence. Batman sighed and shared a look with Manhunter. Am I missing something here? Superman asked after witnessing the strange look his two friends threw at each other. All that was a ploy. A light wish or the real mole that his cover was still intact. Superman took a few minutes to digest that information before crossing his hands over his chest. So Aiden is innocent of betrayal? You're telling me, we not only put out an APB to all active superheroes and League associates on a kid who's not even 18 years old but that we also abandoned him in a world that is not his own for no goddamn reason but to further your mission of finding out who the spy is? Superman clenched his fists in anger, staring at the greatest detective in the world. And that is why Clark's presence was necessary. It was time to fess up and hope he would understand. It's not as simple as that Clark. Aiden had a role in this and he understood the risk. Batman replied. What are you talking about? The Man of Steel asked. The one who answered was Manhunter. It was a mistake, my friend. John started, coming closer to Superman. We approached the boy in a misguided attempt to use him as a mole himself, to infiltrate the light and work with us from the inside to take them all down. Supes couldn't believe it. He was angered but most of all disappointed. He turned to walk away, needing to go somewhere else to think. Clark, I made a mistake. And I'll make this right, I promise. Batman admitted sincerely. What you did was worse than lying Bruce. You sacrificed your ideals and stooped to the light's level, just to win. I can't talk to you right now. Tell Alfred I won't be staying for dinner. With that, the Man of Steel left. Bruce sighed, running his palm through his hair. He had had the cowl off for their interaction. Well that went about as well as I told you it would. Manhunter commented. They had to know sometime. Bruce replied. You're right. On to other matters, what have you found out? You called me here saying you had a lead. Manhunter stated. Bruce turned to the bat computer and waved a hand, controlling the projected screen to show an image of a human DNA sequence. I found an extra gene in the DNA sequence of the samples we recovered from the bottle containing the strange liquid maelstrom had in his possession. Bruce explained. So what are you saying? Was the liquid made from? Manhunter started speaking before Bruce cut him off. Biomatter extracted from humans? Yes and no. The readings are not clear on that because something is actively messing with any device I try to use to understand its composition. Star Labs faced the same hurdle. Manhunter straightened up, finally catching on. You think there's mystical energy interference? He asked to which Batman nodded. Yes. 
MMMH, I could acquire the services of Zatara on your behalf. He's the only active mystical expert we can consult. Barring that, Atlantis might have some answers. Manhunter offered. Thank you John. There's something else as well. I have narrowed down the list. Bruce's words were delivered in the most serious tone the Martian had ever had from him. Serious, just like the statement itself. Bruce are you sure? There is no coming back from this if you're wrong. He warned the former leaguer. Bruce massaged his head and thought about it deeply. Manhunter was right. This would go further than just losing trust in someone. I'm not. But I don't think we have a choice. Suddenly, a transmission came through Manhunter's comms. The alien held up hand. Understood. I'll be there shortly. He then stood up in urgency. What is going on? Batman wondered. The team were found catatonic during their recent mission. Most likely from a telepathic attack. Atom has requested my help, Manhunter explained, making Batman narrow his eyes. Their recent mission was investigating Guy Lisbon's whereabouts. We'll take the bat to jet. The Dark Knight stated, leaving no room for arguments. Superboy is missing too. John added as they walked to the hangar. Chapter 94, Justice League Interlude Final Part The bat jet landed a distance away from the village, an open field that was cleared for cultivation due to it being the planting season. Martian Manhunter phased through the interior of the Dark Knight's craft, landing on the soil with barely a sound. A minute later, Batman joined him and they both walked the rest of the way towards the village. Most of the others like Superman, Green Lantern and Flash had arrived by way of the Zeta tube and stalled in Africa, one for each section of the continent. One was in Cairo, another in Dar el Salaam, for the south there was one in Cape Town and the last was in West Africa, particularly Cote d'Ivoire in a city called Abdijan. It was part of a planetary safeguarding scheme in case of a worldwide crisis, like an alien incursion. A plan that had become necessary after the Justice League had faced off against the Apelaxians. A green beam scanned them once they arrived at the scene of where the bioship was located. There was a group of locals armed with shields and spears going around the village, fixing up the huts that remained intact from the clearly massive battle that had happened here. Hey John, Bats. The Flash said, appearing before them in a burst of speed. He spared a brief look at the pair due to the unexpected presence of the Dark Knight before shrugging. You came right on time, we just managed to get the team out of the bio ship, though they still remain unresponsive. We're hoping you could work some of that Martian magic and fix. Whatever this is. The group walked over to the temporary tent they had set up to house the unconscious teens. The general consensus was to wait for the resident telepath to see what's was wrong before taking them back to the watchtower for further treatment. The aforementioned telepath stopped before the teens, only five of whom were present. Superboy was missing and John could feel the worry inside Superman's mind. The Kryptonian, Wonder Woman and Captain Atom landed next to Batman and the others but chose to keep quiet due as to not distract the Manhunter. The Martian's A's glowed with power, a green flash that disappeared after a few seconds. MMMH. John hummed, calling interest to the rest. I can feel their minds locked inside a mental loop, almost impossible for the victim to break through by themselves. Can you? Batman asked, naturally taking command like he was used to. Superman and Wonder Woman glanced at each other. The Man of Steel shook his head. Despite the misgivings he had about Batman's presence, caused by his earlier confession, the focus was on helping the team and finding the one responsible for the crater in the middle of the village. I will need time. The procedure is delicate, else we risk trapping them inside the psyche. Forever. The Martian answered back. There was a wave of palpable concern as Wonder Woman ushered everyone away. Take all the time you need John. Meanwhile, we will follow up on anything we find. The tent flap fell behind the last leaguer. Once outside, Wonder Woman rounded up to face Batman. Hands crossed as she gave the impassive Dark Knight a death stare. You have some explaining to do, Batman. Her tone had a noticeable hard edge on it. I'll... I'll just go around and see if we missed anything. The Flash announced and escaped from the brewing confrontation. Captain Atom similarly flew up without saying a word. He wasn't escaping. Not really. If anything he was prioritizing. As the Flash said, they might have missed something. Plus, Green Lantern was surveying the scene all alone, maybe he needed some backup. Don't you have anything to say Bruce? Diana was relentless. She had nothing against the detective. If anything a small part of her admired him. His will to never give up was something she had rarely seen in a mortal. In that, Batman was a step ahead many of the heroes Diana had come across. And she had come across a lot. 
But therein lies the problem. A willful man like Batman tended to keep his own counsel. It was, annoying and frustrating how much he trusted himself. I don't think now is the time or the place, Diana. We have Superboy and missing villagers to find. Superman played mediator, coming in between them. I'll go see if I can pull up the logs from the bio ship. Batman spoke up, making to leave. This is not over. Wonder Woman informed him, laying a hand on his shoulder gently. The Dark Knight ignored her and left for the bio ship. Lantern Stewart was scanning the ship and upon seeing Batman, he flew down to land next to him. The bio ship was in its resting oval shape. You know, typically when someone resigns it means they, you know, actually resign. How are you doing Batman? The Green Lantern greeted him easily. I'm good, John. What did you find out from your scans? The Lantern shrugged. Not much I'm afraid. The bio ship is on lockdown. It's a miracle we managed to extract the team. Maybe a subroutine? It changed forms after the extraction. And going by my scans, only a Martian or a telepath can get through its security. Makes sense for such a mentally reliant piece of tech like it. He explained. The uh, Batman corrected, to which Stuart looked at him strangely. Right. All that means is we don't have as good a lead as I initially thought we did. The Green Lantern concluded his explanation. What about the satellite feed from the Watchtower? Did it capture anything? The Dark Knight wondered. In response to the question, Stuart's ring shone with the light of a construct, displaying a green projected screen of the village seen from above. Just this dot a massive explosion of energy a few kilometers from here. Captured on the feed over 40 minutes ago. I was actually planning to head on over there and see if I can get a reading on what the energy was. MMH, Batman hummed. Let's go. In the meantime, the others can hold down the fort. A green platform appeared below Batman and they flew up, with Lantern Stewart giving an update to Wonder Woman. A short flight later, they came up on devastation. The landscape before them was destroyed. A massive groove had turned the hill leading up to a cave into a cavern with blackened walls and soil. My god, what could have caused this? Green Lantern wondered out loud. He'd only seen something like this caused by massive weapons under a watch list of an intergalactic arms oversight board. Each world had a certain level of weapon access that was allowed. Of course like many organizations in space, the board was less than useless, corrupt and inefficient. Batman narrowed his eyes. Get us down and scan for any remnants of energy signature left behind, then cross-reference that with anything in the ring's database. Stuart glanced at Batman from the corner of his eye. Sir, Araya sir. He said jokingly, causing Batman to sigh a little. He didn't think working with the League again would be this hard. Assuming command came natural to the Dark Knight but he knew he couldn't keep on doing it. They landed near the cave and a horrible smell assaulted Batman's nose, coming from the entrance. Good God, smells as if something died in there. Batman didn't say anything in response to Stuart's words but he mentally agreed. A torch appeared in his left hand as he studied the walls of the cave. He ran his fingers down the tunnel and it broke off into blackened pieces of soot. Probably as a result of an intense heat. Batman. You gotta see this. Stuart's voice pulled him out of his own investigation. It wasn't a weapon as I had initially thought. Instead the energy signature bears a strong resemblance to Aiden Strong. Back at the village. The flash had combed through the place ten times already and it was only by luck that he managed to find a certain trail hidden behind two huts with two warriors standing guard. The speedster narrowed his eyes. Looking at their vigilant stances, they clearly didn't want anyone accessing wherever the path led to. His hand went to his earpiece. Flash to Wonder Woman. I think I found something. Saying that, he disappeared, going so fast the two warriors saw nothing except for a short breeze that ruffled their clothes. They looked at each other and shrugged. The flash came to a stop when the trail opened up to a beautiful garden. Wow, Iris would fall in love with this place. He commented to himself. There was a bridge built over a pool that glowed beautifully in the night sky, lush grass on the edges of the empty space and a huge tree with glowing pods hanging from its branches. Before the tree, a shrine was elected. Barry had a feeling that this place dot was sacred. He stepped forward to cross the bridge when a rumble sounded out from below. Whoa! The flash shouted in surprise, jumping backwards as vines broke through the surface of the ground. The vines formed into the shape of a green hulking man with red eyes. Leave. The giant spoke up, his voice reverberating through the beautiful place. So I'm guessing you're the security, right? The flash quipped, 
his heart racing at speeds even he couldn't hope to achieve. Back with Batman. The pair crossed through the tunnel and found themselves inside a wide cavern. The stench was even worse in here. Batman's mask glowed with a white light as he took note of the strange surroundings. Black walls all around. A layer of soot and ash that Batman wasn't sure what it belonged to. He had a sample on his utility belt for further study. I found something. Stuart said, pulling Bruce away from his thoughts. The former marine flew towards the further end of the cavern where an underground river, now just patches of black stagnant water was located. A flash of scanning light, escaped the ring on Stuart's hands and a second later the results were in. That's, interesting. Not wanting to leave the dark night in the dark, John sent the information packet to Batman's holographic wrist computer. Who are the Skinniads? Batman asked, after promptly accessing the information. Forty millennia ago, before the Guardians signed a peace treaty with an alien species called the Reach, the Skinniads were a race of biomechanic life forms who could integrate with technology to a scary degree. It's what the Reach based their Scarab tech on. Unfortunately, they were destroyed due to the ongoing conflict at the time and due to their inclination to pursue knowledge and keep a neutral stand. I'm getting two distinct energy signatures here, one of Boom Tubes and the other, Skinniad technology. Chapter 95, one on one my surroundings changed as the boom tube spat me out into the fire elemental plane. Oppressive heat and warm air hit my lungs as I took a deep breath in. My aerokinesis was immediately suppressed, leaving me with just my physical strength, skills and fire bending to call on. I looked around, sending my awareness of the plane out. The dragons inhabiting the dimension were circling around something a few hundred meters away over the closest mountain to me. Just out of sight. Superboy registered in my senses, leisurely sitting on a boulder while watching the fantastical creatures flying above him in a hypnotic dance. He was waiting, waiting for me. My senses speared through the land of flames, giving me a general update on everything that was going on in the full elemental dimension. I had sent the villagers to the safest island I could think of, one close to sanctuary but far enough that they couldn't get there. The island was full of fresh fruits, variations that they had never had before and it looked like Mammon's spell or whatever it was had ended. The able-bodied elders had started forming shelter for the women and the children. A good strategy. The other thing I felt was a deep pulse that registered as foreign to the dimension, coming from a few thousand miles away from Sanctuary. Further delving through my senses, showed me Miner, the alien pod I had recovered from the cave after my fight with Namoth. Although I couldn't understood what was happening, I could feel it. Feel as its inner mechanisms shifted in an effort to repair its systems. What made me frown in confusion was the tendrils it had sprouted from under its body. It was stealing energy straight from my dimension to heal itself. No, not stealing. Borrowing. I promised myself to look more into that later and added a mist surrounding the island and several more near it, to hide it from view. Who knows, someone could be scrying into my dimension. It was better to be safe than sorry. Meanwhile, I had a fight to get to. A fight that would take everything I had to win. I was so outmatched and outclassed it wasn't even funny. And worse of all, he knew it. I felt him stare through the mountain at me. Despite the fact that this shit was serious dot it was also an opportunity. And that opportunity was the reason, I didn't send Superboy to the air elemental plane. I'm smart enough to realize that fire would not hinder Mammon at all. But this fight would give me the opportunity to fight at my absolute peak of physical strength and fire bending. I couldn't pass that chance up. The first thing I did was mentally command all the dragons in the vicinity to leave. Now, due to the fact I was connected to everything in this pocket dimension, I could order any of the creatures native to the dimension to do anything. The fight was about to get messy and I didn't want any of my creatures to get hurt. Not that I didn't know what dragons were capable of. In fact, I doubted I could take on a mature own in a straight fire bending fight. I had the power sure but they had everything else backing them up. Steam escaped my mouth in that familiar way I used to access my fire bending. I took a deep breath and felt the fire get stoked, running rampant inside my body, flushing my skin. I tore off remnants of the trench coat, leaving me in my regular suit minus the visor. And then I bent my knees. A simple push off the ground and I was off like a speeding bullet, fire raging out of my feet like the tail end of a falling meteor. I flew over and above the mountain, headed straight towards the Kryptonian, demonic opponent calmly waiting for me. A fight greater in proportion than I had ever been in was about to occur. My eyes shone with excitement as I could finally and properly go all out without a fear for destroying my surroundings. My moves down on earth had been confined to the most efficient attacks to get rid of Mammon due to the time limit but the mission had ended in success. 
I could see numerous prompts minimized at the corner of eyes, just waiting for my perusal. Right after I was done handing this demon his ass. I screamed as I pushed myself faster, the flames growing larger and the more violent. Superboy, his normal blue eyes now a black pool of light devouring organs smiled maniacally and jumped towards me as well, maintaining a collision course. We didn't speak. Only Dragon Ball Z-like shouts of effort escaped both our mouths, the second before we plowed into each other. Our fists met in the air and a shockwave blasted out. I felt the impact of the fully charged Kryptonian punch and was thrown back towards the mountain, managing to catch my unsteady and uncontrollable fall through my legs. The jet-like fire propulsion skill working in tandem with my superior body control to reinforce my coordination. A split second later, another massive fist barreled straight through where my head had previously been. I dodged, then blocked a telegraphed strike that made my bones sing with pain. I withdrew, leaning away from a haymaker that sent a violent wind blowing away near my face. I slapped a fist to the side then planted a punch onto his neck. It felt like I had punched the wall. Superboy pulled away and kicked at me. I crossed my hands in front of me, taking the full force of the kick. My hands shook in pain as I grunted. Fire escaped my feet and shoulders throwing me forward faster than he had expected. I slipped through his guard and delivered mountain-shaking strikes to his body. Targeting all the weak spots. I was more skilled, but Superboy was more mobile in midair. A consequence of losing access to my air bending. We fought for a few minutes in close combat. A slugfest that left me with a broken nose, a cut above my eyebrow and numerous bruises. In comparison Superboy looked like he could go on for days. I was losing badly, something needed to change. There was the option to use cheap locking on him but having tried it before on Connor to little success, I didn't think it would work that well, now that he was juiced up on some Kryptonian bullshit. God there's a reason they have such an effective weakness, otherwise Kryptonians would be hacks. Resolved to shift the way the battle was going, I pulled in close, grabbed the offending limb and threw him down over my shoulder. He flipped in the air with more ease than I had and dashed against me once more only to eat my own fully strengthened punch to the face. I shouted, exerting all the force I could. I felt my knuckles crack painfully but held on. Another explosion of shock waves was born from the contact and the mountain peak below us was dismantled, sending pieces of rocks raining down the mountainside. I was shocked. The punch had packed every ounce of strength I had, but had barely moved him. A smirk slowly appeared on his face. I'm liking this body dot a lot. I grabbed his face in between my hands. My mouth opened and a stream of red-hot fire poured out onto his face like a scene straight out of Dragon Movie. I kept the stream up for about a few minutes. Finally letting loose and allowing the fire to burn with wild abandon. I stopped a few seconds later. The t-shirt the Kryptonian clone was wearing was now reduced to ash, revealing his upper body to the world. He disengaged, grunting in pain as he covered his eyes with his palms. From what I could see, there wasn't a single burn on him. But having light shoveled into your eyes like that, especially with superior eyesight might have hurt. I spun, reared my leg back and round kicked the boy on the side of his head. This time I sent him hurtling down through the mountain peak, breaking through it and permanently shaving off its height. His body dug a groove through the ground as I followed after him. Even that was barely enough to keep him down for long. I grabbed the huge piece of rock from the destroyed mountain peak and flew into the air, straining at the 100 plus ton weight of the whole thing. Superboy looked up just in time to see a shadow appear above him. The huge rock smashed onto his body, leaving a cloud of dust rising up in the wake of the impact. Time to put him down for good. I landed on the ground and stepped forward with my right leg. Now that I was on a stable medium, going through the forms of fire bending was much easier than being in midair. I wound my hands around my body, tightening the fingers into fists and bumped both hands into one another. I dragged my leg back closer to my body before my hands suddenly spread to the side, winding up in a circular motion that ended with both my palms facing the sky, one above the other, held closer to my solar plexus. I spread both hands to the sides again, palms still open and facing the sky. A variation to the normal forms of fire bending I had come up with to compress my flames for one devastating attack. It was a move that needed time to prepare. I took a deep breath feeling the normally intangible and light energy turn viscous and run up from above my groin to my two hands. Twin rotating balls of fire appeared above the palms, easily over 20 meters wide in diameter. The heat around me picked up immensely to the point even I could feel it. I raised my palms up to the sky, feeling the strain of channeling so much energy through them. I hadn't channeled this much before, wary of just how much destruction a single ball would cause, so the move had remained seen practical application. 
This was its debut. The ground rumbled aggressively below me. Uh-oh. The rock I had slammed on top of Connor glowed red at one point, before a massive explosion rang out and pieces of stones pelted the area and dust covered the scene. My gaze speared through all that to establish eye contact with a red-eyed gaze. Superboy flew into the air effortlessly, staring down at me like a god. Oh shit. My technique wasn't complete. The fuck was I going to do? I absentmindedly took note of the fact that the DNA suppressing patch on his upper arm was nowhere to be seen, which meant that Mammon was accessing all of Connor's Kryptonian abilities. Most probably through mystical means. Scary. My turn. He stated, the glow in his eyes intensifying. Ugh. The twin beams exploded out of his eyes, burning a path through the air towards me and my own attack. If the heat beams landed, I wouldn't lose control of the only move that had a possibility of hurting this guy. Fuck, I sighed, finally understanding I wasn't at the level of the elites. All this had been a test to see how I measured up currently and even with a bending dot I couldn't see myself taking on Superman if this was how strong a normal Kryptonian was. Of course the comparison was not that accurate due to Mammon being a demon inside Connor but it was a clear indication I was still lacking in some ways. I guess this leaves me no choice but to cheat. Time instantly slowed down to a crawl. Using my full administrator privileges, I could basically control everything in the pocket dimension. I couldn't interfere directly with the elemental alignment of each individual elemental plane due to the risk of destabilizing the whole dimension but anything else was fair game. Time and space meant nothing in here when I could shape existence like putty. It also guaranteed that anyone fighting me inside the dimension was fucked. But dot not everything is good news. It was such an obvious function to take advantage of, that down the line, I was sure the avatar system would find a way to restrict me from taking the easy way out in every fight. Judging from how it had acted so far, the system encouraged individual power progression, tackling my own shit head on. No shortcuts which meant I would only get so many free passes. But for now, I was going to enjoy this. I instantly combined the two balls of flames into one, a perfect rendition of Cruel Sun. The eye beams were slowly cutting through space, heading towards my position. The combined ball of heat energy shrunk down as I compressed it, then compressed it some more, leaving it the size of a tennis ball. I took a leap and appeared before Connor, pushing my hand towards him as his reaction speeds finally caught him up to what was about to happen. The black eyes widened minutely just as I pushed the ball of fire onto his chest and whispered. Boom. The sky shone with the light of the sun. Chapter 96, Exorcism Superman touched down first, the rest following close on green lanterns will construct. Flash, what did you find out? You didn't say much through the comms. Superman asked, stepping closer to the speedster who would alternate between looking at them and at the entrance to the path leading to the shrine. The shrine he had been unceremoniously kicked out of by a living vine monster. A path that had been promptly blocked and covered by a wall of vines with sharp and pointy thorns along their lengths. It was clear to anyone that none of them were welcome inside. I dot so here's the thing dot there is a green guy with red eyes and an attitude worse than bats over here. Seriously, this plant guy takes grouchy to another level. The Flash started talking quickly without actually saying anything. Flash, what are you talking about? The Batman cut him off impatiently. Looking over to the faces of his colleagues, Barry felt a little embarrassed. He cleared his throat and pointed behind him, at the wall of vines blocking the path to the shrine. There is Dot and I kid you not, a plant guy protecting a Dot garden of some sort that way. I had to get out of there quickly before he could turn me into a pincushion. Seriously, the hospitality in this place. Barry sighed, someone's not getting five stars. He added the last part quietly. Seeing attention get thrown towards them, the two warriors guarding the path tensed, they glanced at each other and brandished their spears, pointing them at the league in anger and determination. Something had happened. The outsiders had clearly broken the rules and their trust. The nimble man covered in yellow light had ran out through the entrance to the shrine. The path leading to the sacred grounds had then been blocked by vines, behind him. No doubt the work of the ancestors. They were making a clear statement. These outsiders needed to leave. Batman narrowed his eyes at their stances. Just before he could address them in Swahili they froze in place as the Martian Manhunter made an appearance. John's hazy form grew corporeal through the walls of one of the huts facing the path to the shrine. John. Wonder Woman muttered in surprise. That was, first. Is the team okay? The Martian merely nodded without answering and inclined his head towards the wall of vines. The ancient Martian archives speak of beings tasked with being the voice, face and hand to each of the elemental parliaments. 
a link between sapient creatures and the building blocks of all existence. The Martian flew forward and stopped between the League members gathered and the Wall of Vines. It is an honor to make you acquittance, Champion of the Green. A brief silence dominated the area. That silence was broken by a deep rumbling from the ground. It cracked apart, vomiting out vines with a darker shade of green, that formed up into the shape of a huge man with red eyes. C. Wasn't lying. The speedster gulped, backtracking, while Barry had seen magic and mystic anomalies of all kinds and in addition, didn't struggle to believe in it like his nephew, he was in essence, still a scientist at heart and mind. There was no way something like this should exist. A control mechanism acting as the inner core, holding the vines together through science, he might have believed. He could even think of a dozen ways that could happen. But the problem was dot the visual scanner implanted in his suit didn't show anything like that. In fact it didn't show anything, just a walking, talking mass of sentient vines. Humans dot leave this place, none of you are welcome. The deep gravely voice that rang out of the creature's mouth sent warning bells ringing for everybody. The league tensed. Why do all bad guys sound like they just came from a hard metal concert where they were the lead singer? The Flash commented. Everybody stand down, this is not an enemy. John Caution then turned to address Swamp Thing. We mean you and Nate no harm. My companions and I are part of a global team tasked with protecting the planet from threats both external and internal that the normal law enforce cannot handle. We are the Justice League. Swamp Thing cut in, surprising the League as present. You know of us? Superman asked. I was once dot human. Another bomb was dropped. Fortunately, the earlier hostility had faded away. I sense no falsehoods in you, for humans. Not to mention you. He pointed at Captain Atom, have a garden. It's decided. I will answer any questions you have. I only wanted to know one thing. Where is Connor? A loud psychic communication emanated from a figure that had emerged from the bio ship. Miss Martian's eyes were glowing green and the look on her face dot was a split between worry, sadness and rage. General POV, L. A, Lucifer's penthouse. The light of a boom tube appeared suddenly and without any warning. The two blondes on Lucifer's side screamed out in fear, backing away to the edges of the couch, while using their clothes to cover their assets. Lucifer sighed in annoyance. Aiden stepped out of the boom tube with something or rather someone on his shoulders and looked around, instantly. His face got a little flushed in embarrassment. Lucifer's eyes widened minutely before his face settled into its usual relaxed state. You couldn't wait for two hours? Lucifer asked him with a raised eyebrow. Aiden scratched his head, wanting to be anywhere other than there. Sorry, I had no idea you were preoccupied with something. Two at that, Aiden quipped, unsure of what else to do after cock-blocking the devil. Lucifer glanced at his companions and addressed them. Excuse me loves, I have something I need to take care of and then we can resume our dot activities with no further interruptions. The women squealed in happiness and infatuation as Lucifer's voice oozed with charm. He could have told them to jump off a cliff and they would have done it, no questions asked. Right then, let's get this over with. Aiden blinked his eyes and instantly found his surroundings had changed. Yo bro what the fuck? He backed off suddenly. His eyes were focused on Lucifer in wariness. He'd barely felt the transition. A flex of his shoulders and black as night wings appeared behind the former archangel's back. The wings seemed to swallow all the light away. Lucifer held Connor by his neck. He placed his finger on the Kryptonian's head and pulled. A shrieking being made entirely of black mist was forcefully exorcised from Superboy's body. Terrified wails escaped the demon. Words of plea and mercy that Aiden couldn't understand were said by Mammon in Hellspeak, a being who had caused Aiden problems just earlier. Mammon shrunk away, trying to escape Lucifer's hands only to fail. Lucifer's smile widened as he clenched his fingers, holding on to the demon lord tightly and then dot threw him through the bubble shield separating Aiden, Connor and him from what was outside. Don't stare through the barrier. Oh you already did. Lucifer's warning came too late. Billions and billions of souls getting burnt and crying out for dot help. Mercy. Help us. Save us. Just a drop of water. Burns won't stop. Won't stop. Eternal damnation. There was a finger snap and Aiden found himself back on the floor of the penthouse, breathing heavily. He wiped the sweat on his eyebrow and placed a hand on his chest to calm his wildly racing heart. What the fuck was that? All those people. Not only people but creatures as well. All calling for help. 
a cacophony of sound that broke through the layers of even his inexperienced telepathic awareness due to the sheer force of emotional, spiritual and mental anguish. He heard a liquid of some sort get poured in a glass and a second later, a cold glass of water was placed in his shaking hands. Aiden brought the glass over to his lips and downed the whole thing like a man dying of thirst. Lucifer didn't stop him, content to watch him with an undecipherable look on his face. Once he was done, Aiden took a deep shuddering breath and got up shakily. What dot what was that place? Even as he asked that question, he already knew the answer. Lucifer took a sip of his own glass of water. The lowest pits of hell. Where the worst of the worst or other those who piss me off, take a time out. He explained but this time, the usual cheer and easygoing mindset he usually had was nowhere to be seen. Aiden gulped as he felt a chill grip his heart. Take a seat, we need to talk. Lucifer ordered, his robe shifting into a white suit that seemed to glow even in the light. Aiden complied. He had always known that this being was dangerous just by virtue of being the second most powerful existence in all of creation. But sitting before him, recalling what had just occurred, Aiden got to experience firsthand what being prey felt like and it strengthened his resolve to get even more powerful. You did something you shouldn't be capable of. Mammon is a demon lord. Despite saying that the devil rolled his eyes in mockery. Unbelievably weak but he would have given Maze a good fight. Of course he'd lose but that's not the point. He sat on the table before the couch and fixed him with an intense stare. The point is. You were not supposed to take him out that easily. I had foreseen it. You would have made it back with a broken arm, no left leg and a cracked sternum. You truly are an enigma Aiden. Aiden was shocked to the core. He shook his head. Lucifer didn't lie dot but still. It was anything but easy. He was strong. The only reason I made it out alive was because he underestimated me and I was able to hit him with an attack, powerful enough to take out his vessel. If the fight had gone on for long, a broken arm, no left leg and shattered sternum would have been the least of my worries. MMMH. You still don't get it. You changed your own fate, something that should not have happened. Make me wonder if I've been stunting your growth. Lucifer said in thought. What do you mean? The young avatar questioned. Lucifer contemplated answering and shrugged. Things had already gotten to this stage so he didn't see the benefit in keeping quiet. I've been shielding you. Forces at play seek to dot use you, condemning you to a fate worse than death. Lucifer told him. And before you say anything else, I am not your bodyguard. This is supposed to be my vacation. I can't enjoy my vacation if I'm constantly watching you. Not anymore at least. Aiden gripped the edge of his seat tightly. He'd suspected it. DC was a world of bullshit magical powers and evil mystical assholes like Clorian seeking to do chaos. Someone must have noticed the power he could throw around, especially after his fight with the League. Someone must have seen it and thought he would make the perfect weapon. So here's the deal. My protection ends after the next two missions. When that is done. Lucifer's face turned grave. You're on your own. Aiden gulped. Alone. Alone against whatever was out there. Why? He croaked out. His question made Lucifer chuckle. Why? Have you not been listening? You changed the outcome of something I had foreseen as absolute. That means any of the horrible shit that is supposed to happen to you might not. Depends on your own will to live and be free, really. So no pressure. And that means. Great entertainment value. No more spoilers for me. The devil smiled widely. I believe dot your full potential is exposed when you have nothing and no one else to fall upon except for yourself, Aiden. That is where your true strength lies. You have shown it. Now it's time to live up to it. Chapter 97 Handling Issues Your Dot Friend Lucifer begun only for me to cut in with. Ex teammate. He nodded, a skeptical tone evident in his next words. Right. Anyway, he's going to wake up precisely in about. He cocked his head to the side, staring in midair. 6 hours 30 minutes and 24 seconds. 023 now. I rolled my eyes and muttered. Show off. In response the devil chuckled while rising up from the table. I took that as a cue and got up as well, noting again just how comfortable these couches were. And you're just jealous. Now, I'm going to ask you to kindly leave, he informed me, his white suit changing into comfortable robes. He clapped his hands in theatrics and the room got dimmer, slow jazz music began playing in the background. The volume was low enough to only set the mood, I have unfinished business to take care of. Lucifer said in a devilish smirk. Okay, fine, I'll admit it. Dude had style. A boom tube appeared inside the room and just as quickly disappeared. 
No. Nope. Naha. You will exit the room like a normal person. Lucifer wagged a finger at me. Really? My face betrayed my dejection. No more portling in and out of the living room. My penthouse, my rules. The next time you try to use a boom tube to portal in, don't be surprised when you find yourself sunbathing next to Memon. He told me, entering into a staring match with the all-time undefeated champion, Moy. Only two seconds in, I realized how dumb it was to provoke the literal master of hell and like the anti currently was to him, I simply bowed my head and accepted. Fine. Your penthouse, your rules. I left the smug bastard for the door, just as he started dancing to the slow rhythm of jazz. The door closed behind me, cutting off the noise of the music. I leaned on the wall and sighed. I needed a break. These past 24 hours had been exhausting. I was mentally and physically tapped out. I dragged my body down and sat on the floor, my back to the wall. I ran a hand down my face. I hadn't even toured Africa like I'd planned. Footsteps sounded around the corner and May suddenly appeared. She raised an eyebrow and slowed down to a stop. You look like you've been through hell. She commented, making me chuckle. Kinda. I replied with a shiver. That place had been fucking terrifying. She narrowed her eyes. Really wished I cared more to ask what you meant but dot duty calls. She said, opening the door and walking in, only to walk out almost immediately, the sound of giggling getting cut short by the door closing. The blondes are back. I stated. The blondes are back. She agreed. I need a drink. She said and looked at me, running a critical eye all over my body. And you need a shower. Badly. Come and find me after you're done. We need to talk. She held out a hand for me to take. I stared at and finally gripped it, getting off the floor in one swift motion. Without another word, Maze left, her hips swaying hypnotically. Oh and Aiden dot nice job. She complimented me, most probably on the mission. I mean, I did take down a demon lord after all. The surge of pride I felt inside, disappeared when Maze held up her hands to reveal two familiar daggers clutched in her palms. I patted myself down and cursed. Mother fudger. Her laughter trailed off as she rounded up on the corner. Shaking my head, I spared one last look at the door to the penthouse and left, making my way to my own room. Two minutes later, I was standing close to my bed, looking down at a passed out Connor. To tell you the truth, I was still unbelievably angry at how things had gone down. To expound on that truth, the anger was mostly directed at me. I had been foolish to leave my possessions in Mount Justice. I hated that sometimes I made it easy for me to screw myself over. Most of my actions had turned impulsive after coming to this world. No, after taking the Cobra Venom, this needed further looking into. The funny thing was that I had known it was a dumb thing to do. Regret is a bitter pill to swallow but I couldn't get stuck in the past anymore. I had to let go of the anger. Anger at them, bats and the mostly myself. Such a thing however, is easier said than done. I noticed a visible budge on the side pocket of his pants and frowned. The DNA suppressor patches. I remembered this. It had been a hot topic for discussion back at my earth. A reddit thread had someone wondering how they would work on somebody else. For example, Raven. Were the patches specifically designed for a human Kryptonian hybrid or could they be used by any hybrid to suppress their weaker DNA? That warranted some investigating. There was also something else nagging me. A half-remembered memory about Conor or maybe his situation. MMMMH goes to show I hadn't recovered all the memories about Canon that I thought I had. No surprise there, the mind is a complicated place. A few sessions with the telepathic duo, Manhunter and his niece couldn't guarantee that I would have everything figured out. Fortunately, my telepathy had been gradually growing powerful. I could now sense minds, like beacons of electric energy, they lit up in my senses and soon, I had a feeling I was about to level up that particular skill. As payment for saving your ass, I'm taking two of these. I told the sleeping Connor and pocketed two of the patches inside my suit. I looked at the time on the screen of my phone and winced. I needed to take Connor back to the team before Mgan freaked out and started brain blasting everyone for information. Talk about unhinged. A boom tube appeared in midair as I hoisted Connor up. I jumped in, stepping out into sanctuary before jumping inside another boom tube and arriving inside the watchtower's infirmary. Instantly, alarms started going off. Intruder alert. Intruder alert. I rolled my eyes placed Superboy on the bed and waved at the camera, before jumping inside the portal. This time, instead of appearing at Sanctuary, the boom tube emptied out at the island housing all the villagers I had saved from Mammon. 
The first person to see me was a young girl who shrieked in fear. The villagers gathered scrambled and hurdled into a group, all warily staring at me. I sighed and loosened the half mask I had on, while holding up my arms in a universal sign to show I meant no one any harm. Some of them breathed out easier and relaxed. One of the older villagers, a man who looked not a day above eighty stepped forward. I just want to take you all back home. I told him softly, taking care to remain as non-threatening as possible. These people had gone through hell. They'd lost so much, it wasn't hard for me to get invested in their well-being because of the similarities in both our circumstances. The old man looked back at the women and kids. The kids peeked from behind their mother's skirts, looking at me in a mixture of awe and fear. He turned to me and nodded. We go. His English was heavily accented but he was clear enough that I understood what he meant. A boom tube appeared before us and I pointed to it. Follow me. I told them and then walked in to show I wasn't leading them to a bad fate. If a stranger asked me to walk through a portal without knowing where it was going, I'd be more than hesitant too. The boom tube emptied out onto a path outside the village. I spread out my senses and felt the leak, team and the young warriors from Masley's group all loosely gathered around a familiar massive hub of green energy. Swamp thing. Shit. Miss Martian said something and the league started making their way towards where I was. The first one to arrive was the Flash. I couldn't open another boom tube while I had another one active, so I was kinda fucked as I waited until the last of the villagers stepped out of the boom tube. I stopped just before I could jump in through the boom tube. No, maybe, I could take this chance to address a few things. It was high time the heroes and I came to an understanding anyway plus, MMH, that could work. So I did nothing as a scarlet streak blitzed past me and shackled my arms tightly together with power dampening cuffs. A second later, a glowing golden rope of divine make firmly tied me up, courtesy of a Wonder Woman who floated down, followed by Superman, Martian Manhunter, Captain Atom, and Green Lantern, with Batman on a platform of will construct. Miss Martian also landed on the ground after them and looked unsure on how to proceed. She fidgeted in place, making me roll my eyes and open my telepathic awareness a little. Mgan latched onto the link like a drowning man and I sent over a picture of a calmly sleeping Connor. He's fine. Instantly, the hyperactive Martian settled down. I cut off the link, seeing and ignoring Manhunter's small smile of appreciation. I fiddled with the power dampening cuffs. They were designed differently from the usual power dampening collars. I narrowed my eyes, seeing shining runes that briefly flashed before disappearing. Magi tech. Sweet. I'm taking these with me. Not only that but they also felt, different. I could feel my connection to the elements was still there. Ever present. But a compulsion that weighed on my will to start bending stopped me from using the connection. I felt lethargic and lazy even thinking about bending. I chuckled just as the last of both teams arrived. The bio ship landed and the junior team got out with the obvious exception of Superboy. By then, Flash and Green Lantern had ushered the villagers away most probably expecting a fight. Surprisingly most of the hostility I had expected was absent. Even Wally looked, unsure. I narrowed my eyes. Something was up. Wonder Woman stepped forward, one hand holding on to her lasso of truth. Another trial, why am I not surprised? I addressed all of them. For a few seconds nobody said anything. I held up the power dampening cuffs and stared at Batman. Let me guess, you had help from Zatara, didn't you? I can still feel the connection to my powers but using them is a different matter. Well played bats. Of course even as I said that, my connection to the elemental dimension was ever present. One thought and a boom tube would appear under me. Chapter 98, Full Circle Part An Example of Aiden's Deep-Rooted Character Flaw Aiden's POV So dot this wasn't how I thought everything would go down. I addressed the gathered heroes, holding up the cuffs. This is the part you all start asking questions. You got me right where you need me. In cuffs. Wonder Woman and Superman shared a look. The cuffs are meant to act as a deterrent in case you get violent, son. We don't want to hurt you and neither do we want you hurting others. Superman said. I looked at the faces of the gathered heroes. Although they looked wary and ready for a fight, they didn't seem eager to provoke our interaction into one. It seemed I wasn't the only one who had cooled off somewhat. Nice. Fair enough. I finally said, lowering my hands. I am also open to having a peaceful conversation. I don't want to hurt anyone, only those that deserve it. Wally scoffed, only to get lightly hit on the side by Robin's elbow. Dude, what the hell? He whisper shouted but I didn't pay attention to Robin's response. My focus was on the league. 
particularly Batman whose gaze seemed even more piercing at my statement. Hurting people is never the answer, no matter if they're wrong or not. We let the law handle them for a good reason. Superman was quick to say. I nodded. Right and the cycle continues. Meanwhile more innocent lives are lost in pursuit of safeguarding one monster's life, to try and rehabilitate them when the only thing they seem hell-bent on is causing destruction and pain to people who can't handle it like we can. What can a baseline human hope to do against someone like Black Adam? I laughed a little. Look, maybe I am being too harsh on you. This is not my world. As I said that, the lack of surprise or shock from the junior team told me that they already knew that bit of news. I saw the look of sadness and understanding on Aquilid's face. Maybe Batman had briefed them on my origins. Must be why there is a distinct lack of that senseless jealousy from Kid Flash. I haven't lived here long enough to understand why you do what you do. Why you try and save every life even if it means that that same person will be the death of others down the line. But the thing I can't accept dot is that you haven't come up with an alternative. I ran my eyes over everyone gathered. You have some of the most powerful and smartest people in the world, I pointedly looked at Bruce. Batman, your resources alone are enough to build a friggin' space station to watch over the Earth. Man, the watchtower was fucking hacks. At that, a few murmurs broke out among the team. Atom and the Flash looked to be in thought. I didn't kid myself to think that I was telling them something they hadn't thought of before. But I was giving voice to that thought. Asking them to change the rules because clearly, while it was working dot things could be better. Maybe I found it hard to reconcile with the fact that someone like Professor Pig existed here because back in my world, the worst thing we had was terrorist cells, corruption, gang violence and toxic feminists. Not mass murdering costume wearing freaks that could induce the worst nightmares you can think of throughout an entire city. With help from the rest of the League and League Associates, it would be a simple matter to create an impenetrable prison for anyone too dangerous to let out. I shrugged. But hey, that's just me. Maybe you guys just like wearing costumes and going out every night to fight more people with the same fetish. I finished to the sound of John Stewart's snicker. The rest looked at him and he shrugged. He's not completely wrong. In fact, he's got some valid points. Dude you're wearing a costume too. The Flash pointed out accurately. An official Green Lantern uniform, commissioned by the Guardians of the Universe. Stewart shot back defensively. A few chuckles broke the tense mood in the air. Wonder Woman, Superman and the Manhunter huddled together to discuss something. Most probably what to do with me. Batman was busy with his holographic wrist computer while also keeping a watchful eye on me. The three leaguers having a discussion threw a few glances over at my position while I took the opportunity to talk to Miss Martian. Her mind shone like the sun compared to baseline humans like Robin. I say baseline but even Robin's mind was like a lighthouse in comparison to actual baseline humans like the warriors of the village. The less said about Batman the better. Did that mean that there was a chance they could also develop telepathic abilities? I didn't think so but maybe the exposure to Miss Martian's powers had made their minds more flexible? It was possible. I felt the link established between us. Luckily, she was smart enough to understand that I wanted to talk to her alone, otherwise this would probably turn into a shouting match between Wally and I. Mgan, did Batman tell you guys about? I trailed off, suddenly unsure of how to bridge that subject. It was still a sensitive topic to me although, I'd already made peace with it. No dot but Robin sorta told us. Though it wasn't intentional at all dot I'm really sorry. I can't imagine how it must have felt like getting taken away from your family and life like that. I closed my eyes a little. Yeah dot it wasn't easy. What do you mean it wasn't intentional? I wondered, choosing to focus on that particular tidbit instead of my past. It happened when we were knocked out, hello Megan. Why don't I just show you what happened from our perspective and maybe you can, also share. I thought it over for a few seconds and nodded while smiling. Fine. But not now. Not here. She nodded imperceptibly, our brief conversation going unnoticed except for him. Yes, you guessed it right. Batman. He stepped forward, deading the discussion going on between the other three prime leaguers. The Flash along with Atom, after making sure I had no intention to flee continued their patrol around their village. Turns out many things didn't add up about the whole incident. For starters, there weren't any remains left of the zombies from our fight with both Nimoth or Mammon. Suspicious, but I also knew the one responsible. Swamp Thing, no doubt. It just made sense. How did I find all this out? Air Sense Baby. I'll let you on in a little secret, my airbending was far above needing conscious control to be suppressed through compulsion. 
You seem awfully quiet today. Bat got your tongue? I asked Batman with a small upturn of my lips. The joke was terrible and I actually heard Robin and Artemis groan. I spared the pair a glance. Hey, cut me some slack, my skills are rusty. I said defensively. Boo. Artemis booed and showed me a thumbs down. Tough crowd. Who are you working for? Batman's voice rang out. Straight to the heart of the matter. I waited to feel the compulsion from the lasso of truth but surprisingly the magical artifact didn't light up. We all looked at the only demigod around in question. Wonder Woman? Batman said, probably wondering why she wasn't activating the lasso of truth. Wait, did she actually even need to activate it? I thought that one touch and despite what happened, you would be compelled to tell the truth. Wonder Woman stepped up in between us. Batman you are no longer part of the Justice League. Due to your resignation, your clearance level has changed for security reasons. That means you are not authorized to question any of the League's suspects or potential suspects. Your authority level extends to the capacity of a League associate. Silence dominated the grounds. I couldn't believe it. Batman had resigned? What in the fucking hell? Could this be because of how everything went down? I looked at Manhunter for answers. His face remained impassive, showing me I wasn't going to get any. I straightened up and sighed, still in shock. Batman and Wonder Woman held eye contact for a few more seconds before the Dark Knight turned on his heel and left. Batman. Superman called out softly. Bruce stopped and looked at the other man over his shoulder. Save it. This is what I wanted and it doesn't change anything. The mission goes on. And then the Gothamite left. Robin looked like he wanted to do nothing more than follow after his mentor but relented. Probably because one of his teammates was catatonic back at the watchtower. You will answer all the questions we ask you, is that clear? Wonder Woman pulled me out of my thoughts and ordered. The lasso of truth glowed golden and I felt compelled to answer. This time the compulsion was like the weight of the whole earth as compared to the compulsion on the cuffs to use my abilities to fight. The latter felt like the weight of a small mountain. Yes, I understand. My mouth said without any conscious control. The words just flowed out. Good, Wonder Woman to Watchtower. She placed her finger on the earpiece and called the big space station. Soon. How fast can you arrange transport? The answer she received wasn't satisfactory and she ended up cursing. By Hera. I raised an eyebrow as the rest looked at each other. Miss Martian, is the bio ship. Superman began, trying to look for a different alternative. She is in no shape to fly. She answered and Wally snickered. Ah. Nice one Gan. Miss Martian looked unsure. You um, thanks? So she got the worst of the telepathic attack from earlier when she tried to shield us. I'm sorry. Miss Martian refused. We will have to wait for a few minutes for the watchtower to arrange extraction. I heard Wonder Woman mutter to Superman. They were of course wary to leave me unattended with less than everyone present. If I went ballistic, they feared repeat of the Man Justice incident. And I was also getting tired of standing in one place like a fool. I had a plan to carry out. Oh wait, did I forget to mention that? Only a fool would allow himself to be captured by his enemies like I had. I would never put my freedom at risk just to talk about my feelings or reconcile my differences with crazy people, because that is what the League and hell, even I was. A normal person would have broken had they stayed a month with the League. I had, and I knew I wasn't the same Aiden Strong that slept in his room and woke up to the sound of gunshots. That dude was dead. And after my talk with Lucifer, along with him telling me that I was alone the second I completed the missions he had for me, things fell into perspective real quick. This world was crazy insane. And to combat that craziness, I had to use my own craziness. The most underrated gift I had that trumped my powers and my meta-knowledge was the fact I knew, I was crazy. The League, the junior team and all the other superheroes, even the people of this world, everybody was crazy compared to where I came from. They'd grown too desensitized to gape violence too fast. That is why I said everybody was mad, but things could be better. And I would show them, but for my plan to work, I need I'd access to the watchtower. God I hope this works. A boom tube appeared between the heroes and I. I held up my hands to placate Diana who had a sword out of its sheath and pointed towards me. Hey, I'm not trying to attack you, this is just a way to get to the watchtower quicker. Chapter 99, Full Circle Final Par Wonder Woman lowered her sword slowly but the hard look on her face didn't change. It was easy to see that they didn't believe me, which wasn't a bad thing actually. I mean from where they stood, I was clearly still the enemy, barring that, at least a suspicious party. 
You're right to be cautious. I stated, pointing towards the vortex of yellow energy. The portal doesn't actually take you straight into the watchtower, it crosses a dimension, only I have access to and from there, I can create another portal into the watchtower. I could see them soaking in the information. Robin was probably filing that away for future reference and countermeasures in case we fought again. One might wonder why I was so free with that information. And to prove my point, Aqualad called attention to himself by clearing his throat. Why would you trust us with that information when you know we might use it to our advantage? He asked. Wonder Woman narrowed her eyes. Answer Aqualad's question truthfully. The lasso of truth glowed a golden light and I felt a compulsion like earlier to tell the truth to the best of my knowledge. Because I have nothing to hide on the subject and I want your trust in return. Lying or giving half-truths about my portals would only get in the way of that. I am willing to take the chance that you might use that information to beat me. I finished and my mouth immediately closed with an almost audible snap. I took a few calming breaths and looked at Wonder Woman in annoyance. That was not in any way pleasant. The Thermi Siren Princess snorted. You know what they say, the truth sets you free. I held up my bound hands. They must have been drunk off their senses when they said that, seeing as I'm still in cuffs. I replied, a little more than miffed. You apostrophe ll dot get there, eventually. Superman said and patted me on the shoulder with a brief smile. Or not. Wally added, only for Artemis to hit him on the side with her elbow, taking over from Robin. Ow. They started arguing a little in good-natured fun. Meanwhile, I smiled inwardly. The lasso of truth compelled you to tell the truth but it didn't compel you to reveal more than the scope of the question. Wonder Woman was clearly smart enough to ask a loaded question to get as much information as she could about a subject but what she didn't account for dot was how effective the artifact was, on an individual like me. Despite the fact that the Avatar state was out of commission, along with the Avatar system's stance not to make anything easy on me, there was a security measure put in place to ensure any and all information I had on the system was not made accessible to telepaths or outside parties without the express permission of the ones who placed me here. As a byproduct of that, I could draw a little on that influence by thinking of the answers the lasso compelled out of me, and then placing tidbits of information about the system in the actual sentences containing the truth. That way, those sentences would be completely cut away, leaving only the words I wanted to say and the truth I wanted them to hear to flow out of my lips. It's complicated, I know. But also really simple. It wasn't a lie that I wanted their trust. Getting it would make things a whole lot easier in gaining access to the watchtower the right way, without the damn place going all intruder on me. The Greek demigod, Kryptonian and Martian turned to face me fully after another brief discussion I'd missed. Manhunter's eyes glowed green and I felt a mental sweep on my surface thoughts. The Barbar Black Sheep nursery rhyme started playing on full blast inside my head, as I smiled, Manhunter furrowed his eyebrow. I cannot read his surface thoughts. He informed the other two. I knew it. He's hiding something. Wally shouted in excitement. As if he'd won a million dollars through a lottery ticket. Everyone looked at him in mixed reactions. The team didn't seem to believe him but had to after everything that had happened and the leaguers seemed to believe him without a shred of doubt. I shrugged. You've already violated my right to privacy and personal opinion by shackling me with power dampening cuffs and not to mention, Wonder Woman's lasso of truth. Can you blame me for trying to keep my thoughts to myself? The last vestige of respect I have? I asked. Wally stalked towards me angrily, not buying into my act at all. You're lying. The power dampeners are clearly not working if you can open a portal while they are active. He came within head-butting distance but I chose to be the bigger man and not break his nose. That's because it's not a meta ability, you ass, and that's all I'm saying on that. You foo. Okay that's enough. We're wasting time here, Diana. John Stewart came to my rescue, a green construct pulling back Wally and covering his mouth. No one wanted to hear the insults coming out of his mouth. I chuckled to needle him due to the anger in his eyes, when I found a construct muffling my mouth too. I spared John a look that said, really dude? The black green lantern shrugged. No playing favorites, I fuck everybody up equally. I nodded sagely, good man, Superman and everyone else looked at the lantern in shock. What? I have a life and a personality outside the green and black uniform. Now let's get gone, if he tries anything, trust me. I'll have him down before anyone can say Jack Robinson. I looked at the man in interest. The same interest being shared by everyone present as well. Okay, never knew Stuart was this cool. 
We entered the boom tube to find ourselves on one of the islands furthest away from sanctuary. Instantly, their presence registered in my awareness and I got the sense I could choose what to do with them. For all of his power, even Superman would be nothing in front of the authority I wielded in this dimension. That said, I didn't have a grudge with the heroes. I didn't hate them. What I hated was the way they carried out their duties. What is this place? It's so dot quiet. Ngan said, probably not sensing a lot of minds in her range. I also spared a look at the other hero with a different set of super senses. Superman and I could tell from his face he was similarly surprised by my dimension. Everybody else looked entranced by the beautiful environment. Even one of my basic islands looked like a paradise when compared to the best garden on earth and I felt uncomfortable allowing anyone to see a piece of my utopia. It's all necessary. I told myself. A boom tube appeared before us and I walked in without answering. This time, we stepped foot out in the watchtower. I dismissed the boom tube a few seconds later after making sure that the last of the heroes had crossed through. Multiple intruders detected. The alarm blared through the P.A system. Watchtower override Superman 01. The alarm went silent, just as the door to the meeting hall where we had portaled in burst open. Green Arrow and Black Canary walked through in combat readiness. Oh dot it's you guys. Green Arrow said, lowering his bow. Black Canary widened her eyes upon us seeing each other and practically ran towards me, wrapping her arms around my body in a massive hug, surprising everybody. But no one was as surprised as I was. The look of shock and betrayal on Green Arrow's face was almost worth it but I was stumped. What the fuck was happening? I mean Canary was cool. She was a mentor to me, someone that had helped perfect my fighting skills and polish my sound sub skill. We had spent so many evenings together as she tried to push me to the next level in my close quarter combat. Her hugging me like that, brought about the realization that I had missed her. A lot. Aiden, you're alright. She pulled back and said. You've even grown taller. Yeah. I smiled a little, still out of it. I guess I have. She grew conscious of our surroundings and stepped back with a sigh. A lot needs to be said and if the situation allows it, it will. For now you need to take responsibility for your actions before we hear your side of the story. She said in that professional yet caring tone she used in therapy. Fair enough. Let's move kid. Stuart told me while lightly shoving me. You know... I think there is a law somewhere about how you should handle minors. You can't interrogate me without a parental figure present. The lantern chuckled, nodding at Green Arrow who was sending glares my way. Seriously, dude probably thinks I'm going to steal his girlfriend, fiancé, wife. On second thought, maybe he's right to worry, Canary is effing gorgeous and those legs. Are you honestly drooling after someone who's been like a big sister to you? Stuart's voice cut through my thoughts like a hot knife on butter. We'd moved past the door to the Hall of Justice and were now heading towards what I was sure was an interrogation room. This wasn't John, not really. It was too out of character. Did it work? Sweat ran down my back as John and I walked on. I tried to keep my nervousness in check, keenly aware that it was only the two of us in the hallway. Come on, Stuart, you're acting as if the green lantern ring on your finger is a chastity ring. I thought you were a man of culture, John? Hey, trust me, I'm a freak freak. Canary's just too close to a sister. Now if it's Maze we're talking about or Starfire. He whistled, that's a wild different thing. It's like Pops used to say, we dogs. I stopped in the middle of the hallway. And dogs got to eat. Man, never thought I'd hear that whack saying ever again. I said, closing my eyes a little. A few seconds later and I was lightly pushed to keep on walking. Yeah well, nothing is ever set in stone now. It's a consequence of finding yourself in a world with thousands of powered individuals and crazies throwing around cosmic power like it's a joke. It's even worse for me. I looked over the shoulder at the man. Gee, and here I thought you seemed dot whelmed. I joked, only to get a slap on the back of my head. If I wasn't wary of breaking more rules than I already have, I'd go and make sure Robin never came up with this bullshit. I laughed getting the last confirmation I needed that things had happened the way I had wanted them to. We stopped before a door that scanned John for authorization and opened. Recognized Green Lantern 014. The voice of the computer followed us inside to a room with a one-way mirror. A door next to the mirror led to another room, a classic interrogation room with one chair and a table bolted to the floor. Let me guess, Batman's design choice. I asked. Can't really say dot it's been long since I dot you know what? No spoilers. Get inside, we need to talk. 
His voice suddenly went through on a drastic change, taking on a hard tone. I looked at him strangely and walked in. Then the door closed and the mood in the room turned very serious. He motioned for me to take a seat and I complied. Stuart's eyes drilled into mine with a scary intensity. You're slipping, coming up with plans on the fly and discarding the long-term objectives due to panic. He cut right into the heart of the matter. But he didn't understand it. He didn't understand the pressure. You're wrong. What I'm doing is something I should have done weeks and months ago, taking advantage of every situation I can, to prepare myself for the insanity of this world. Lucifer is going to cut me off from his protection and I'm normally. Stuart looked at me in disgust, successfully cutting me off with a glare and his hands crossed over his chest. Do you even hear yourself? Was I always this much of a wimp? What right did he have to judge me? My actions led to him being alive in the first place. Fuck you Aiden. I rose up and said, losing control of myself. You have no idea how much pressure I'm in. I have no one to have my back. And when Lucifer withdraws his protection, my ass is going to be in deep shit because I am not powerful enough to take on whatever eldritch assholes he's been protecting me from. The Avatar state is non-accessible. I am not rejoining the team which means the League's help is out and I'll be damned if I share the same air as Lex Luthor by joining him and his little band. I. Am. All. Alone. Silence dominated the interrogation room as I breathed in heavily. I sat back down and ran a hand down my face. So, MMH? Your first thought to fix that, is risking your freedom over something that probably wouldn't have worked? Stuart's voice spoke up. I looked up at him, my gaze spearing through his eyes to see the being controlling him. Me. A chair made out of will, was conjured under him and he sat on it. I remember when I was you. I wasn't in the right head space at the time. And yes. You're right to think that this world and others are crazy, which is why you need to take it step by step. Don't throw caution to the wind by reacting to your surroundings. Act according to the information you already have. Be in control. In fact, if it wasn't for the fact that I knew you'd go off the deep end if your stupid plan didn't work, I would have never gone to the trouble of coming back. He told me and I kept quiet to digest the information. What he said was right. I had been reacting in fear after my talk with Lucifer and maybe seeing hell, something that was traumatic even as a nightmare was enough to completely fuck up my day. Be in control, huh? How do you do it? I asked him, referring to the crossing over. Well it wasn't easy. He sighed. True time travel would have messed with this universe and caused changes. You. Cannot. Afford. Too many close calls for things to not go your way. And even if they do. You're not the same person afterwards. His fingers clenched and unclenched. Anyway, I accessed a parallel universe in a time sink with Earth-16 which is basically this he waved his hand to indicate. Then I crossed the time stream back to the relative time you came up with his harebrained idea to commit this time in the future so that you could travel back in time to give yourself some cheats and help in protecting yourself once Lucy says you're on your own. Once the time ratio was one to one, I seized control of the central power battery of O and piggybacked through its connection to Stuart and gained control of him through underscore and dollar carroty and TMSG, dollar four two five nine five two five five three O underscore percent carrot dot oh sorry. You're not ready to hear that just yet. But yeah, I'm controlling Stuart remotely because I can't risk someone finding out I'm around. He finished and I sighed, understanding just how desperate I'd actually gotten. All in the space of a few hours talk with Lucifer. It really was dumb, wasn't it? I mean how could I have known that I would even get to live long enough to find a way to time travel? Plus you'd think with my meta-knowledge on how time travel works. I'd be wary to use it in case I broke the world around me into a mockery of its original timeline. Yeah well dot you weren't thinking. Now, Stuart rose up. In two minutes, you will have roughly five minutes to complete the rest of your plan. Goodbye and don't expect I'll ever help you out again. This is your life dot not mine. With that, future me left. There wasn't a clock in the room but part of the aesthetic design of the avatar display box was a status bar where the time and date was shown. I focused on the team just as Stuart regained control over his body. 2 minutes. 1 minutes 59 seconds. 58 seconds. What. Dot, what just happened. Dot, how did I get here? The last thing I remember was. Are you alright? I cut off his confused muttering and asked in concern. He stared at me in suspicion, the green ring on his finger glowing menacingly. Hey. Dot, hey. I didn't do anything. Look, I'm tied up. I raised up my hands to show I wasn't lying. Where are the others? That question actually made me curious why they let John walk me to the interrogation room alone. 
Say what you will but no one could deny I was powerful and dangerous. Must have been future me's work. In fact, he must have gained control of Stuart way back in Kenya, just after I'd come up with the reckless plan. I shrugged in response to Stuart's question. I don't know, you just brought me here after we made it back to the watchtower. I answered honestly. Ring, status update on my most recent behavior. I want to know everything. He said and left, closing the door behind him, leaving me alone in the room, unsupervised. Though I was sure there were cameras to read my every move. The two minutes went by slowly but when they finally ended dot time stopped. I could feel it through the air dot I was exempt from time. A light shone on the table, as a box wrapped around by a string and a note tied up on top of it appeared before me. I untied the note and read through it. I never make it easy on myself, cheetah. But just this once, I'll do you a solid. W-H-O knows, maybe you won't mess things up for me with hash and hash underscore, and plus, damn it. Oh well, the thing in this box is a personal creation of a friend, called a MDP. Multiversal data pod. IT can open anything, store loads of information and you'll find out its main use once you take IT back to the elemental dimension. P.S. Get some friends you bastard. A few spoilers are in the MDP to get you started on that. P.P.S. Don't wear a condom on your birthday. It's just an inconvenience and trust me, IT doesn't even work. Chapter 100, Success Hey guys, sorry if the last chapter seemed so convoluted. It's just sometimes you try to make it work and it fights you. That said, no more convoluted setups. 30 advanced chapters in my pat.rion. pat.rion.com slash Saint Barbedo. Please give me your power stones. Don't worry about the pacing, this book is going to be long enough. It makes sense why it would be slow. I update daily so you guys can just take a month off and come back to binge read. One last thing, I'm still learning. Please don't be too hard on me, psych. Be as hard as you can, shit never stopped me before. Colon. Aiden's POV. I pocketed the note and turned my attention to the small black box sitting on the table. The box was cube-like, similar to an engagement ring box and fit inside my palm nicely. I opened it up and revealed what was inside. Within it, the box had a raised platform with a shank of the ring holding something at the top. A thin film that looked like the pad of my thumb. Studying the setup, it was very obvious what I needed to do. I pressed my thumb on the thin film and felt a small current run up my finger. Identified, Aiden Strong. New user registered. A synthetic voice sounded from the multiversal data pod. I raised my hand and watched in marvel as the MDP covered my whole thumb in a water-like motion extending to below the first joint and changing into a silver ring. I whistled in appreciation at the cool shift. Recalling I was on a time limit, I got up and stretched. My movements were impeded by the cuffs holding my hands together. Luckily, that was the only thing I had to worry about, seeing as Wonder Woman had untied me from the lasso the second we had made it to the watchtower. I tested the strength of the cuffs and felt that I could break them apart by tugging. They weren't meant to hold me down for long term, just to inconvenience me until the league brought me down in a more secure way. Then I found out that I had underestimated the Magi Tech device. I flexed my arms, giving it about 20% of my full strength. The cuffs surprisingly held. I frowned a little as I increased the strength. In response the magical symbols constructed along the length of the cuffs flashed and a blue electric charge flashed, electrocuting me. I winced a little. That shit actually stung. I re-evaluated the cuffs and decided against breaking them. Zadara was a magical genius of that there wasn't a doubt. Plus Logomancy, his brand of magic was very powerful. Maybe there was a way I could use that dot the stirrings to a follow-up plan to this begun. I would think more on that later, right now I had to deal with the cuffs first. I turned my attention to the MDP. This thing could supposedly open anything right? I placed my thumb onto the metallic side of the cuffs and tried hard to think on what I wanted. Nothing happened. Well that does away with the notion I can control the MDP with my thoughts. Ha.MDP, unlock the cuffs. I tried using my voice to activate the function. Nothing happened, making me frown. What would I do if I was the one handing the device over to my past self? I wondered. A second later, an annoyed look crossed my face and I sighed. I knew exactly what I could do. MDP, unlock the cuffs. Please. Upon uttering the last word, tendrils extended out of the silver ring, running up my finger like flowing water and made contact with the cuffs. Then they got to working. The MDP was nanomachine tech with the software to interface with any technology to acquire data or in this case control any device to do the user's bid. 
It was suspiciously very similar to Roquette's version of Nanites. MMMH, there were some implications there. It wouldn't take a genius to figure out she was probably the creator. And with the way Future Me had worded it, the cuffs suddenly unlocked, cutting through my thoughts. I held them up by my right hand curiously, as the MDP tendrils retracted back into the silver ring. Just like I'd said, I couldn't leave this behind. A boom tube appeared on the surface of the table and I dropped the cuffs in. Then with an inaudible pop the portal disappeared and I rose up. Time to get to work. I hummed the tune of sweet dreams as I walked towards the door of the interrogation room. I held out my hand without stopping and tightened it into a fist. The metallic entrance crumpled like a piece of paper through sheer air force. I had been making steady progress in my air manipulation despite fire bending being the main focus. In fact, once I was done here, it was time for a month-long grind. I was long overdue to getting those fire bending subskills and add to my repertoire of badassery. I stepped out of the interrogation room and looked around. You couldn't tell it but everything was frozen. Even the watchtower floating about in space was held in place by a fundamental aspect of reality. Shit. This had to have garnered attention from some really powerful guys, must have been why I only had five minutes, for now that I spent one trying to unlock the cuffs. My steps made no noise as I walked in a long hallway, headed to the central computer terminal of the watchtower. Despite the fact that time was stopped, I tested and found out that my other abilities could still be used. Fire still spread, showing my abilities were backed more with mystical bullshit than science. Anything under my direct control really, was exempt from the temporal shenanigans. Not complaining. I arrived at the control room and accessed the door. Instantly rows and rows of servers appeared in my vision. Now you might be wondering what I was actually doing in the watchtower. Here's the answer. I hadn't been exaggerating when I'd said that the League's main base of operations was a marvel of technology. The fact that it had been floating in space for close to four years without the public's knowledge was just crazy. I had an even better version of cloaking and disguise with my elemental dimension, so that wasn't the main highlight. The thing I was after was the monitoring and surveillance aspect of the watchtower. Those blueprints would propel my own realm to the next level, if I could incorporate them. Initially, I'd thought of getting and holding onto them until I got someone to outfit them into my dimension. The reality however was that only I had the admin privileges and I wouldn't be exactly comfortable with someone else making changes into my personal dimension. That just screamed betrayal. With their surveillance tech, I could better be prepared for things like alien incursions and respond accordingly. This was still my home. Or well a version of it anyway. And the best part of it all, I could find out the locations of some interesting figures and characters that had what I needed or keep tabs on them. The Watchtower also had live satellite footage on some places of interest like the Infinity Island. Knowledge was a powerful tool and that knowledge was the first step into turning my elemental dimension into something scary. I extended my finger towards the chassis of the first server, then ordered the MDP to copy the Watchtower's blueprints. Any information with a level 3 and above only clearance protocol and locations of interest to the League. Tendrils glowed into the servers and despite the fact that time was frozen, everything the tendrils touched lit up and activated. It took two minutes for my new favorite device to do its work and when it was done, I left the room surprised at how easy it had been. And with that, I was done with my business at the watchtower. I passed through the rejuvenation chamber where Superboy was sleeping, being bombarded with solar energy for faster recovery through wide panels on the ceiling. Miss Martian was watching him through a mirror with a worried look on her face. These two. Then my feet dragged me to the meeting hall where I found the League in a meeting to discuss, you guessed it, me. One point of note was the random streaks of yellow lightning that escaped Barry's body randomly. It was as if, he was trying to counteract the temporal restriction and normally he would but something was actively stopping him. Wow, future me must be one heck of a powerhouse. Before leaving, I pressed Green Arrow's fist onto his smug face. When time resumed he would punch himself. Done with my petty act for the day, I bounced. The next room over, how's the teen team playing table tennis and Robin was losing to Artemis. Guess, dexterity applies to everything else despite being a skill she gained due to her bow and arrow practice. Aqualid was combing through files from the holographic display about Connor's condition and the most recent mission. Wally on the other hand was eating hot puffs. This guy is almost always chowing down on something. The drawbacks to his version of super speed. I'll make sure that when I get some sweet speed for myself, I won't fuck it up like he did. I stared at them before I started feeling like a creep and sat down on a chair, near the door to the bathroom to wait as the time ran out. One minute later and... Yes. Eat that you sunglasses wearing freak.
Artemis shouted just as Robin missed the ball by a few inches. Damn it. So not turbed. I chuckled a little, grabbing their attention. It happened almost simultaneously. The alarm started blaring throughout the room and I'm guessing the watchtower. Then the team also scrambled into a formation ready to attack me. I held up a hand and they were all restrained by air. I am not here to fight you guys. Honestly, I think we are all past that and besides we all know it's a waste of time. I will always beat you. Oh yeah, let us go and we'll see about that. Wally shouted with a mouth full of Cheetos. Dude, don't talk with your mouth full, it's gross. I looked at him in distaste. What do you want Aiden? Aqualad cut in. I got up from the seat and walked towards him. I'm not going to start a monologue like a second-rate movie villain about how I beat you blah blah blah. No. I'm not about that, I'm here to make something very clear. I looked at their faces to judge their expressions. Surprisingly, they were all listening attentively. It was shocking to see Wally shut his mouth from just Aqualad's look that I had to ask. Wow, cool. oh you really got the team to toe the line. I'm surprised that Wally isn't running his mouth like he usually does. What are you planning? Artemis spoke up. You followed us into the watchtower willingly. Her face went ashen. What did you do? Robin shouted, the implications being made clear. Before I could answer, I felt something cut through the air with massive speed. Sorry, let's continue this talk somewhere else. The familiar light of the boom tube appeared below us. Unfortunately the flash broke the door apart before I could pull the team all the way through, so I abandoned that move and jumped into another boom tube behind me. The speedster's priority was on the team, hence I successfully got away. The last thing I saw was the terrified faces of my former team.